part three chapter four b of a vital question or what is to be done by nikolai chernyshevsky translated by nathan haskell dole eighteen fifty two to nineteen thirty five and others this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by expatriate in bangor maine part three marriage and second love chapter four b the profits were divided every month at first each girl took her share and spent it separately apart from the others each one had immediate necessities and they were not in the habit of acting together but when after constantly participating in the business they had acquired the habit of understanding the entire procedure of the work in the shop vira pavlovna turned their attention to the fact that in their business the quantity of orders varied in different months of the year and that therefore it would be advisable during the most profitable months to put away a portion of their profits against those months when the profits were not so great the accounts were kept with great accuracy the girls knew that if any one of them left the shop she would get without any difficulty her share of the earnings remaining in the depository therefore they consented to accede to this plan a small reserve capital was established it gradually grew they began to look for various ways of applying it from the very first all understood that this reserve capital could be drawn upon in the way of loans by those members who had any extraordinary need of money and that no interest would be charged for its use poor people have the idea that respectable help in money ought to be given without interest after this bank was established there followed a commission house for purchases the girls found it more profitable to buy tea coffee sugar footwear and many other things through this shop as it bought goods not at retail but at wholesale consequently cheaper from this in a short time they branched out still further they began to understand that it might also be possible to arrange for the purchase of the bread and provisions which they used to buy every day from the bakers and retail shops but here they saw that to do this they must live in one neighbourhood they began to gather into circles each circle occupying one suite and they tried to get quarters near the shop then the shop had to establish its agency to transact business with the bakeries and the stores in a year and a half or so almost all the girls were living in one large apartment had one general table and purchased their provisions in exactly the same way as is done in great establishments half of the girls were lonely souls some of them had old women as relatives mothers or aunts two supported aged fathers and a good many had little brothers and sisters on account of these family relationships three of the girls could not live in the general apartment one of them had a mother whom it was impossible to get along with the second had a mother who was a chinovnitsna and did not want to live with peasant girls the third had a drunken father these only made use of the agency just the same as those seamstresses did who were not girls but married women but apart from these three all the other girls who had relatives to support lived in the general apartment they lived by themselves in one suite two or three in one room but their male or female relatives were given rooms according to circumstances two old ones had separate rooms all the other old women lived together for the little boys there was a separate room and two others for the little girls it was decided that the little boys could stay until they were eight years old those above that age would be put out to learn a trade there was an accurate account kept of everything in order that the whole association might get used to the idea that no one was getting any advantage over anybody else that they were not doing each other any harm the accounts of the single girls in the apartment for rooms and board were very simple after some hesitation they decided to charge for a brother or sister under eight years of age the fourth part of the expenses of a grown-up girl and that then the support of a girl until she was twelve was to be reckoned at one-third after she was twelve the price should be one half of that of her sister when the little girls should reach the age of thirteen they should enter the shop as apprentices if they did not succeed in establishing themselves otherwise and it was decided that from sixteen and upwards they should enter as full members of the union provided they were found to be skilful seamstresses for the support of the grown-up relatives as much of course was charged as for that of the seamstresses for separate rooms there was an extra charge almost all the old women and the three old men who lived in the union apartment 
busied themselves in the kitchen and in other domestic duties and for this of course they were paid all this can be told very quickly in words and in reality it seemed very easy simple and natural when it was once accomplished but everything was done very deliberately and every new step cost a great many arguments and every change was the result of a whole series of experiments it would be very tedious and dry to describe the other details of the shop as particularly as we have told about the division of the profits in regard to many points it is not necessary to speak at all lest we should weary the reader but we must briefly mention one or two other things for instance that the union had its agency for selling ready-made clothing which was made at the time when they were not busy with orders a separate store they could not as yet accomplish but they made arrangements with one of the shops in the gostinui dvor they established a little shop in the pushing market two of the old women took charge of this little shop but it is necessary to speak with a little more fullness about one side of the life of the union vira pavlovna from the very first began to bring them books after she had given her directions she began to read aloud she would read half an hour or an hour if she were not interrupted by the necessity of giving out new work then the girls took a rest from listening then followed some more reading and another rest it is hardly worth mentioning that the girls from the very first became interested in the reading some of them had been fond of it even before in two or three weeks the reading during the working hours took the form of a regular course in three or four months two or three good readers were found who were delegated to relieve vira pavlovna to read half an hour and this half hour was reckoned as regular work when the duty of reading aloud was taken from vira pavlovna vira pavlovna who even before used to vary the monotony of reading by telling stories began to speak oftener and more at length then her stories turned into a channel resembling elementary courses in various branches of knowledge afterwards and this was a very great step vira pavlovna saw the possibility of introducing a regular course of instruction the girls became so ambitious to learn and their work went on so successfully that they decided to take during their working day before dinner a long rest for hearing the lessons alexey petrovitch said vira pavlovna once while she was at the mertsalovs i have a favour that i want to ask of you natasha is already on my side my sewing union is becoming a lyceum for all possible knowledge be one of its professors well what shall i teach latin or greek or logic or rhetoric said alexey petrovitch laughing my specialty would not be very interesting according to your opinion and the opinion of another man whom you know yes you are needed just because you are a specialist you must serve as the buckler of morality in the special direction of our science that's true i see that without me there would be no morality give me a professorship for instance russian history or international history capital but i will read this subject up and i shall be taken as a specialist excellent two occupations to be a professor and a buckler natalia andreyevna lopukov two or three students and vira pavlovna herself were the other professors as they called themselves in jest together with the course of instructions they also arranged for amusements they had evening parties they had picnics out of town at first rarely but afterwards when they had more money more frequently they took boxes at the theatre during the third winter they took ten places in the parquet circle during the italian opera how delightful how exciting this was to vira pavlovna there was much labour and care and she also had disappointments the misfortune that befell one of the best girls in the union powerfully affected not her alone but the whole shop sashenka privitkova one of the three girls whom vira pavlovna herself found was very handsome and was very modest she was engaged to a good and kind young man who was a chinovnik once as she was walking on the street rather late some gentleman accosted her she hastened her steps he followed her and caught her by the arm she snatched herself away from him and started to run but by the motion of pulling away her arm she hit his chest and on the pavement was heard the ring of the polite gentleman's watch the polite gentleman caught sashenka with perfect self-possession and with a feeling of legal right and cried out robbery police two policemen came and took sashenka to the station house meantime nothing was known in the shop as to what had become of her and they could not imagine where she could be lost on the fourth day a kind soldier attached to the station house 
brought vira pavlovna a note from sashenka lopukhov immediately went off to see about it he was treated insultingly he gave them back in their own coin and went off to serge serge and julie had gone out of town to a great picnic and did not come back for two days two hours after his return one of the officials begged sashenka's pardon and went to beg her bridegroom's pardon into the bargain but he could not find the young man the bridegroom had been to see sashenka the evening before at the station and having learned from the policemen who were placed in charge of her the name of the dandy went to him and challenged him to a duel before he was challenged the dandy apologized for his mistake in a very insulting tone but after he had received the challenge he burst into a peal of laughter the chinovnik said here then you will not refuse this challenge and slapped him in the face the dandy seized a stick the chinovnik hit him in the chest the dandy fell to the ground and his servants hurried to the noise the barin was picked up dead he had been knocked violently to the floor and struck his cheek on the sharp corner of a table the chinovnik was put in prison a criminal suit was instituted and no end could be foreseen to this case what was the result there was no result only from that time it was sad to look at sashenka the shop had several other experiences not criminal like this but likewise not very gay very ordinary occurrences such as cause girls long tears and young or middle-aged men not long but pleasant recreation vira pavlovna knew that according to the existing ideas and conditions such occurrences were unavoidable that young girls could not be kept in perfect safety either by their own care or by that exercised by others it is just the same way as it used to be in old times in regard to smallpox before people learned to get rid of it now whoever suffers from smallpox is himself to blame and much more those near to him but once it was otherwise no one was to blame except the miserable weather or the wretched town or village for the person suffering from smallpox probably carried the contagion by not putting himself into quarantine until he got well the same thing is true now of these stories some time in the future people may get rid of this kind of smallpox also means have been found for it but people are not yet ready to adopt it just as it took a long time a very long time for people to be willing to adopt preventatives against the smallpox vira pavlovna knew that this miserable weather was to be found mainly in cities and towns and it gets victims even from the most careful hands but this is a very poor consolation when you know only that i am not to blame my dear for your sorrow nor are you to blame yourself nevertheless every one of these ordinary occurrences caused vira pavlovna much grief and still more labour sometimes it was necessary to look up the girls in order to help them but more frequently there was no need of hunting it was only necessary to help to pacify to restore courage to bring back self-respect to reason to bid them cease weeping if you stop doing so you will not need to weep but her happiness was much more oh much more everything was happiness except these sorrows and these sorrows were only exceptional and rare occurrences to-day or a half year you may be sorry for one but at the same time you are glad for all others and when two or three weeks have passed you may be glad for this one too bright and gay was the ordinary course of the business and it filled vira pavlovna's heart with constant happiness and if sometimes things went hard owing to these griefs yet exceptionally happy circumstances compensated for them and these arose oftener than her griefs for instance they succeeded in establishing the young sisters or brothers of one or another of the girls on the third year two girls passed their examinations as private teachers what a happiness that was to them there were several good things of this sort but more often the cause of happiness for the whole shop and for vira pavlovna was a marriage there were a good many and all were fortunate the marriage passed off very gaily there were evening parties before and after it a good many surprises to the bride from her friends in the shop and a dowry was given her from the reserve fund and then again how much work vira pavlovna had she had her hands full of course one thing at first seemed to the shop indelicate on the part of vira pavlovna the first bride asked vira pavlovna to be her nuptial godmother but her request was not granted the second did likewise and was also refused more often the bridal nuptial godmother was mrs mertsalova or her mother who was also a very nice lady 
but vi^ra pavlovna always refused she would help dress the bride and escort her to the church but only in the capacity of one of her friends the first time they thought that the refusal was out of displeasure for something or other but that was not so vi^ra pavlovna was very glad of the invitation only she did not accept it the second time it was believed that it was from mere modesty vi^ra pavlovna did not want to appear in public as the patroness of the bride and indeed it was true that she avoided all appearances of being influential she always took pains to bring others to the front so that a good many of the ladies who came to the shop to give order could not distinguish her from the other cutters but vi'ra pavlovna took the greatest delight when she was explaining to any one that the whole establishment was founded and supported by the girls themselves with these explanations she tried to convince herself of what she wanted to believe that the shop could get along without her so that in time other shops might be established of the same kind entirely spontaneously and why not wouldn't it be a good thing it would be better than anything else even without any leadership outside of the rank of seamstresses but by the thought and planning of the seamstresses themselves this was vira pavlovna's pet dream End of part three, chapter four, recording by expatriate in Bangor, Maine. Part three, chapter five of A Vital Question or What is to be Done by Nikolai Chernyshevsky, translated by Nathan Haskell Dole, eighteen fifty two to nineteen thirty five, and others. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain recording by expatriate in bangor maine part three marriage and second love chapter five and thus three years have passed since the union was founded and more than three years since vira pavlovna's marriage how quietly and busily passed these three years how full they were of calmness happiness and all that was good vira pavlovna after waking long takes her ease in bed she likes to take her ease and as it were to doze and yet she does not doze but she thinks of what must needs be done and so she lies not dozing and not thinking yes she is thinking how warm soft good how comfortable it is to sleep in the morning and so she lies and takes her ease until from the neutral room no we must say from one of the neutral rooms there are two of them now because it is the fourth year of their wedded life her husband that is her milenki says virotchka are you awake yes milenki that is as good as to say that her husband may begin to make the tea in the morning it is his work to make the tea and that vira pavlovna no in her room she is not vira pavlovna but virotchka may dress herself how long it takes to dress herself no it does not take her long one minute but she plays long with the water she likes to splash in it and then she takes considerable time with her hair no she does not take very much time for it she arranges it in a minute but she trifles with it because she likes her hair however sometimes she is long busy with one of the important stages of her toilette putting on her shoes she wears elegant shoes she dresses very simply but shoes are her passion and here she comes out to tea kisses her husband how did you sleep milenki she talks with him at table about different trifles and serious things however vira pavlovna no virotchka because at morning tea she is still virotchka drinks not as much tea as cream tea is only pretext for cream she has more than half a cup of it cream is also her passion it is hard to find good cream in petersburg but virotchka manages to find the best that there is without any adulteration she dreams of having her own cow well if business improves as it has been doing it can be realized in a year's time but now it is ten o'clock milenki goes off to give his lessons or to business he is employed in the office of a manufacturer vira pavlovna now she is vira pavlovna again until the next morning looks after the house she has one servant a young girl whom she has to teach everything and after you have taught her it is necessary to break in a new one vira pavlovna does not keep her servants long they all get married within a half year or a little more you will see vira pavlovna working on a collar or a pair of cuffs preparing herself to be the bride's nuptial godmother here it is impossible to refuse how is it possible to do otherwise vira pavlovna 
You have made all the arrangements yourself. There is no one beside you. Yes, there is a great deal of care about the house. Then it is necessary to go and give her lessons. She has a good many pupils, about ten hours a week. More would be too hard, and she would not have any time. Before the lessons, it is necessary to stop in the shop for a little while, and on her way home she has to look in once more. And then comes dinner with the Milenki. At dinner they almost always have company, one, more often two. More than two is impossible. When they have two to dinner, it is necessary to do extra work, to prepare a new dish so as to have enough. If Vera Pavlovna feels tired when she gets home, dinner is made more simple. She sits till dinner time in her own room resting, and the dinner is put on as it was begun, without her help. But if she is not tired, affairs in the kitchen begin to boil and steam, and extra dishes appear at dinner, some baked dish, but more often something that can be eaten with cream, that is, something that will serve as an excuse for cream. At dinner, Vera Pavlovna asks questions and tells about things. More often she tells stories. And how can she help telling them? How much news she has to tell about the shop? After dinner, she sits a quarter of an hour longer with the Milenki. Then comes goodbye, and they each go to their own room. And Vera Pavlovna lies down on her little bed and takes her ease and reads, and very often she falls asleep, more often than not. Every other day she takes a nap for an hour or an hour and a half. This is a weakness, and it is a weakness of a low character. But Vera Pavlovna sleeps after dinner when she can get a nap, and she likes to go to sleep, and she feels neither shame nor regret for this low-toned weakness. She then gets up after sleeping or lounging for an hour or two, dresses and goes again to the shop, and remains there till tea-time. If they do not have company in the evening, then at tea she has another talk with the Milenki, and for half an hour they sit in the neutral room. Then it is, goodbye, Milenki, they kiss each other and part till breakfast. Now Vera Pavlovna sometimes works or reads or rests from reading by playing on the piano till very late, even till two o'clock. She has a grand piano in her room. The grand was bought not long ago. Hitherto their piano was rented this also was a great happiness to own their own grand it was cheaper too it was bought at a bargain for a hundred roubles a small ererovsky second hand it cost seventy roubles to have it put in order but the grand was of an excellent tone sometimes the milenki comes to hear her sing but only seldom he is too busy thus goes the evening work reading playing singing but reading and singing most of all this is when they do not have company but very often they have visitors generally young people younger than the milenki and younger than vira pavlovna herself their number includes the instructors of the shop they esteem lopukhov very highly they consider him one of the best minds in petersburg and perhaps they are not mistaken and their tie to the lopukhovs consists in this they feel that it is profitable for them to talk with dmitri sergeitch to vira pavlovna they show immense respect she even allows them to kiss her hand not feeling that it is any degradation to herself and she behaves towards them as though she were fifteen years their senior that is she behaves herself in such a way when she does not get into a gale but to tell the truth she very often gets into a gale she likes to run to frolic with them and they are all delighted and there is a great deal of dancing and waltzing a great deal of simple running about a great deal of playing on the piano a great deal of talking and laughter and probably more singing than anything else but the running laughter and everything else does not in the least prevent the young people from absolutely and entirely and boundlessly worshipping vera pavlovna from respecting her as may god grant respect for an older sister as a mother not even a good mother is not always respected however singing is not frolicking though sometimes one cannot get along without the nonsense but for the most part vera pavlovna sings seriously and sometimes when she does not sing she plays seriously and her hearers then sit in dumb silence not infrequently they have guests who are older or who are of the same age as the lopukhovs for the most part lopukhovs former classmates or friends of his former comrades two or three young professors almost all bachelors almost the only married people are the Mertsalovs the lopukhovs do not very often go out 
and they go scarcely anywhere else than to the mertsalovs or to mrs mertsalovs parents these kind and simple-hearted people have a good many sons who occupy important places in all possible official departments and therefore at the house of the old people who live in some comfort vera pavlovna sees a varied and different calibred society free ample active life not without its luxuries lying at ease in her soft warm bed cream or baked dishes in cream it is a life that greatly delights vera pavlovna can there be any better life in the world to vera pavlovna it seems impossible well in early youth nothing better can be imagined but years pass on and with the years things improve if life goes on as it should as it goes on with a few now as it will pass with a good many in the future end of part three chapter five recording by expatriate in bangor maine part three chapter six of a vital question or what is to be done by nikolai chernyshevsky translated by nathan haskell dole eighteen fifty two to nineteen thirty five and others this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by expatriate in bangor maine part three chapter six once it was towards the end of summer the girls gathered according to their custom on sunday at the outskirts of the city for a picnic during the summer they used to go out almost every holiday in boats to the islands vera pavlovna generally went with them and this time dmitri sergeitch went along too and that made this picnic remarkable his company was a rarity and it was the second time that he had been with them the shop when they heard about it was greatly pleased vera pavlovna would be gayer than usual and it may be expected that the picnic will be particularly hilarious some of them who had intended to spend their sunday otherwise changed their plans and joined those who had decided to go it was necessary to take instead of four great hampers five and afterwards the number was increased to six the company consisted of fifty people or more there were more than twenty seamstresses there were only six who did not take part in the picnic three middle-aged women a dozen children or so mothers sisters and brothers of the seamstresses three young men bridegrooms one was a watchmaker's apprentice the second was a small dealer and these two were not in the least inferior in manners to the third who was a school-teacher there were five other young men of different ranks among them even two army officers and there were eight university and medical students they took with them four big samovars great heaps of different baked things huge reserve stores of cold veal and other eatables the people are young there will be much motion and the fresh air besides one can count on their appetites there are half a dozen bottles of wine for fifty people including fifteen young men it does not seem a great supply and in point of fact the picnic turned out better than was even expected they had everything they danced in sixteen couples and then in twelve and also in eighteen and in one quadrille they had even twenty out at once they played high spy about twenty-two couples of them they improvised three swings between the trees and in the intervals they drank tea and partook of luncheon for half an hour no less much less about half the company listened to a discussion between dmitri sergeitch and two students the most radical of all his younger friends they found in each other's arguments inconsequentiality moderatism and bourgeoisism these were the terms that they applied to each other but in private each one had a special sin one student romanticism and dmitri sergeitch was a schematist and the other student believed in rigorism of course a stranger would find it hard to keep up his interest in such a discussion longer than five minutes even one of the disputants the romanticist could not hold out longer than an hour and a half then ran off to those who were dancing but he did not run off ingloriously he was indignant at some moderantist or other almost with me though i was not there at all and knowing that the cause of his indignation was not very old he cried out why are you talking about him i will tell you the words which were said to me a few days ago by a respectable person a very witty woman 
only till a man is twenty-five may he preserve intact the style of his thoughts i know who that lady is said an officer who to the romanticist mortification joined the disputants it was mrs n she said it in my presence and she is really an elegant woman but she was caught on the spot half an hour before she had said that she was twenty-six years old and do you remember how we all roared and at this all four laughed and the romanticist beat a retreat laughing but the officer took his place in the dispute and the fun was much more lively than before until it was tea-time the officer while showing up the rigorist and the schematist much more cruelly than the romanticist had done was himself mournfully convicted of auguste comteism after tea the officer announced that as long as his age still allowed his style of thought to be intact he would not refrain from joining other people of his age then dmitri sergeitch and though it was much against his will the rigorist followed his example they did not dance in the dances but they played high spy and when the men decided to run races to jump over the ditch then the three thinkers distinguished themselves as the most agile champions of manly exercise the officer received the first prize for jumping over the ditch dmitri sergeitch who was a very strong man got into a great rage when the officer defeated him he hoped to be first in this contest after the rigorist who had easily lifted in the air and set down again both dmitri sergeitch and the officer together for this feat aroused no ambition either in the officer or dmitri sergeitch the rigorist was a recognized athlete but dmitri sergeitch did not care to endure the affront of not being able to defeat the officer half a dozen times they grasped each other and each time the officer floored him though not without difficulty after the sixth wrestling bout dmitri sergeitch owned himself undoubtedly the weaker of the two they were both exhausted the three thinkers threw themselves on the grass they continued the dispute and now dmitri sergeitch recognized the value of auguste comteism and the officer of schematism but the rigorous remained as before a rigorous they went home at eleven o'clock the old women and children fell asleep in the boats it was a good thing that they had plenty of warm wraps with them but all the rest talked without ceasing and in all the six boats there was no interruption to the jokes and laughter end of part three chapter six recording by expatria in bangor maine part three chapter seven of a vital question or what is to be done by nikolai chernyshevsky translated by nathan haskell dole eighteen fifty two to nineteen thirty five and others this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by expatria in bangor maine part three chapter seven two days later at morning tea vera pavlovna remarked to her husband that she did not like the colour of his face he said that he had not slept well the night before and that he had not felt well since evening but it was of no consequence he had caught a little cold at the picnic of course during the time when he had been lying on the ground after their running and wrestling he gave himself a little scolding for his carelessness but he assured vira pavlovna that it was a mere nothing and he went to his business as usual and at supper he said that apparently his ill turn had entirely passed but on the following morning he said that he would have to stay at home for some time vira pavlovna who had been greatly worried since the day before became seriously frightened now and insisted on dmitri sergeitch calling a doctor but i myself am a doctor and can heal myself if it is necessary but as yet there is no need of doing anything said dmitri sergeitch trying to smooth it off but vira pavlovna was inflexible and so he wrote a note to kirsdnof adding that his illness was trifling and that he asked him to call simply to please his wife therefore kirsdnof did not make haste he stayed at the hospital till dinner-time and called at the lopukhovs at six o'clock in the evening well alexander i did well to call you said lopukhov there is no danger and i don't think that there is going to be any but i have inflammation of the lungs of course i could have cured myself without your aid but for all that please take my case in hand it cannot be helped it is necessary to satisfy my conscience you see i am not a bachelor as you are they made a long examination of the lung kirsdnof sounded his chest 
and they both agreed that Lopukh6f was not mistaken. There was no danger, and in all probability there would be none. But the inflammation of the lung was severe. It would be necessary for him to stay in the house for ten days, Lopukh6f for some time having neglected his illness, but yet it could be cured. Kirsdnof had to have a long talk with Vi^ra Pavlovna to quiet her alarm. Finally, she was convinced that they were not deceiving her, that in all probability the illness was not only not serious, but not even difficult. But this was only in all probability. But are there not contingencies which arise contrary to all probability? Kirsdnof began to call twice a day on the sick man. They both saw that the illness was without complications and not dangerous. On the fourth morning, Kirsdnof said to Vi^ra Pavlovna, Dmitri is all right. Everything is going well with him. For three or four days more, it may be hard, but it will not be more severe than it is today, and then he will begin to gain. But I want to talk seriously about you yourself, Vi^ra Pavlovna. You do not act wisely in sitting up all night. He does not need a nurse. He does not even need me but you may harm yourself all for nothing your nerves are already very much unstrung for a long time he tried to reason with vi'ra pavlovna but without avail i know it's nothing and there's no reason in it and i should be glad to but i cannot that is glad to sleep in the night-time and leave her husband without a watcher finally she said all that you are telling me now he has already told me many times as you know well of course i would have listened to him sooner than to you consequently i can't against such an argument there is no disputing kirsdnof shook his head and went away he came to see the sick man at ten o'clock that evening and sat by his bedside together with vi'ra pavlovna for half an hour and then he said now vi'ra pavlovna go and get some rest we both ask you to i'm going to stay here tonight vi'ra pavlovna hesitated she herself knew or more than half knew that it was not necessary to sit all night beside the sick man and here she is compelling kirsdnof who is a busy man to waste his time and what was it in reality it apparently is not necessary apparently but who knows no it is impossible to leave the milenki alone who knows what might happen he may want a drink he may want tea he is so delicate he will not wake up consequently it is impossible not to sit by his side but it is not necessary for kirsdnof she will not allow it she said that she would not go away for she was not very tired that she was taking a great deal of rest in the daytime under the present circumstances i beg of you to leave us entirely to ourselves kirsdnof took her hand and led her from the room almost by main force i am really ashamed of her alexander said the sick man what a ridiculous part you are playing to sit up all night with a man who is not sick enough to need it but i am very grateful to you i could not even persuade her to hire a nurse when she was afraid to leave me alone she would not trust me in anybody's hands if i had not seen that it was impossible for her to be calm when you were in somebody else's care then of course i should not have disturbed my comfort but now i hope that she will get some sleep i am a doctor and i am your friend in fact vi'ra pavlovna as soon as she touched her bed fell sound asleep three sleepless nights in succession three sleepless nights in themselves would not have been so trying and the worriment by itself would not have been so trying but the worriment together with the sleepless nights without any rest in the daytime was very dangerous two or three days and nights more without sleep and she would have been more seriously ill than her husband kirsdnof spent three nights more with the sick man for it did not tire him much because he slept very peacefully only out of carefulness he locked the door so that vi'ra pavlovna should not see his unconcern she suspected that he slept instead of watching she was calm however because he was a doctor and there were no grounds for fear were there he himself knows whether he ought to sleep or not she was ashamed that she could not have been calm before so as not to have disturbed him but now he paid no attention to her assurances that she would sleep even though he were not there you are to blame vi'ra pavlovna and therefore you must be punished i do not trust you but in four days it was perfectly obvious to her that the sick man was no longer sick the proofs even to her scepticism were very clear that very evening they were playing cards lopukh6f was half lying down or was not even lying down at all and he spoke in a very clear voice 
kirsdnof could stop his somnolent watching and announce that fact alexander matvitch why have you entirely forgotten me i mean me you are always on good terms with dmitri he calls on you very often but you have not called on us till this sickness it seems to me for half a year it's such a long time and don't you remember we used to be very good friends people change vera pavlovna then again i am working very hard if i may say a word for myself i call on scarcely anybody i have no time besides i am lazy you get so tired being at the hospital in the medical school from nine o'clock till five that you don't feel it possible to go anywhere else or make any change except from your uniform into your smoking jacket friendship is a good thing but don't get angry if i say that a cigar on a sofa in a smoking jacket is better still and in fact kirsdnof had not called on the lopukhovs for more than two years the reader has not once noticed his name among the common guests and among the frequent callers for a long time he was the most infrequent of all end of part three chapter seven recording by expatriate in bangor maine part three chapter eight of a vital question or what is to be done by nikolai chernyshevsky translated by nathan haskell dole eighteen fifty two to nineteen thirty five and others this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by expatriate in bangor maine part three marriage and second love chapter eight the sapient reader i explain myself only to the masculine reader my lady reader has too much understanding to be bothered with guessing and therefore i do not explain to her i say this once and for all there are also among my masculine readers not a few who are not stupid and to this class of readers also i do not need to make any explanation but the majority of readers and this number includes almost all literary men and those who claim to be literary men are sapient and it is always agreeable for me to talk with such and so the sapient reader says i understand how the affair is going to turn a new romance is going to begin in vera pavlovna's life and in this kirsdnof is going to play a part i understand even more kirsdnof fell in love with vera pavlovna long ago and that was the reason why he ceased to call on the lopukhovs oh what penetration you have my sapient readers as soon as you are told anything then you say i thought so and you plume yourself on your shrewdness i bow before you sapient reader and thus in vera pavlovna's life appears a new person and it would be necessary to describe him if he had not already been described when i spoke about lopukhov i had some difficulty in distinguishing between him and his intimate friend and there was scarcely anything more that i could have said about him that i should not have to repeat about kirsdnof and in fact everything that the sapient reader can learn from the following description of kirsdnof's characteristics will be a repetition of lopukhov's characteristics lopukhov was the son of a meshanin who was well-to-do for a man of his rank that is one who very often has meat in his she kirsdnof was the son of a clerk in a provincial court that is a man who often has no meat in his she or in other words not very often has meat in his she lopukhov in very early youth almost from childhood earned money for his own support kirsdnof after he reached the age of twelve helped his father copy papers and he gave lessons while he was still in the fourth class in the gymnasium they both by their own exertion without connections without acquaintances made their own way what sort of a man was lopukhov in the gymnasium he did not succeed in learning french and he did not go further in german than the declension of der d das with few mistakes but after he entered the medical school lopukhov soon saw that he could not make great progress in science with the russian language alone he took a french dictionary and such french books as happened to be at hand and those that fell into his hands were telemach and the stories of madame gully and several livraisons of our clever journal revue étrangère they were not very attractive books but he took them and though he was an eager reader he said i shall not open a russian book until i am able to read french fluently and thus he learned french fluently but he acted differently in regard to german he rented a room in a house where there were a good many german laborers 
it was a wretched hole the germans were tiresome it was a long walk to the medical school but he lived there until he had accomplished what he needed kirsdnof did in a different way he learned the german through different books with a lexicon just as lopukhov learned french but french he acquired in a peculiar fashion through one book without a lexicon it was the gospels a very familiar book and he took the new testament in the translation of geneva then he read it over eight times the ninth time he understood it thoroughly and so he mastered it what kind of a man was lopukhov this was what he was one time he was walking in a shabby uniform on the kamenoy ostrov prospect on his way from his lesson for which he got fifty kopecks thirty cents an hour though he had to go a distance of three versts from the lyceum a distinguished somebody of imposing mien met him motions him out of the way in the manner of men of imposing mien and bears straight down upon him without giving way but lopukhov at that time had a rule not to be the first to turn out for anybody except a woman they bumped against each other with their shoulders and this distinguished somebody half turning about said what a pig what a hog you are but while he was preparing to continue the lesson lopukhov made a full turn towards the distinguished somebody took the distinguished somebody by the body and deposited him in the gutter very tenderly then he stood over him and said don't you move else i will drag you farther where the mud is deeper two moujiks passed looked on praised him a chinovnik passed looked at him and did not praise him but smiled sweetly some carriages passed by no one looked out it could not be seen who was lying in the gutter lopukhov stood there for a time then he took the distinguished somebody not by the body this time but by the hand picked him up led him upon the highway and said ah my dear sir how did you happen to get into this plight you have not done yourself any harm i hope allow me to brush your coat a moujik passed by and began to help wipe the dirt off from the distinguished somebody two meshanins passed they also stopped to help wipe him off they wiped the dirt off from the distinguished somebody and departed kirsdnof never had such an experience as that but this was what happened to him a certain lady who had people to run errands for her thought that it was necessary to have prepared a catalogue of the library left her by her husband who was a follower of voltaire and had died twenty years before why such a catalogue was needed after the lapse of twenty years is more than i can tell kirsdnof was selected to arrange the catalogue at a salary of eighty roubles he worked at it a month and a half suddenly the lady came to the conclusion that the catalogue was not necessary she came into the library and said don't take any more trouble about this work i have changed my mind and here's to pay you and she gave kirsdnof ten roubles your ladyship he gave the lady the benefit of her full title i have already done more than half the work out of seventeen shelves i have already catalogued ten you find that i have taken advantage of you as regards pay nicolas come here and talk this matter over with this gentleman nicolas came in how do you dare to insult my maman you are a milk-sucker an unjustifiable expression on kirsdnof's part nicolas was five years older than he you had better hear both sides first help cried nicolas help i will show you how to call for help in the twinkling of an eye the lady screamed and fell in a swoon and nicolas felt that he could not move his hands which were fixed to his sides as by an iron belt and indeed they were pinned by kirsdnof's right hand while his left hand had nicolas by the jaw ready to clutch his throat and kirsdnof was saying just see how easily i can choke you and he squeezed his gullet and nicolas perceived that it was a very easy thing for kirsdnof to choke him but kirsdnof's hand has already left his throat he can breathe freely and yet kirsdnof's hand is at his throat and kirsdnof addressing the goliaths who appeared at the door says stay where you are else i shall choke him get out of here else i shall choke him all this nicolas understood in the twinkling of an eye he made a sign with his nose which signified that kirsdnof was right in the case now brother see me downstairs said kirsdnof again turning to nicolas and continuing to embrace nicolas as before he went into the front room went downstairs followed from afar by the astonished gaze of the goliaths and on the last step he let go of nicolas's throat pushed nicolas himself away and went into a store to buy a cap in place of the one which had remained as a prey in the possession of nicolas now 
what difference can you find between such people all their most prominent features are features not of individuals but of a type a type differing so greatly from that to which you are accustomed sapient reader that its general peculiarities hide the individual differences in them these people when seen amongst others are like europeans among chinamen whom the chinamen cannot distinguish apart in all of them they see one characteristic that they are red-headed barbarians who do not understand any ceremonies in their eyes the french are just as red-headed as the english and the chinamen are right as they look upon it all europeans are like any one european not individuals but representatives of a type and nothing more all of them alike do not eat cockroaches and centipedes they are alike in not cutting people into little bits they all alike drink brandy and wine made from grapes and not from rice and actually even the one thing which the chinamen see is their native custom the drinking of tea practised in a diametrically different way from their way with sugar and never without sugar thus people of the type to which lopukhov and kirsdnof belong seem alike to people of a different type every one of them is a man dauntless firm unwavering capable of undertaking any matter and if he undertakes it he sticks so resolutely to it that it cannot slip out of his grasp this is one side of their nature another side each one of them is a man of irreproachable integrity so much so that the question never even enters our mind is it possible to rely on this person unconditionally it is as clear as the fact that he breathes with his lungs as long as the lungs breathe such a heart is warm and unchanged you can lean your head upon such a bosom you can rest upon it these general features are so prominent that the personal peculiarities are covered over by them it is not long that this type has been in existence among us in former times there were only isolated individuals who gave promise of it they were exceptions and as exceptions they felt lonely and powerless and for that very reason they were inactive or they fell into despair or they felt exalted or became romantic or fanciful that is they could not possess the chief characteristic of this type they could not show any cool practicability an even well-regulated activity or active sound good sense those were people who though they had this very same nature had not yet developed into this type and this type is a recent growth in my time it had not yet come into existence though i am not very old in fact am not at all an old man i myself could not have come to be such i was brought up in a different epoch and for the very reason because i myself am not of this type i can without the least hesitation express my respect for it unfortunately i do not give myself a word of praise when i say in regard to these people they are good people this type sprang up not long ago and it is growing rapidly it was engendered by the times it is a sign of the times and shall i say further it will vanish with its time and not a long time either its already short life is doomed to be short in the future six years ago these people were not to be seen three years ago they were despised and now but it does not make any difference what is thought about them now in a very few years a very few years these people will be called upon save us and whatever they will say will be believed by everybody a few years more and maybe not years but months and they will be cursed and they will be driven off the stage they will be hissed and insulted all right hiss and cast insults drive them away and curse you have gained your benefit from them that is sufficient for them and amid the noise of hissings amid the thunder of curses they will leave the scene proud and modest stern and kind as they have ever been and will nothing be left of them on the stage no how will the world get along without them wretchedly but after them it will be still better than if they had not been and years will pass and people will say after they left the world was better but still it is bad enough and when this is said it shows that the time for this type has come again and it will come again and be represented in greater numbers in better forms because then there will be more of good in the world and again the same history will be repeated in a new light and so it will come to pass that men shall say well now we are enjoying life and then it will not be an exceptional type because all people will be of this same type and they will find it difficult to understand how there ever was a time when it was considered a peculiar type and not the general nature of all people
End of part three, chapter eight. Recording by expatriate in Bangor, Maine. Part three, chapter nine of A Vital Question or What is to be Done by Nikolai Chernyshevsky, translated by Nathan Haskell Dole, eighteen fifty two to nineteen thirty five, and others. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Expatriate in Bangor, Maine. Part three, Marriage and Second Love, chapter nine but as europeans among chinamen are all of one face and one way of acting only so far as the chinamen are concerned but in reality among the europeans there are incomparably wider differences than among the chinese so in this apparently monotonous type the variety of individualities is developed into more classes and are more distinguishable from each other than among all the varieties of all the different types that are separate from each other here you find all sorts of people sybarites ascetic severe and tender-hearted and every other kind but as the sternest of europeans is very kind the most cowardly is very brave the most passionate is very moral in comparison with the chinaman so it is with these the most ascetic of them deems it more necessary for all men to be more comfortable than is imagined by the people not of this type the most passionate are more stern in their moral rules than the greatest moralizers not of this type but all this they interpret according to their own fashion and morality comfort and sensuality and goodness they understand in a peculiar way and they all understand them in the same way and not only do they all understand them in one way but this one way is such a way that morality comfort goodness and passion are all regarded as one and the same thing but all this again is only when it comes into comparison with the understanding of the chinamen among themselves a great deal of difference is found in understanding these things according to the differences of their nature but how now to bring into harmony this conflict of nature and understanding among themselves in conversations about their own affairs among themselves and only among themselves and not among chinamen european natures give expression to their characteristics thus among the people of this type apparently there is a very great variety of natures when they are among themselves and only among themselves and not with strangers we have had before us two people of this type vira pavlovna and lopukhov and we have seen how their relations were arranged between them now there comes in a third person let us see what difference will be shown now that we have the possibility of comparing the other two with this one vira pavlovna sees before her lopukhov and kirsanov hitherto she has had no choice now she has end of part three chapter nine recording by expatriate in bangor maine part three chapter ten of a vital question or what is to be done by nikolai chernyshevsky translated by nathan haskell dole eighteen fifty two to nineteen thirty five and others this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by expatriate in bangor maine part three marriage and second love chapter ten but it is necessary to say two or three words about kirsanov's outward appearance he as well as lopukhov had regular and handsome features some regarded the former others the latter as the better looking lopukhov was rather thinner had dark chestnut hair gleaming dark eyes which seemed almost black an aquiline nose thick lips and a rather oval face kirsanov had blonde hair inclining to a brownish shade dark blue eyes a straight grecian nose a small mouth an oblong face and a remarkably light complexion both were men of very tall stature and straight lopukhov somewhat broader across his shoulders kirsanov somewhat taller kirsanov's outward circumstances were very good he was now a professor the largest majority at the balloting was at first opposed to him not only did they want to refuse him his professorship but they would have taken away his doctor's degree but this was impossible two or three young men and one not a young man 
from among his former professors, friends of his, long ago declared to the rest of the faculty that there was in the world a certain Virchow, and that he lived in Berlin, and also a certain Claude Bernard, and he lived in Paris, and certain others, whose names you could not remember, who also lived in various towns, and that Virchow, Claude Bernard, and the others were the stars, as it were, of the medical science all this seemed extremely improbable because we know all the stars of science burghoff hufeland and harvey was also a very distinguished man who discovered the circulation of the blood then jenner who taught vaccination and so we know them but these virchoffs and claude bernards we do not know what kind of stars are they however the devil knows them and here this very claude bernard spoke with respect about kirsdnof's works when kirsdnof took his degree and so they could not help it they had to give kirsdnof the degree of doctor and a year and a half later they gave him a professorship the students said that if he came into the faculty the party of good professors would be increased he had never practiced and he said that he had given up the practice of medicine but he used to spend long hours at the hospital it happened that he dined there on some days and even slept there many nights but what has he done there he said that he was working for science and not for the sake of the sick i do not cure i only observe and make experiments the students confirmed this and declared that at the present time only quacks cured because at this time it is impossible to effect cures the hospital servants judged the matter in a different way well this kirsdnof takes folks home into his palace it must be a bad case they used to say among themselves and then they would say to the patient heap up good heart it takes a tough sickness to stand up against this surgeon he is a master and a real father end of part three chapter ten recording by expatriate in bangor maine part three chapter eleven of a vital question or what is to be done by nikolai chernyshevsky translated by nathan haskell dole eighteen fifty two to nineteen thirty five and others this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by expatriate in bangor maine part three marriage and second love chapter eleven during the first part of vira pavlovna's married life kirsdnof used to be very frequently at the lopukhovs as often as every other day or to speak more accurately almost every day and soon almost on the very first day he became very close friends with vira pavlovna nearly as much so as with lopukhov it lasted this way for half a year one time they were sitting all three together he the husband and the wife the conversation was going on as usual without any ceremony kirsdnof was doing the most of the talking but suddenly he grew silent what has got into you alexander what has made you so solemn all of a sudden alexander matveitch nothing in particular i feel rather blue that does not happen to you very often said vira pavlovna i might say never without some reason said kirsdnof in a constrained tone a few minutes afterwards he got up and went away earlier than sometimes taking his leave in his usual simple manner two days afterwards lopukhov told vira pavlovna that he had been to see kirsdnof who as it seemed to him had received him in a very strange way kirsdnof apparently wanted to be ceremonious towards him and this had always been an unnecessary formality between them lopukhov had looked him straight in the face and said alexander you must be provoked with someone is it with me no is it with vierotchka no then what is the matter with you nothing at all it is only in your imagination why aren't you friendly towards me to-day you are not natural you are as though you were provoked kirsdnof began to pour out his assurances that lopukhov was mistaken and in this way he managed to confirm the impression that he was provoked then afterwards it seemed as though he must have been ashamed he again became as unaffected kind friendly as could be desired lopukhov availing himself of the fact that the man seemed in his right mind again asked him now alexander tell me the reason of your getting provoked i never thought of being provoked and again he became disagreeable and disputatious what a marvel lopukhov could not think of anything that might have offended him 
and this did not seem possible considering all their mutual respect and warmth of friendship vi'ra pavlovna also tried hard to recollect whether she could have offended him in any manner and she too could think of nothing out of the way for she knew just as her husband did that it was impossible as far as she was concerned two days more passed for kirsdnof not to call at the lopukhofs for four days was a most unusual circumstance vi'ra pavlovna even wondered could he be well lopukhof went round to see if he were really ill how ill he is still angry lopukhof questioned him persistently after repeated negations he began to get off some disjointed nonsense about his relations with lopukhof and vi'ra pavlovna that he loves and respects them very highly but after all that had happened they were not attentive enough to him but in what respect and this was worst of all there was not the slightest hint in his bombastic talk it was clear that the gentleman was eaten up by ambition all this was so savage to witness in such a man as lopukhov considered kirsdnof to be and so the visitor said to his host now listen we have been friends and the time will come when you will be ashamed of this kirsdnof with affected humility replied that in fact it must on his side be a mere trifle but what can be done supposing he has been offended by many things nu no, what was it then he began to bring up a good many occasions at which he had taken offence lately all in such a style as this you said that the lighter the hair of a person the nearer he is to dullness vi'ra pavlovna said that tea was getting dearer the one was a hit at the colour of my hair the other was a hint that i was eating you out of house and home lopukhov's hands fell to his side this man had gone crazy with his ambition or properly speaking he has become a fool and a good-for-nothing lopukhov returned home in a gloomy frame of mind it was bitter for him to see such a warp in a man of whom he was so fond to vi'ra pavlovna's questions as to what he had learned he answered gloomily that it would be better not to speak about it that kirsdnof had spoken disagreeable nonsense and that he was probably sick in three or four days kirsdnof who had in all probability come to his senses and seen the savage disgracefulness of his behaviour came to the lopukhovs he behaved himself as well as possible then he began to tell how mean he had been from vi'ra pavlovna's words he perceived she had not heard from her husband of his absurdities he sincerely thanked lopukhov for his consideration and as a punishment to himself he began to tell the whole story to vi'ra pavlovna he grew sentimental he excused himself and said that he was sick and again there followed some more nonsense vi'ra pavlovna tried to say that he ought to stop talking about it that it was a mere trifle he clung to the word trifle and began to rattle off the same sort of ridiculous nonsense as he had done before in his talk with lopukhov he very delicately and circumstantially began to develop the thought that of course it was a trifle because he was aware of his insignificance in the eyes of the lopukhovs but that he didn't deserve any more and so on and all this was said with the most underhanded slyest hints and at the same time with the most courteous expressions of respect and devotion vi'ra pavlovna hearing this let her hands fall to her side exactly as her husband had done when he had gone they remembered that for several days previous to his entirely losing his balance he had been strange before they had not noticed it particularly or even perceived it but now his former absurdities are explained they were of the same kind only more developed after this kirsdnof began to call very often but the continuation of their former simple relations was utterly impossible from behind the mask of a respectable man there appeared such a long ass ear that the lopukhovs would have lost a great part of their respect for their former friend even if this ear were hidden henceforth for ever but it continued to appear frequently it would not show itself for any long time and then it would hide itself but it was pitiful low and ugly they soon became entirely cold to kirsdnof and as he really had no pleasure in calling at the lopukhovs he soon ceased to call but he still used to meet the lopukhovs at the houses of friends some time afterwards the spite of the lopukhovs towards him grew less there was nothing serious the matter now lopukhov began to call on him in a year he even began to call at the lopukhovs again and he was the same elegant kirsdnof as of old simple and honest but he called seldom 
it was evident that he hesitated and was ashamed when he remembered the stupid business of which he had been guilty lopukhov had almost forgotten about it and so had vira pavlovna but the cordial relations once severed had never returned again according to outward appearances he and lopukhov were close friends and in fact they were so lopukhov began almost to respect him as before and called on him not unfrequently vira pavlovna also gave him back a portion of her former friendliness but she saw him very seldom end of part three chapter eleven recording by expatriate in bangor maine part three chapter twelve of a vital question or what is to be done by nikolai chernyshevsky translated by nathan haskell dole eighteen fifty two to nineteen thirty five and others this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by expatriate in bangor maine part three marriage and second love chapter twelve now lopukhov's illness or more properly speaking vira pavlovna's extraordinary attachment to her husband compelled kirsdnof to be more than a week in close familiar intercourse with the lopukhovs he knew that he was stepping in a dangerous path when he decided to spend whole nights with them in order to take away vira pavlovna's watch how happy and proud he would have been when three years ago having noticed in himself some signs of passion he had so strenuously succeeded in doing all that was necessary for the interruption of its development how delighted he felt at this two or three weeks he was drawn to the lopukhovs but at that time he felt more satisfaction from recognizing his firmness in the struggle than pain from the deprivation and in a month the pain entirely passed and there remained only the pleasure of his uprightness it was so calm and delightful in his soul but now there was more danger than then in these three years vira pavlovna had assuredly undergone great moral development then she was scarcely more than a child now it is otherwise the emotions stirred by her could no longer resemble the amusing attachment to a little girl whom you love and at whom you smile at the same time and not only morally had she developed if the beauty of a woman is a real beauty then in our far north a beautiful woman grows more beautiful every year yes three years of life at such a period develop a great deal of good in the soul in the eyes in the features and in the whole person if the person is good and the person's life is good it was a great danger but only for him kirsdnof what danger could there be for vira pavlovna she loves her husband kirsdnof is not so stupid and conceited as to look upon himself as a dangerous rival for lopukhov and not out of false modesty does he think this all respectable people who know him and lopukhov put them on the same level and on lopukhov's side is the immeasurable advantage of having already won her love yes won it he has absolutely gained her heart her choice is already made and she is satisfied with her choice and she can have no thought of looking for something better isn't it good enough as it is it is ridiculous to think about it this fear on her account and lopukhov's would be a very stupid piece of self-conceit on kirsdnof's part and is it out of any such stupid nonsense that kirsdnof should have to suffer a month perhaps two is it from any such nonsense that he should let a woman strain her nerves and run the risk of serious illness by sitting by her husband's bedside is it worth while for the sake of avoiding a trifling and short interference with his old quiet and well-regulated life to let serious harm befall a man a man of no less worth and this would have been dishonourable and this dishonourable action is more disagreeable than the really not very severe struggle with himself which he would have to undergo and the final end of which in the proud satisfaction of his own firmness there could be no doubt thus reasoned kirsdnof when deciding to relieve vira pavlovna from her idle watching the necessity for the watching passed for the preservation of propriety so as not to make an abrupt stop which would attract attention kirsdnof had to call two or three times more on the lopukhovs every day then in a week then in a month then in a half year and then his absence would be sufficiently explained by his occupation end of part three chapter twelve 
Recording by Expatriate in Bangor, Maine. Part three, chapter thirteen of A Vital Question, or What is to be Done by Nikolai Chernyshevsky, translated by Nathan Haskell Dole, eighteen fifty two to nineteen thirty five, and others. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Expatriate in Bangor, Maine. Part three, Marriage and Second Love, chapter thirteen everything was going well with kirsdnof as he thought his attachment was renewed and stronger than before but the struggle with it did not present any serious suffering it was easy here kirsdnof was at the lopukhovs for the second time since dmitri sergeitch's cure was effected and he was going to stay till nine o'clock that would be enough formality would be observed next he would call in two weeks time then the separation would be almost accomplished and now it would be necessary to sit one hour more and during this week the development of his passion had been about half scotched in a month everything would be over he is very well satisfied he takes part in the conversation as naturally as possible because he is rejoiced at his success and his very satisfaction gives him greater unconcern lopukhov expected to go out of doors for the first time on the morrow on this account vera pavlovna was in a remarkably lively state of mind she was even more rejoiced than the invalid himself the conversation turned upon the illness they laughed about it and they praised in a jocular tone vera pavlovna's wifely self-sacrifice who had nearly upset her own health by worrying over what was not worth worrying about laugh away laugh away she said but i know well that if you had been in my place you would not have had enough strength of mind to act any way different what an influence the solicitude of others has upon a person said lopukhov now the sick man himself is subjected to the delusion that he must take god knows what care of himself when he sees that people are worried on his account i might have left the house three days ago but i still stayed in the house and this very morning i wanted to go out but i postponed it for one day more so that there might be less danger yes you might have gone out a long time ago said kirsdnof in confirmation now i call this heroism and to tell the truth i am awfully tired of it i should like to go out this instant my dear it was for the sake of putting me at ease that you showed your heroism but let us go out this very moment if you are so anxious to put an end to your quarantine i am going to run over to the shop for half an hour let's all go together it will be very good of you after your sickness to pay your first visit to our union the girls will notice it and will be greatly pleased at such an attention all right let's go all together said lopukhov with noticeable satisfaction at the idea of breathing fresh air to-day i declare the hostess has shown fine tact said vira pavlovna it did not occur to me that perhaps alexander matveitch might not care to go with us no on the contrary it is very interesting to me i have been wanting for a long time to go there your thought is a happy one in point of fact vera pavlovna's suggestion turned out propitiously the girls were really delighted that lopukhov paid them the first visit after his sickness kirsdnof was greatly interested in the shop and a man of his turn of thought could not help being interested if a special cause had not prevented him he would have been from the very first one of the most enthusiastic instructors in it half an hour or maybe even an hour in the shop passed before they knew it vira pavlovna led him through the different rooms and showed him everything while they were returning from the dining hall into the working rooms a girl who had not been in the working rooms came up to vira pavlovna the girl and kirsdnof looked at each other nastenka sasha and they embraced each other sashenka my dear how glad i am to see you the girl kept on kissing him and laughed and cried at once coming to her senses from joy she said no vira pavlovna i am not going to speak about business now i cannot part from him come sashenka let us go to my room kirsdnof was no less glad than she but vira pavlovna noticed an expression of deep grief in his eyes after he recognized her and this was not to be wondered at the girl was in the last stages of consumption nastenka had entered the union about a year before and even then was very ill if she had remained in the shop where she had been working till that time she would have died 
but in the union there was a chance for her to live somewhat longer. The girls entirely relieved her from sewing. It was easy for them to give her other work that was not harmful for her to do. She looked after the little interests of the shop. She took charge of the closets. She received orders, and no one could say that Nastenka was less useful than anyone else in the shop. The Lopukovs went away without waiting for Kirsdnof to finish his interview with Nastenka. End of Part 3, Chapter 13, Recording by Expatriate in Bangor, Maine Part 3, Chapter 14 of A Vital Question, or What is to be Done by Nikolai Chernyshevsky translated by nathan haskell dole eighteen fifty two to nineteen thirty five and others this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by expatriate in bangor maine part three marriage and second love chapter fourteen on the next day early in the morning nastenka came to vira pavlovna i want to tell you about what you saw yesterday vira pavlovna she said but for some time she was at a loss how to go on. I would not want you to think ill of him, Vera Pavlovna. What do you mean? You must have a poor opinion of me, Nastasya Borisovna. No, if it were someone else besides me, I should not have thought of such a thing, but you know I am not like other girls. No, Nastasya Borisovna, you have no right to speak about yourself in such a way. We have known you for a year, and before that a good many of our union knew you this proves that you do not know anything about me how so i know a good deal about you you have been a servant girl the last time you were with the actress n after she got married you left her so as to avoid her father-in-law you entered wise shop and from there you came to us i know all the particulars about it of course i know that maximova and shena who know all about me would not tell anything to anybody but after all i thought that you and the others might have heard about me ah how glad i am they yonder don't know anything about it and i am going to tell you so that you may know what a good man he is i have been a very bad girl vira pavlovna you nastasya borisovna yes vira pavlovna i have i have been a very bold girl i had not the slightest shame and i used to be always drunk and that's the reason that i am ill vira pavlovna because with my weak lungs i used to drink too much this was the third case of the kind that had come under vira pavlovna's observation these girls who had behaved themselves with perfect propriety since their acquaintance with her told her that hitherto they had been leading bad lives the first time she was amazed at such a confession but after reasoning it over for several days she asked herself how about my own life the filth in which i grew up was also very bad however it did not stick to me and there are probably thousands of women who have grown up in purity in families worse than mine is there anything strange in the fact that those whom a happy chance has brought out from such degradation are not ruined she listened to the second confession and was not surprised because the girl who made it had kept intact all the noble peculiarities of a human being generosity capability for genuine service and softness of heart had even preserved a great part of her innocence nastasya borisovna i have heard such confessions as you want to make and it was hard for both of us for her who spoke and for me who listened i shall respect you not less but rather more than before when now i know that you have endured a great deal but i understand the whole story without listening let us not speak about it there is no need for you to confess before me i myself have spent many years in great sorrows i am trying not to think about them and i don't like others to speak about them it's too hard no vira pavlovna i have a different feeling about it i want to tell you what a good man he is i want someone to know how grateful i am to him and whom can i tell it to if not to you what kind of a life i led of course there is no need of speaking about that it was of the same stamp as that of all such poor creatures i only want to tell you how i became acquainted with him it is so pleasant for me to talk about him and besides i am going to live in his house and you must know why i am going to leave the shop if telling this story will give you any pleasure anastasia borisovna i will gladly listen let me get my work first yes but it is impossible for me to work 
how kind these girls have been to let me have such work as agreed with my health i shall be grateful to them all to each one tell them vira pavlovna that i asked you to thank them for me i was walking on the nevsky vira pavlovna it was rather early when i went out a student was walking along and i accosted him he did not reply but crosses to the other side of the street then he sees that i am following him i grasped him by the arm no said i i am not going to let you go you are such a handsome little fellow but i beg of you to let go of me he says no come along with me i do not care to well then i will go with you where are you going i shall not leave you on any account i was such a shameless girl much worse than anybody else perhaps from the very reason anastasia borisovna that you were at heart more modest more conscientious yes it may be so at least i have seen this in others not at that time of course but afterwards i understood it when i told him that i was going with him at all events he laughed and said if you want to come along but it will be useless he wanted to teach me a lesson as he told me afterwards it was disagreeable to him to have me clinging to him and so i went along and i told him all sorts of absurdities but he kept silent and so we went to his rooms for a student he lived then very comfortably he used to get from his pupils about twenty roubles a month and he lived all by himself i stretched out on his sofa and said nu where is your wine no says he i shall give you no wine but you can have tea if you want with whisky i said no without whisky i began to do all sorts of foolish things to be utterly shameless he sat down and looked at me but he did not show any interest so offensive was it to him nowadays you can find such young men vira pavlovna since that time young men have been growing morally better but then it was a very rare thing i began to get angry and i scolded him since you are such a stick i said so i am going what is the use of going now you may as well have some tea my landlady will bring the samovar right in but don't abuse me and all the time he addressed me formally he said you had better tell me who you are and how you came to do such things i began to tell him everything that came into my mind we make up stories to suit ourselves and that's the reason no one ever believes us but there are some in spite of all that whose stories are not made up there are among us well-born and well-educated girls he listened and said no you have made up your story poorly i should like to believe it but it is impossible at this time we were drinking tea and then he said do you know your constitution makes it bad for you to drink your lungs are already very much injured by it let me examine you well vira pavlovna you won't believe me but i assure you that i felt ashamed and yet what was my life and how shamefully i had been behaving just a few minutes before and he noticed it don't be disturbed he says i only want to examine your lungs he was then only in the second class but he knew a great deal about medicine he was away ahead in science he examined my chest no says he you must not drink at all you have very weak lungs how can we help drinking i asked we cannot get along without it and it is really impossible vira pavlovna then you must give up the life that you are leading why should i give it up it's such a gay life no says he there's very little gaiety in it new says he i am very busy now and you had better leave me and i left him feeling very angry because i had wasted my evening and i felt very much offended because he was such a passionless fellow because we have our ambition in such matters you know and then in a month it occurred to me to go to the same place again come on says i i'll go and see that stick again i'll see if i can't wake him up this was just before dinner i had gone to bed the previous night and i had not been drinking he was sitting with a book hello old stick says i how do you do what do you want then i began again to do ridiculous things i shall put you out he says stop i told you that i did not like it you are not drunk now and you can understand and you had better heed what i say your face shows that you are sicker than you were before you must give up wine just fix your dress and we will have a little talk well the fact was that my chest had already begun to pain me he examined me again he said that my lungs were in a worse state than before he had a great deal to say yes and my chest did pain me and so i began to get sentimental and i burst into tears i did not want to die 
and he was all the time threatening me with consumption. And I say, how can I give up my mode of life? My Kozyaika will not let me go. I owe her seventeen silver rubles. We were always kept in debt, you know, so that we could not have any voice in the matter. New, says he, I have no seventeen silver rubles with me, but you come and see me day after tomorrow. That seems so strange, because I did not mean to give him any hint, and how could I have expected it? I did not believe my ears, and I wept still more violently, for I thought he was making fun of me. It is a sin and a shame to insult a poor girl when you see that she is weeping, and I did not believe him for a long time, until at last I saw that he was in earnest. And what do you think? He raised the money and gave it to me two days later, and even then I somehow did not believe it. How is it you do this when you do not want to take any favors from me, I said. I paid off my Kozyaika and rented a separate room, but I had nothing to do and I had no money, and so I went on living as before, that is, not exactly as before, what an improvement it was, Vera Pavlovna. I used to receive only my acquaintances, my good friends, those who did not offend me, and I had no wine either, and therefore what an improvement. And do you know how easy it was for me in comparison with what it had been before? No, after all, it was hard, and I want to tell you this. You know me. Am I not a modest girl? Whoever hears anything bad of me now? And here in the shop how much care I take of the children, and they all love me, and those old women cannot say that I am teaching them anything bad, and so I lived in this way. Three months or so went by, and during this time I took good care of myself, because my life was peaceful and though i was ashamed on account of the money i did not look upon myself as a bad girl only at that time sashenka used to come to see me and sometimes i used to go and see him and now i am coming to speak of the subject that i wanted to tell you about he did not come to see me as the others did but he looked after me to see that i did not return to my former weakness or get to drinking wine and really the first days he helped me because i had a strong inclination for wine and i was ashamed on his account supposing he should come in and see that i was drinking and possibly if it had not been for that i should not have resisted because my friends very good young fellows used to say i am going to send out for wine but as i was ashamed on his account i used to say no it must not be but otherwise i should have been tempted the mere thought that wine was bad for me would not have been enough and then in three weeks or so i grew stronger my craving for wine passed and i got out of the habit of drinking and i kept laying up money to pay him back and in two months i paid him up how glad he was that i returned him the money the day after he brought me some muslin for a dress and some other things that he bought with that money he used to come to see me after that just as a doctor calls to take care of an invalid and a month after i had paid off my debt he was sitting in my room and said now nastenka i begin to like your looks and really it's true wine spoils the complexion and its effects don't pass off suddenly but by this time they had passed and the complexion of my face had become more delicate and my eyes were clearer and then again as i had got out of my former habits i began to speak modestly for you know my thoughts after i gave up drinking became modest though i used to get entangled in my speech and sometimes i used to forget myself on account of my former carelessness but by this time i had got accustomed to behaving myself and to speaking more modestly and as soon as he said that i pleased him i was so happy that i wanted to throw myself on his neck but i did not dare and i refrained and he said you see nastenka i am not devoid of feelings and he declared that i had become a nice modest young girl and he caressed me and how did he caress me he took my hand and laid it on his and began to smooth it with his other hand and he looked at my hand and indeed at that time my hands were white and delicate and so when he took my hand you would not believe it i blushed after my life vera pavlovna as though i had been an innocent baruishna this is strange but it is so but with all my shame it is absurd to say vera pavlovna with all my shame it is true i still said how is it that you are willing to caress me alexander matveitch and he said it is because you are a virtuous girl now nastenka and the words virtuous girl that he called me affected me so much that i burst into tears and then he said what is the matter nastenka and he kissed me 
What do you think? When he kissed me, my head began to swim, and I forgot all about the past. Is it possible to believe, Vera Pavlovna, that such a thing could happen to me after such a life as mine? Well, on the next morning I was sitting and weeping and wondering what would become of me, and how should I live, poor creature that I was. All that was left for me was to throw myself into the neva. I felt that I could not live such a life as I had been living. I might die, I might starve to death, but I could not live so any more. You see that I had been in love with him long ago, but, as he had not shown any such feelings towards me, I had no hope of ever winning his love, and my love died away within me, and I did not even know that I had it. And now it was all brought to light again, and of course when you feel such a love, how can you look upon anybody else with favor except the man whom you love? You yourself know that this is impossible. There is nothing else in existence except the one man. Here I was sitting and weeping. What can I do now, being as I have nothing to live on? And I really made up my mind to go and see him once more, and then go and drown myself and thus I spent the whole morning weeping. But suddenly I saw him coming in, and he began to kiss me, and he said, Nastenka, do you want to live at my house? And I told him how I felt, and so I went to live at his house. That was a happy time, Vera Pavlovna. I think that few have ever enjoyed such happiness. And he was always so kind to me. How many times it happened that I woke up, and he was sitting with a book, and then he would come and look after me, and he would forget his book, and he would sit and keep watch over me. But what a modest man he was, Vera Pavlovna. I could understand it afterwards when I came to read and find out how love is described in novels. I could judge then. But with all his modesty, how he loved me. And what a feeling you have when a beloved man loves you. It is a happiness such as you can form no idea of. Let us imagine when he kissed me for the first time. My head even turned. I bowed before him. Such a feeling is sweet, indeed, but that was nothing in comparison to the feeling afterwards. Before the blood boils, you know, there is anxiety, and even in the sweet feeling there is more or less torment, so that it is even hard to bear it, although it is hardly worth while to say how blessed it is, because for such a minute you are ready to sacrifice your life, and there are some who do sacrifice their lives, Vera Pavlovna, therefore it must be a great happiness." but still it is not this, not this at all. It is just the same as when you get lost in daydreams sometimes, when you are sitting alone and merely think, ah, how I love him, and there is no worriment, no anxiety at all in this pleasantness, and you feel so calm, so easy in mind. So it is the same feeling, only a thousandfold stronger, when this beloved man loves you, and how calm you feel, and the heart does not throb, no for that would mean disturbance and you feel nothing of that kind but it is much smoother and there is more pleasantness and it beats so gently and your chest expands and you breathe freer ah this is so this is true it is very easy to breathe eh how easy so that when an hour or two passes like one minute no not a minute not a second there is no time at all just as when you fall asleep and get up again if you fall asleep, you know that much time has passed since you went asleep, but how has the time passed? It did not make up a single minute. And then again, it is the same thing as after you have been asleep. There is no weariness, but on the contrary, freshness, courage, as though you had been resting, and so it is, you have been resting. I said that it was very easy to breathe, and that is the very truth. What a strength in the glance, Vera Pavlovna! No caresses of friends can caress you in such a way, or give you such a sense of luxury as his glance. All the rest that is in love is not as comforting as this comfort. And how he loved me, how he loved me! Ah, what a delight it was! No one can imagine it except the one who has experienced it. You know that, Vera Pavlovna. You know, Vera Pavlovna, that the look of even a woman makes me blush. Our girls will tell you how bashful I am. It is for that reason that I live in a separate room, and how strange it is you would scarcely believe it. But you know all about it, and I need not tell you. But when you think about it, you cannot part from this thought. No, I am going to leave you, Vyara Pavlovna. There is nothing more for me to tell you. I only wanted to tell you how good Sashenka is. End of Part 3, Chapter 14 Recording by Expatriate in Bangor, Maine
Part three, chapter fifteen of a vital question or what is to be done by Nikolai Chernyshevsky, translated by Nathan Haskell Dole, eighteen fifty two to nineteen thirty five, and others. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Expatriate in Bangor, Maine. Part three, Marriage and Second Love, chapter fifteen nastenka finished telling her story to vira pavlovna on other days she lived at kirsdnof's house about two years the signs of her threatening sickness seemed entirely to have disappeared but at the end of the second year when spring came consumption suddenly appeared in its full development the doctor thought that if she went away she might count on staving off her death for a long while they decided to part to occupy her time in sedentary employment was also sure destruction it was necessary for her to look for occupation as a housekeeper chambermaid nurse girl or something of the kind and with such a mistress as would not impose trying duties upon her and in such a way that there should not be unpleasantness and this was a very important thing these conditions were hard to meet but such a place was found kirsdnof had acquaintances among rising artists through them nastenka found a place as chambermaid with one of the actresses in the russian theatre an excellent woman as long as the actress remained on the stage nastenka was well satisfied to live with her the actress was a refined woman and nastenka valued her place it would be hard to find another like it nastenka became attached to her because she never had any disagreeable scenes with her and the actress seeing this became kinder than ever nastenka lived a quiet life there and her disease ceased or almost ceased to develop but the actress got married renounced the stage and made her home in her husband's family and here as vira pavlovna had already heard before the actress's father-in-law began to affront the chambermaid nastenka let us suppose was not subjected to temptation but it occasioned a family quarrel the former actress began to put the old man to shame the old man felt the shame nastenka did not want to be the cause of a family disorder and even if she had wanted she could not enjoy the peaceful life of her former situation and she gave it up that was about two years and a half since her parting from kirsdnof they had not seen each other at all during this time he called upon her but the happiness of the meeting affected her so unfavourably that he begged her not to let him call upon her for her own sake nastenka tried to live as chambermaid in two or three families but everywhere she found so many worriments and unpleasantnesses that it seemed better for her to become a seamstress though it was a direct step towards the development of her disease the disease would have been developed from any such trying position and so it would be better for her to be subjected to such a fate but without the unpleasantness and only from her own work a year of sewing entirely undermined nastenka's health when she entered vira pavlovna's union lopukov who was then the doctor for the shop did everything possible to stop the development of the consumption he did a great deal that is so far as a man with so little real knowledge of medicine can do but the end was at hand nastenka had enjoyed the delusion universal among those who suffer from consumption imagining that her disease was not very far advanced and so she did not seek to see kirsdnof but for the last two months she had persistently asked lupikov whether she had long to live why she wanted to know she did not say and lupikov did not feel that he had the right to tell her plainly about the approaching crisis for he did not see in her question anything more than the universal attachment to human life he tried to calm her but she as it often happens could not be contented for she kept aloof from that which might have given her days a glimpse of happiness but now she herself saw that she had not long to live and her feelings were dominated by this thought but the doctor assured her that she must take care of herself she knew that she had to believe more in him than in her own hopes and therefore she did not look to see kirsdnof of course this doubt could not last long according as her last days approached nastenka's questions became more persistent she either would have said that she had a particular reason for knowing the truth or lopukov and vira pavlovna would have guessed that she had a particular reason in her questions 
and two or three weeks or maybe several days later the result would have been the same as really happened owing to kirsdnof's unexpected appearance in the shop but now the doubt was at an end not brought by the further progress of her questions but by this accidental circumstance how glad i am how glad i am i always have been wanting to catch a sight of you sashenka said nastenka when she took him to her room yes nastenka i too am no less glad than you now you shall not leave me again come back to my house said kirsdnof who was drawn away by a feeling of sympathy and compassion but after he said this it occurred to him how could i have said that to her she most likely is not aware of the nearness of the crisis but she either did not understand at first the sense that could be drawn from these words or she understood it and did not care to heed it and her gladness at seeing once more the man whom she loved deadened her grief at the approaching end at all events she simply showed her happiness by saying how kind you are how could i have ever left you but after he left she wept only now she either understood or may have noticed that she had understood what it meant for her to see him once more well it is of no use for you to take care of yourself any longer but at least you shall enjoy the little of life that is left and indeed she was glad he never left her for a moment except those hours when he had to be in the hospital or at the medical school so she lived about a month and he was always with her and how much they talked about everything what had happened since she had left his house and still further recollections about her past and how many pleasures she had he even took her out to ride he hired a coupe and he took her out every pleasant day into the suburbs of petersburg and she was greatly delighted nature is so dear to a human being that even this pitiable miserable nature surrounding petersburg which cost millions and tens of millions of roubles people are delighted with he used to read to her and they played loto and she even tried to play chess as though she had time to learn it vira pavlovna sometimes spent late hours at their house when returning from her walks and still more often she used to call on the invalid in the morning to distract her thoughts when she was alone and when they were alone together nastenka had only one thing to tell her how kind alexander matveitch was and how good and how she loved him end of part three chapter fifteen recording by expatriate in bangor maine part three chapter sixteen of a vital question or what is to be done by nikolai chernyshevsky translated by nathan haskell dole eighteen fifty two to nineteen thirty five and others this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by expatriate in bangor maine part three marriage and second love chapter sixteen four months passed the watching over nastenka and then his recollections about her deceived kirsdnof it seemed to him that now he was out of danger as far as vira pavlovna were concerned he did not avoid her when she came to see nastenka and stopped to talk with him and afterwards when she tried to console him as long as he mourned for nastenka there was nothing in his feelings towards vira pavlovna except a friendly feeling of gratefulness towards her but the reader has already learned to know what i mean by but the same as he will always know beforehand what is going to follow the pages that he has already read but of course kirsdnof's feeling toward nastenka had not been the same as nastenka's feelings towards him he had long ceased to feel love for her he only felt well disposed to her as towards a woman whom he had loved long before his former love towards her was only the thirst of a youth to love some one no matter whom of course nastenka was not his equal because they were not equal in mental development when he ceased to be a youth he could only feel pity for nastenka and nothing more possibly he could be tender to her on account of old recollections and compassion and that was all his grief for her in fact was very soon appeased but when his grief was a thing of the past he imagined that he was still occupied with it and after he saw that he did not really feel any grief but only recollections of it he saw himself in such relations with vira pavlovna that he found that he was entrapped in a great misfortune vira pavlovna tried to distract him 
and he gave himself up to it for he considered himself safe or rather not realizing that he was falling in love with vira pavlovna again or realizing that by giving himself up to her care he was drifting towards misfortune well and what happened now in two or three months after vira pavlovna began to console him for his grief for nastenka nothing except the fact that he used to spend almost every evening at the lopukhovs or escorted vira pavlovna somewhere or other frequently with her husband but more often by himself that was all that happened but this was altogether too much not only for him but also for her how did vira pavlovna spend her days now till evening it was just the same as before now here it is six o'clock at this time she usually goes alone to the shop or she sits in her room and works by herself but now if she has to be at the shop in the evening kirsdnof was told about it the evening before and he comes to escort her on their walk to and from the shop by the way it was not a very long distance they talk about various matters generally about the union kirsdnof himself is now the most active helper there once there she occupies herself in giving directions and he too has a good deal to do for thirty girls ask not a few questions and favors which it is most convenient for him to fulfil isn't it and during the intervals he sits and talks with the children and here several of the young girls take part in this conversation about everything in the world about the beauty of the arabian stories the thousand and one nights a good many of which he had already told them and about the white elephants which are so esteemed in india just as in our country a good many love white cats half the company think that this is not good taste white elephants cats horses for all these are albinos a sickly species you can see by their eyes that they do not enjoy such good health as the coloured ones but the other part of the company stand up for the white cats and don't you know anything more about the life of mrs beecher stowe whose novel we have all known because you told us asked one of the growing girls no kirsdnof just now does not know it but he will find out about it it is very interesting to him but now he can tell them something about howard who was almost as great as mrs beecher stowe thus pass kirsdnof's talks or kirsdnof's discussions with the little flock one half of the flock consisting of children has been constantly the same but the older half unceasingly changes but now vira pavlovna has finished her business and she returns home with him to tea and they all three sit for a long time after tea now vira pavlovna and her husband spend a much longer time together than when kirsdnof was not there almost every evening that they spend together they have music for an hour or two dmitri sergeitch plays vira pavlovna sings kirsdnof sits and listens sometimes kirsdnof plays and dmitri sergeitch and his wife sing duets but now it often happens that vira pavlovna hurries from the shop so as to have time to dress for the opera now very often they go to the opera sometimes all together and sometimes vira pavlovna and kirsdnof go by themselves and besides the lopukhovs have company more often than before before not counting the young folks for what kind of guests are young folks they are only like nephews the Mertsalovs were almost their only visitors now the lopukhovs have made friends with two or three lovely families the Mertsalovs and two other families made arrangements to have every week in their own circle little evening parties with dancing there used to be six couples and even eight couples of dancers lopukhov scarcely ever goes to the opera or to these parties without kirsdnof but kirsdnof very often escorts vira pavlovna to these entertainments lopukhov says that he much prefers to stay at home in his everyday coat on his sofa and therefore only about half the evenings they spend together but these evenings they are together with scarcely any interruptions it is true when the lopukhovs have no company besides kirsdnof the sofa often draws lopukhov from the parlour where the grand piano stands the piano has now been brought from vira pavlovna's room into the parlour but this does not save dmitri sergeitch very much in a quarter or a half hour kirsdnof and vira pavlovna give up the music and sit by his sofa however vira pavlovna does not sit long by the sofa she quickly arranges herself comfortably on the sofa itself but in such a way that there is plenty of room for her husband also for the sofa is wide that is there is not any too much room 
but she would throw her arm around her husband, and so it is comfortable for him to stay there. And thus passed three months or more. The idol is no longer fashionable, and I myself do not like it at all. That is, personally, I do not like it, just as I do not like sauntering, do not like asparagus. Several things, aren't there, that I am not fond of. But it is impossible for any one man to like all dishes and all ways of amusement. But I know that these things, which are not according to my personal taste, are very good things, that they are to the taste, or they would be to the taste of a vastly greater number of people than those who, like me, prefer chess playing to sauntering, sauerkraut with hemp oil to asparagus. I even know that the taste of the majority, which does not share my enjoyment in chess playing, would be glad not to share my taste for sauerkraut with hemp oil, are not worse than mine and so i say let there be in the world as many amusements as possible or let them almost absolutely vanish from the world but let sauerkraut with hemp oil remain as an antiquarian rarity for a few such odd fellows as i and likewise i know that for the huge majority of people who are not in the least worse than i am happiness must have an idyllic character and i exclaim let the idol begin to reign over all the other characters in life for a few originals who are not fond of it there will be other forms of happiness but the majority must have the idol as to the fact that the idol is not in fashion and therefore people shun it that is no objection at all they shun it just as the fox in the fable shun the grapes it seems to them that the idol is inaccessible and therefore they lay down their dictum let it not be in fashion but it is pure absurdity that the idol is inaccessible it is not only a good thing for almost all people but it is very feasible there ought to be no hardship in arranging it only it must not be for one person or ten persons but for all now the italian opera is an impossible thing for five people but for the whole city of petersburg it is very possible as all see and hear and so too the collected writings of n v gogol moscow eighteen sixty one would be an impossible thing for ten people but for the whole public it is very possible and not expensive as we all know but as long as there is no opera for the whole city it is possible for only a few very music-mad people to enjoy themselves at second-class concerts and as long as the second volume of dead souls was not printed for the whole public only a few of the most eager admirers of gogol not valuing the labor prepared each for themselves manuscript copies a manuscript is incomparably worse than a printed book a second-class concert is very poor compared to an italian opera but both the one and the other are good in their way end of part three chapter sixteen recording by expatriate in bangor maine part three chapter seventeen of a vital question or what is to be done by nikolai chernyshevsky translated by nathan haskell dole eighteen fifty two to nineteen thirty five and others this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by expatriate in bangor maine part three chapter seventeen if a stranger had consulted kirsdnof about the position in which kirsdnof found himself after he came to his senses and if kirsdnof had been a perfect stranger to all the people who were concerned in the matter he would have said to the one who came to consult with him to straighten out this affair by running away is too late i do not know how the play will end but for you to run or to stay is equally dangerous but for those for whose peace you care your running away would be still more dangerous than your remaining of course kirsdnof would have said this only to a man like himself or like lopukhov to a man of firm character and undoubted virtue to other people it would be useless to give advice about such a situation because these other people invariably act in such cases meanly and contemptibly they put the woman to shame they dishonour themselves and then go out into their own society and whimper or boast and take delight in their heroic virtue or their amorous irresistibility with such people neither kirsdnof nor lopukhov like to talk about the way that men of generous character should act but kirsdnof would have been right in telling any one his dictum that to run away now would be worse than to remain it would have been to imply i know how you would act if you remained 
you would act in such a way as not to expose your feelings, because only in this way you will not do ill by remaining. The task before you is so far as possible not to disturb the tranquillity of a woman whose life runs smoothly. But it appears that it is already impossible not to disturb it. The feeling that it is incompatible with her present relations is already, according to all probability, or rather, to use simpler language, already without any doubt, engendered in her, but as yet she does not know it. Whether it will spring up soon or not by herself without any interference on your part is uncertain. But your avoidance of her would be the very thing to call it out. Consequently, your going away would only be to hasten the matter, a thing which you want to avoid. But Kirsdnof argued the case not as a stranger, but as a participant. It seemed to him that to go away would be harder than to remain. The feeling impels him to remain. Consequently, would not to remain be the same thing as to yield to the feeling, to be tempted by its suggestions? What right had he to believe so absolutely that neither by words nor by looks he would not betray his feeling, would not bring it forth, and therefore it would be wiser to go away? In your own case, it is very difficult to distinguish how far reason is tempted by the sophisms of inclination because uprightness says act fight against temptation then you have better chances for noble action this is a translation from the language of theory into everyday speech but the theory to which kirsdnof adhered considers such lofty words as nobleness to be ambiguous obscure and kirsdnof in his terminology would have expressed himself thus every man is an egotist so am i now the question comes up is it more profitable for me to go away or to remain if i go away i crush in me my personal feeling if i remain i am liable to disturb my feeling of human dignity by some stupid word or look which may be caused by this individual feeling the individual feeling may be crushed and by and by my peace of mind may be again restored i may be again satisfied with my life but if i once act against my human nature i shall lose forever the possibility of peace the possibility of self-satisfaction i shall poison all my life my position is like this i am fond of wine and before me is a flask with very good wine but i have a suspicion that this wine is poisoned i cannot tell whether my suspicion is well founded or not must i drink this flask of wine or shall i pour it out so as not to be tempted by it i must not call my decision either noble or even virtuous these are too high words i must simply call it coldly calculating common sense i throw away the flask thus i deprive myself of some pleasure i cause myself some displeasure but by doing so i secure my health that is the possibility of having a great deal of such wine to drink which i shall surely know is not poison i simply do not act foolishly and that is all the praise that I deserve. End of part three, chapter seventeen. Recording by expatriate in Bangor, Maine. Part three, chapter eighteen of A Vital Question or What is to be Done by Nikolai Chernyshevsky. Translated by Nathan Haskell Dole. 1852 to 1935 and others this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by expatriate in bangor maine part three marriage and second love chapter eighteen but how could he withdraw his former game of making believe offended of exhibiting some mean feature of his character so as to depend upon it would not work twice to perform the same trick is impossible a second performance like the first would only have revealed the design of the first would have shown him up as the hero not only of the new but also of the former affair yes and generally speaking it is necessary to avoid any abrupt cessation of relations such an avoidance would be easier but it would be theatrical it would arouse attention that is at the present time it would be mean and contemptible or according to kirsdnof's theory of egotism it would be a stupid miscalculation and so there remained only one and the most tormenting means that is an unobtrusive renunciation carried out in a slow and unnoticeable manner so that it might not be seen that he was giving them up 
This action is very difficult. It requires great tact to disappear from sight, so that your motion is not noticed when you are watched by bright eyes. But it could not be helped. He had to do it in this way. However, according to Kirsdnof's theory, it was not tormenting at all, but rather agreeable. For the harder a deed is to accomplish, the gladder you are on the selfish theory at the strength and skill which you have shown while successfully accomplishing it. And indeed, he fulfilled it successfully. He did not betray his attention by one word too much or one word too little, or by a look. As before, he was free and jocular with Vera Pavlovna. As before, he made it evident that he enjoyed her society, but there appeared various things to hinder his coming to the Lopukhovs as often as before, or remaining there a whole evening as before and the result was that lopukhov had to seize him more often than before by his arm or the lapel of his coat with the words no old fellow you can't get rid of this discussion so easily and by far the larger part of the time that kirsdnof spent at the lopukhovs he tried to stay by his friend's sofa and everything was arranged so gradually that it was not noticed at all how the change was developing interruptions came along and kirsdnof not only brought them up as excuses but moreover was sorry this did not happen every time for too great show of sorrow would not do that such an interruption happened and these interruptions seemed to be so natural so unavoidable that the lopukhovs themselves pushed him from the house reminding him that he had forgotten his promise to be at home because such and such an acquaintance whom he ought to see was coming to his house or he forgot that if he did not call to-day on such and such a person such and such a person would be offended or he had forgotten that he ought to work for at least four hours and ought he not to sleep a little to-night in preparation for it why it's ten o'clock already and he must not talk any more he must go and take up his work kirsdnof moreover did not always listen to them when they reminded him he would not go to see his acquaintances he would let his friend get angry or the work would not run away so he would spend the evening with them but these interruptions kept growing more frequent and scientific operations began to steal unmercifully one evening after another from kirsdnof they might go to the deuce according to his opinion and sometimes he used to say this aloud that is his scientific occupations or his acquaintances had been opposing upon him more than usual how they did impose upon him this also he used to say aloud and so it seemed to him and the lopukhovs saw very well how it was that he was getting to be very popular and so there always came up more and more people to whom he was necessary and then he must not treat his work carelessly for there was no excuse for his being so lazy and indeed he had been very lazy during the last few months and it would be hard for him to begin work again but you must work brother alexander and she would say it's time alexander matveitch the manoeuvre was a difficult one for week after week it was necessary to prolong this wheeling to the left and around and the turn was made so slowly so steadily like the hands of a clock look at it as attentively as you please you cannot see that it is turning but it does its work silently it steadily goes away from its former position and what pleasure kirsdnof as a theorist had in watching his skill in putting this into practice egotists and materialists act only for their own pleasure and kirsdnof laying his hand on his heart could say that he was playing this game only for his own pleasure he delighted in his skill and his boldness thus passed a month and maybe somewhat more and if any one had reckoned he would have found that during this month his friendliness to the lopukhovs had not diminished a hair's breadth but fourfold less time he spent with them and simultaneously he reduced to almost a half the time that he used to spend with vera pavlovna one month more and while their former friendship still remained the friends would see each other but little and the thing would have its hat on lopukhov's eyes were sharp don't they really see anything no not a thing but vera pavlovna and vera pavlovna notices nothing but does she notice no change in herself vera pavlovna notices no change in herself only vera pavlovna dreams a dream end of part three chapter eighteen recording by expatriate in bangor maine
Part three, chapter nineteen of a vital question or what is to be done by Nikolai Chernyshevsky, translated by Nathan Haskell Dole, eighteen fifty two to nineteen thirty five, and others. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Expatriate in Bangor, Maine. Part three, marriage and second love, chapter nineteen. Vera Pavlovna's third dream and vera pavlovna dreams a dream after tea she had a talk with her milenki and went to her room to lie down not to sleep it was too early to sleep why it was only half past nine no she did not even undress she only lay down to read and here she is reading as she lies on her little bed but the book falls away from her eyes and vera begins to think what is the reason that lately i've been feeling lonesome occasionally or not exactly lonesome or does it merely seem so no it is not lonesome but i only just happened to remember that i wanted to go to the opera this evening but this kirsanov attentive fellow that he is went too late to get tickets he might have known that when bosio is singing it is impossible to get two rouble tickets at eleven o'clock of course he cannot be blamed he must have been working till five o'clock surely till five o'clock though he didn't confess it and yet he is to blame no after this i'd better ask the milenki to get tickets and i guess i'd better go to the opera with my milenki too milenki would never be so stupid as to let me go without tickets and he is always glad to go with me my milenki is such a sweet fellow in account of this kirsanov i have missed hearing traviata i would go every night to the opera if there were opera no matter how bad it might be provided only bosio sang the chief role if i had such a voice as bosio it seems to me i would sing all day long i wonder if i could get acquainted with her how could i manage it that artillerist is well acquainted with tamberlik could it be done through him no it is impossible what an absurd thought what is the good of getting acquainted with bosio would she sing for me of course she has to save her voice and how did bosio succeed in learning russian how purely she pronounces but what absurd words where could she have found such wretched poetry yes she must have studied out of the same grammar which i did those verses were quoted in it to illustrate the use of quotation marks how stupid it is to quote such verses in a grammar though it would not be so bad if the poetry were better but there is no need of thinking about the meaning of the verses all one needs to do is to hear her sing the hours of pleasure make the most of the years of youth give up to love what ridiculous poetry wrong accent in the second line make the most of 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 but what a voice and what feeling she puts into her singing and her voice is vastly sweeter than it used to be incomparably better it is wonderful how could it improve so much and here i was wondering how i could get acquainted with her and she herself has come to call upon me how did she find out that i wanted her to yes you came to call on me a long time ago says bosio and she speaks russian i called upon you bosio how could i have called upon you when i was not acquainted with you but i am very very glad to see you vira pavlovna pushed aside her bed curtain so as to give bosio her hand but the cantatrice laughs and it seems that it is not bosio at all but demeric in the role of the gypsy rigoletto only the gaiety of the laughter is demeric's but the voice is still bosio's and she runs away and hides herself behind the bed curtain how disagreeable that this bed curtain hides her and before there was no bed curtain at all where did it come from do you know why i came to you and she laughs as though she were demeric and at the same time bosio who are you you are not demeric are you no are you bosio the songstress laughs you learn rapidly but now it will be necessary for us to attend to what brought me here i want to read your diary with you i do not keep a diary i never kept one look here what is that lying on this little table vera pavlovna looks on the table near the bedstead is lying a copy-book with the inscription v l s diary where did this copy-book come from vera pavlovna takes it opens it the book is written in her own hand but when read the last page says bosio vera pavlovna reads again i am often obliged to stay alone whole evenings but that's nothing i am used to it is that all asked bosio 
That's all. No, you did not read it all. There is nothing more written there. You cannot deceive me, says the visitor. What is this? From behind the bed curtain comes forth a hand. What a handsome hand. No, this wonderful hand does not belong to Bosio. And how does this hand come out from the curtain without pushing it apart? The hand of the new visitor touches the page. From under the hand appear new lines which were not there before. Read, says the visitor. And Vera Pavlovna's heart begins to feel oppressed. She has never seen these lines before. She did not know that they were written, but her heart is oppressed. She does not wish to read the new lines. Read, repeats the visitor. Vera Pavlovna reads. No, it is tiresome for me to be alone. Once I did not feel the loneliness. Why is it tiresome for me now when it did not used to be? Turn back a page, says the visitor. Vera Pavlovna turns a page. The summer of this year? Who writes diaries like that, thinks Vera Pavlovna? It should have been written 1885, June or July, and have the day of the month. But here it stands. The summer of this year. Who keeps diaries in that way? the summer of this year we go picnicking in our usual way into the suburbs to the islands and this time milenki goes along with us how enjoyable it is to me ach so it is august is it what day of the month the fifteenth or no the twelfth yes yes it was about the fifteenth it was after that excursion that my poor milenki became sick thinks vera pavlovna is that all that's all no you don't read everything what is this says the visitor and again through the unparted bed curtain comes the wonderful hand and again it touches the pages and again on the pages appear new words and again vira pavlovna reads against her will the new words why doesn't my milenki come along with us oftener turn one leaf more says the visitor my milenki has so much to do and it is all for my sake for my sake he is working my milenki and that is the answer thinks vira pavlovna happy at the thought turn one page more what honest noble people these students are and how they respect my milenki and i enjoy myself with them just as though they were brothers and we have no ceremoniousness is that all that is all no read further and again appears the hand and touches the page and again come forth new lines and again viera reads the new lines the sixteenth of august that is on the second day after our visit to the island no it was exactly the fifteenth thinks vira pavlovna all the time the milenki spoke with that rachmatov or as they called him out of jest the rigorist and his comrades but he spent hardly quarter of an hour with me that is not true he spent nearly half an hour with me thinks vira pavlovna besides the time when we were sitting together in the boat the seventeenth of august yesterday the students spent a whole evening with us yes it was on the evening when the milenki was taken sick milenki talked with them the whole evening long why did he spend so much time with them and so little with me he is not working all the time he himself says that he is not working all the time that without rest it is impossible to work that he takes a great deal of rest that he thinks about nothing else except taking a rest why does he think by himself and not with me turn over one leaf more july of the present year and every month of the present year and until milenki became sick then last year and before that too five days ago the students called on us and yesterday too i carried on with them it was so gay tomorrow or day after tomorrow they will call again and again it will be gay is that all that is all no read further again appears the hand touches the page and again from under the hand come new lines and again against her will vira pavlovna is reading them the beginning of the present year especially at the end of spring yes it used to be gay with these students but that was all but now i often think it was childish nonsense such nonsense will amuse me for a long time yet probably even when i have come to be an old woman when i myself will not be of the age for playing i shall delight in the youthful games which will remind me of my childhood for even now i look upon the students as younger brothers but i should not like to become a vierotchka always when i want to rest from serious thoughts and labors i am now vira pavlovna and to enjoy oneself like vierotchka is only agreeable at times but not always vira pavlovna sometimes wants such happiness that she might still remain vira pavlovna 
and this happiness comes only with one's equals in life turn back several pages more i have opened a sewing union and went to julie to ask for orders milenki stopped at her rooms to get me she kept us to breakfast and she ordered champagne and she forced me to drink two glasses we began to sing run shout wrestle how gay it was milenki looked on and laughed is that really all asked the visitor and again appears the hand and again from under the hand appear new words and again vira pavlovna reads against her will milenki only looked on and laughed why didn't he join in with us that would have made it still gayer was it that it was improper or didn't he care to have a part in our sport no it was not in the least improper and he might have done it but he has such a nature he not only does not interfere he also approves but that is all turn one page back i went with milenki for the first time since my marriage to see my parents it was hard to see the life that oppressed and stifled me before my marriage my milenki from what a horrible life he saved me and that night i had a horrible dream and my mamenka reproached me for being ungrateful and she spoke the truth but such fearful truth that i began to groan milenki heard my groan and came into my room and i was singing all the time in my dream because my loving bride came and consoled me the milenki wanted to act as my dressing-maid how ashamed i was but he is such a modest man he only kissed my shoulder is that all that is written you cannot deceive me read and again from under the visitor's hand appear the new words and vira pavlovna reads them against her will this seems to me rather insulting turn several pages back to-day i was waiting for my friend d on the boulevard near the new bridge there lives a lady at whose house i expected to be a governess but she was not willing to take me i returned home with d very despondent i was thinking in my room before dinner that it would be better to die than to live as i am living now and suddenly at dinner d says vira pavlovna let us drink to the health of my bride and your bridegroom i could hardly refrain from tears in the presence of all from joy at such an unexpected salvation after dinner i talked a long time with d about how we should live how i love him he is leading me out from the cellar read it all there is nothing more to read look again from under the visitor's hand appear new lines i do not want to read says vira pavlovna in fear she has not yet distinguished what is written in those new lines but already it is horrible to her you cannot help reading when i bid you to read read vira pavlovna reads do i only love him because he led me out from the cellar not himself but my salvation from the cellar just turn back once more and read the very first page it is my birthday to-day to-day i spoke for the first time with d and fell in love with him i never before heard such noble and consoling words from any one how he sympathizes with everything that demands sympathy wants to help everything that needs help how sure he is that happiness is possible for all people that it must be and that anger and woe are not forever that a new and bright life is rapidly approaching us how joyfully my heart expanded when i heard these assurances from this learned and serious man for they confirmed my own thoughts how kind he was when he spoke about us poor women every woman would love such a man how clever he is how generous how kind good turn again to the last page but i have read that page no that is not the last one yet turn one leaf more but there is nothing on this leaf just read you see how much is written on it and again from the touch of the visitor's hand appear lines which were not there before vira pavlovna's heart grows cold i do not want to read i cannot read i command you you must i cannot i will not then i will read for you what is written just listen he is a noble man a generous man he is my saviour but generosity gives rise to respect confidence and readiness to act in unanimity friendship a saviour is requited by gratefulness by devotion that is all his nature may be as quicker than mine when the blood is boiling his caresses burn into the heart but there is another demand a demand for quiet calm caresses a demand for sweet dreams and a tender sentiment does he know it do our natures agree our demands 
He is ready to die for my sake and I for his. But is that enough? Does he live in his thoughts for me? Do I live in my thoughts for him? Do I love him with such a love as my soul craves? Before I did not realize the demand for a quiet, tender feeling. No, my feeling for him is not... I do not want to listen any more. Vera Pavlovna throws away the diary with indignation. You wretch! You abomination! I never asked you to come. Leave me! Her visitor is laughing with a still good-humored laugh. No, you don't love him. These words were written with your own hand. I curse you! Vera Pavlovna wakes up with this exclamation, and quicker than she could make out that it was only a dream that she had seen, and that she had waked up, she starts to run. My dear, take me in your arms. Protect me. I dreamed such a terrible dream. She snuggled up to her husband. My dear, caress me. Be tender to me. Protect me. Vierotchka, what is the matter with thee? The husband embraces her. Thou art all of a tremble. Her husband kisses her. Thou hast tears on thy dear cheeks. There is a cold sweat on thy brow. Thou wert running barefooted over the cold floor, darling. I am kissing thy little feet to put some warmth into them yes fondle me save me i dreamed a horrible dream i dreamed that i did not love thee my dearest whom dost thou love if not me no it is an idle absurd dream yes i love thee only caress me fondle me kiss me i love thee i want to love thee she embraces her husband passionately she clings to him and when he has pacified her with his caresses quietly falls asleep kissing him End of part three, chapter nineteen, recording by expatriate in Bangor, Maine. Part three, chapter twenty of A Vital Question, or What is to be Done by Nikolai Chernyshevsky, translated by Nathan Haskell Dole, eighteen fifty two to nineteen thirty five, and others. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Expatriate in Bangor, Maine. Part three Marriage and Second Love. Chapter twenty. The next morning, Dmitri does not go to call his wife to breakfast. She is there with him, clinging to him. She is still asleep, and he is looking at her and thinking, What can be the matter with her? What frightened her so? What caused that dream? Stay here, Vierotchka. I will bring thee thy tea here. Don't get up, my dear little girl i will bring it to you and you can wash your face and not get up no i will not get up i will lie a while it is so comfortable for me here how smart you are milenki and how i love thee and now i have washed my face and now thou canst bring the tea here no first take me into thy arms and vera pavlovna long holds her husband in her embrace ach my milenki how absurd i was how did i happen to come running to your room what will masha think now i shall hear from her how i woke up in your room kiss me my milenki kiss me i want to love thee i must love thee i am going to love thee as i never loved thee before vera pavlovna's room is empty now vera pavlovna without any concealment from masha has moved to her husband's apartment how tender he is how kind my milenki and i could imagine that i did not love thee how absurd i am vierotchka now that you are calmed down tell me what you dreamed day before yesterday ach what nonsense i only dreamed as i told you that you caressed me very little but now it is good why didn't we always live this way then i should not have dreamed that horrible dream it was dreadful disgusting i don't like to think about it yes but if it had not been for it we should not be living as we do now that is true i am very grateful to her to that disgusting no not disgusting i mean splendid woman whom do you mean by she have you found some new friend beside your former beauty yes i have some woman or other called on me with such a fascinating voice much finer than bosio's and what lovely hands she had ach what wonderful beauty but all that i could see of her was her hand she herself was hidden behind the bed curtain i dreamed it at my bedside and that was the reason i gave up that bed because i had such a dream in it there was a bed curtain and that my visitor hid herself behind it but what a wonderful hand she had my dear and she sang about love and she revealed to me what the meaning of love was now i understand my dear 
what a stupid little thing i was because i did not understand i was a mere girl a foolish little girl my dear my angel everything has its time the way we lived before was love and the way that we live now is love some people must have one kind of love others another hitherto the one kind of love satisfied you now you need another now you are a woman my dear and what you did not want then you must have now a week or two pass vira pavlovna makes herself comfortable she is in her own room now only when her husband is not at home or when he is working or rather when he is working she often sits in his library when she sees that she disturbs him that his work requires his full attention then she does not interrupt him but such work does not often come along for the most part it is scientific work which is entirely mechanical and accordingly three-fourths of the time he has his wife by his side and at times they caress each other but one contrivance was necessary they had to buy another sofa a little smaller than the husband's and so vira pavlovna after dinner ensconces herself in her little sofa and her husband sits by her little sofa and takes delight in looking at her my dear why do you kiss my hand you know i don't like it oh i forgot that you considered it an affront well i am going to keep on just the same my milenki you are saving me the second time you saved me from bad people and you have saved me from myself caress me my dear caress me a month passes vira pavlovna after dinner ensconces herself comfortably on her wide little soft sofa in her room and her husband's that is in her husband's library he sat down on her little sofa and she threw her arms around his neck she bent her head to his bosom but she is lost in thought he kisses her but her melancholy does not pass away and her eyes are almost ready to shed tears Virochka, my dear what makes you so pensive vira pavlovna weeps but she says nothing no she wipes away her tears no don't caress me dear that's enough thank thee and she looks so affectionately and frankly at him thank thee thou art so kind to me kind Virochka. what is it what do you mean yes kind my dear thou art kind two days passed vira pavlovna again ensconces herself comfortably after dinner no she is not comfortable but she is lying and thinking and she is lying in her own room on her own bed her husband is sitting near her with his arm around her and he also is lost in thought no it is not this it is not my fault thinks lopukhov how kind he is how ungrateful i am thinks vira pavlovna and that is what they think she says my dear go to your room and work or else take a rest and she tries to say and succeeds in saying these words in a natural and not melancholy tone why do you drive me away Virochka? it is pleasant for me here and he tries to say these words and he succeeds in saying these words in a natural and jocular tone no go away my dear you have done enough for me go and get rested he kisses her and she forgets her thoughts and again it is sweet and easy for her to breathe thank you dear she says and kirsanov is perfectly happy the struggle has been pretty hard this time but how much inward satisfaction it afforded him and this satisfaction will never pass away though the struggle will soon be over but it will warm his heart for a long day till the end of his life he is honourable yes he has harmonised them yes in reality he has brought them into harmony kirsanov is lying on his sofa he is smoking and thinking be honest that means be prudent don't make any miscalculation remember the axiom remember that the whole is greater than any of its parts that is that your human nature is stronger is more important for you than every other individual tendency and therefore treasure its benefits above those which may come from any separate tendency of thine if they prove to be any way inconsistent with the whole and that's all and that means be honest and all will be well one rule and how commonplace it is and that is the whole result of science and that completely fills the volume of the laws of a happy life yes happy are those who are born with the capability of understanding this simple rule in this respect i am very fortunate of course i am very much indebted to training more probably than to nature but gradually it will develop into a general rule which will be the result of the universal training and circumstances of life yes then it will be easy for everybody to live in this world 
just as it is for me now yes i am satisfied yet i must go and call on them i have not been there for three weeks it's time even though it may be unpleasant for me i am not drawn there any more at all but it's time some of these days i will stop in there for half an hour or would it not be better to postpone it for a month it seems to me that i can yes my retreat has been well managed my manoeuvres are at an end i have passed from their sight and now they will not notice whether it's three weeks or three months since i have been to call on them and it is agreeable to think when you are away about people towards whom you have acted uprightly now i shall rest on my laurels and lopukhov in two or three days later still also after dinner comes into vierotchka's room takes his wife in his arms and carries her to her ottoman in his room rest here dear and he takes delight in looking at her she fell asleep smiling he is sitting and reading and she opened her eyes and thinks how his room is decorated there is nothing in it except what is absolutely necessary yet he has his own tastes there's a big box of cigars which i gave him last year he has not opened it yet it's waiting its time his own only luxury cigars no he has no other the photograph of that old man what a splendid face that old man has what a mixture of kindness and vigilance in his eyes and in the whole expression of his face what trouble dmitri took to get this photograph for owen's photographs are not to be had he wrote three letters two of his letters did not reach the old man the third one reached him and how long he tormented him before he succeeded in getting this really superb photograph and how happy dmitri was when he got it together with a letter from the saintly old man as he calls him in which owen as he says praised him and here is still another luxury my portrait half a year he laid up money for the sake of getting a good artist and how he and the young artist bothered me two pictures and that's all would it cost much to buy a few engravings and photographs just as i have in my room and he has no flowers while well, i have quantities in my room why shouldn't he like flowers as well as i do is it because i'm a woman what nonsense or is it because he's a serious and scientific man but kirsdnof has flowers and engravings and he too is a serious scientific man and why does he hate to give up his time to me i know that it costs him a real effort is it because he's a serious scientific man but here's kirsdnof no no he's kind kind he has done everything for me he is always ready to do anything to gratify me who can love me as he does and i love him and i am ready for anything for his sake Birochka, you are not sleeping dear my milenki why haven't you any flowers in your room very well dearest i will get some to-morrow it simply did not occur to me that it was a good thing but it is very nice and what was it that i wanted to ask you about besides oh yes do get some photographs or rather i am going to buy you some flowers and photographs then they will surely be agreeable to me i like them for themselves but then they will be still more delightful to me but vierotchka you are getting blue again you have been thinking about your dream will you allow me to ask you to tell me something more about the dream that frightened you so much my dear i have not been thinking about it at all it is so painful for me to think about it but vierotchka maybe it would be well for me to know about it very well my dearest i dreamed that i was bored because i had not gone to the opera and i was thinking about bosio some woman seemed to call on me and at first i thought it was bosio but she kept hiding from me she compelled me to read my diary and there was nothing in it except how we loved each other but when she touched her hand to the page new words seemed to be which said that i did not love you forgive me dearie for asking one thing more was that all that you saw in your dream my dearest if that had not been all wouldn't i have told thee so and i have already told thee all this was said so tenderly so sincerely so simply that lopukhov felt in his heart a wave of warmth and sweetness such as one who has once experienced this joy will never forget till his dying day oh how pitiful that only a few a very few husbands can have this feeling all the pleasures of happy love are nothing in comparison with it it fills the human heart with the purest content the holiest pride in vira pavlovna's words which were spoken with a shade of melancholy rang a reproach but the significance of the reproach was this my dear don't you know that i have perfect confidence in you a wife may hide from her husband the mysterious motions of her soul such are those very relations in which they stand to each other but you my dear have so behaved 
that there has never been any need of hiding things from you that my heart is open before you as before my own eyes this is a great merit in a husband this great reward is purchased only by a high moral worth and whoever has deserved it has a right to look upon himself as a man of unquestionable nobility he may boldly hope that his conscience is pure and will always remain pure that his manhood will never play him false that in all trials of every sort he will remain calm and firm that fate is not reigning over the peace of his soul that from the time that he has deserved this great honour to the very last moment of his life disregarding whatever shocks to which he may be subjected he will be happy in the consciousness of his worthy manhood now we know enough of lopukhov to see that he was not a sentimental man but he was so touched by these words of his wife that his face burned vierotchka my dearest you have reproached me his voice for the second and last time in his life trembled the first time that his voice trembled it was from doubt arising from conjecturing his position now it trembled from pleasure you have reproached me but this reproach is dearer to me than all the words of love i offended you with my question but how happy i am that my bad question gave me brought me such a reproach look there are tears in my eyes the first tears that i have shed since i was a boy the whole evening long he scarcely took his eyes from her and she never once thought that he was making an effort to appear tender to her and this evening was one of the happiest of her life at least up to the present time several years after the time of which i am now telling you about her she will have a good many such days months years this will be when her children shall have grown up and she will find in them people worthy of happiness and pleasures whatever may appear in any other personal pleasure is a rare and transitory loftiness with her it is an ordinary everyday level of happiness but this is in the future which will come to her end of part three chapter twenty recording by expatria in bangor maine part three chapter twenty one of a vital question or what is to be done by nikolai chernyshevsky translated by nathan haskell dole eighteen fifty two to nineteen thirty five and others this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by expatriate in bangor maine part three chapter twenty one but after his wife had gone to sleep sitting on his knees after he laid her down on her little sofa lopukhov began to think seriously about her dream it was not his affair whether she loved him or not that was her concern over which he had no control and over which as he himself plainly saw he had no control this will settle itself there is no need of thinking about it to-day let time tell but now there is no time for it it is now his business to find out what is the cause of her foreboding that she does not love him for the first time he sat a long while in these thoughts already for the last few days he has seen that he is not retaining her love for him a great loss but what could be done about it if he could exchange his nature acquire a tendency towards that gentle fondness which her nature demanded then of course it would be a different thing but he saw that such an attempt would be in vain if the inclination is not given by nature and if it is not developed by life independently of the man himself this man cannot create it in himself by force of will and without this tendency nothing can be done as it ought to be done consequently the question about him was already decided his former thoughts had been spent in this very direction but now that he had finished his own side of the case like an egotist who always thinks first about himself and about others only when there is none of his own business left to think about he was able to think for someone else that is to think about her what can he do for her she does not yet understand what is going on in her she has not had such experience of her heart as he has well that's natural he is four years older than she is at the beginning of youth four years is a long time can't he who is more experienced analyze what she is unable to analyze how then to interpret her dream a supposition quickly presented itself to lopukhov the cause of her thoughts may be found in the circumstance which gave rise to her dream in the motive to her dream may lie the connection with its tenor she said that she felt bored because she did not go to the opera 
Lopukhov began to examine his way and her way of living, and gradually everything appeared before him in its true light. The larger part of the time, not occupied by her duties, she used to spend, as he did, in solitude. Then a change began. She began to be always ready for amusement. Now once more their old way had been re-established. She cannot accept indifferently this renewal of their old mode of life. It was not in her nature, just as it would not be in the nature of the great majority of people. There is nothing mysterious about it and from this it was a very short step to the supposition that the explanation of everything was her close relationship to kirsdnof and then kirsdnof's estrangement why does kirsdnof stay away the reason seems sufficient in itself his lack of time and multiplicity of occupations but an honest and intellectual man who has had experience in life and who is particularly able to put in practice the theory of which lopukhov was an advocate it is impossible to deceive by any tricks or cunningness he may be deceived through lack of attention he may not pay any attention to the fact itself thus lopukhov was deceived the first time when kirsdnof deserted them at that time to tell the plain truth there was no reason and consequently no desire energetically to investigate the reason why kirsdnof became estranged the only important thing for him was to see whether he were not the cause for the severance of the friendship it was plain that he was not and so there was no cause for thinking of anything else he was not kirsdnof's uncle and not his pedagogue bound to lead in the paths of virtue the steps of a man who understands things as clearly as he does yes and what necessity is there in reality for him to do so was there in his relations with kirsdnof anything particularly important for him as long as you are friendly and you want me to like you i am very willing no on the contrary i am very sorry but go wherever you please isn't it all the same to me whether there is one stupid fellow more or less in the world makes no difference to me i took the stupid fellow to be a fine man i am sorry and that's all if our interests are not connected with the actions of a person his actions in reality interest us but little if we are serious people except in two cases which however seem exceptions to the general rule only for those people who are accustomed to understand the word interest in the too narrow sense of every day's interpretation the first case is where these actions are interesting for us from a theoretical standpoint as psychological phenomena explaining the nature of a person that is if they have in them an intellectual interest the other case is where the fate of a person depends upon us here we should be to blame in our own eyes for inattention to his actions that is if we take a conscientious interest in them but in those former stupid actions of kirsdnof there was nothing that would not be known to lopukhov as a very ordinary peculiarity among people of the present day there was nothing rare in a person having gentlemanly instincts giving himself over to triviality resulting from the present state of things and that lopukhov was destined to play an important part in kirsdnof's fate was beyond lopukhov's power of imagination why should kirsdnof be in need of his interference consequently go ahead my friend go wherever you please without regarding me what need have i of troubling about you but now it is different kirsdnof's actions suddenly seem to have an important bearing on the interests of a woman whom lopukhov loved he could not refrain from thinking carefully about them but to think carefully about a fact and understand its causes is almost one and the same thing for a person of such a turn of mind as lopukhov lopukhov found that his theory affords unerring means for analyzing the motions of the human heart and i confess i agree with him in this respect in those long years since i have accepted it as true it has never once led me into error and has never refused to reveal the truth to me no matter how deep the truth in regard to some human action might have been hidden it is also true that the theory itself is not easily acquired it is necessary to have lived and thought to be able to understand it half an hour's thinking was sufficient for lopukhov to understand the relations of kirsdnof to vira pavlovna but still he sat long thinking about the same thing further explanation was needless but it was interesting the discovery was made with complete fullness of details but it was so interesting that long he refrained from going to sleep however what is the good of straining your nerves with sleeplessness 
it is already three o'clock if i can't fall asleep i shall have to take morphine he took two pills i will just look at vierotchka once more but instead of walking over to her and looking at her he removed his chair over to her sofa took her hand and kissed it milenki you have been working too hard and all for my sake how kind you are and how i love you said she half asleep no shipwreck of the spirit can resist morphine in sufficient quantity at this time two pills prove to be enough he is overcome by sleep consequently the shipwreck of the soul by itself is approximately equal according to lopukhov's materialistic views to four glasses of strong coffee to overcome which one pill would not have been enough in lopukhov's case but three pills would have been too much he fell asleep laughing at this comparison end of part three chapter twenty one recording by expatriate in bangor maine part three chapter twenty two of a vital question or what is to be done by nikolai chernyshevsky translated by nathan haskell dole eighteen fifty two to nineteen thirty five and others this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by expatriate in bangor maine part three marriage and second love chapter twenty two a theoretical conversation on the following day kirsdnof had just thrown himself down like a sybarite with a cigar intending to read and rest after his late dinner upon returning from the hospital when lopukhov came in a guest at the wrong time is worse than a tartar said lopukhov in a jocular tone but his tone proved not to be very successfully jocular i disturb you alexander but even if it is so you must put up with it i want to speak with you seriously i meant to have come earlier but i overslept this morning and i should not have found you lopukhov was now speaking without joking what does it mean has he really suspected wondered kirsdnof let us have a little talk continued lopukhov seating himself look me in the eye yes he is going to speak about it there is no doubt about it listen dmitri said kirsdnof in a tone still more serious you and i are friends but there are things which even friends must not allow themselves i beg of you to cease this conversation i am not inclined now to serious conversations and i am never ready for it kirsdnof's eyes looked keenly and angrily as though a man were before him whom he suspected of committing a murder it is impossible not to speak alexander continued lopukhov in a calm but rather dull voice i have understood your manoeuvres silence i forbid you to speak unless you want me to be your enemy forever if you don't want to lose my respect some time ago you were not afraid of losing my respect do you remember now i understand all i did not understand it then dmitri i beg of you to leave the room or i shall you cannot leave what do you suppose that i do not have your interests at heart kirsdnof did not reply my situation is a good one yours judging by your words is not i appear to you in the guise of a man doing a noble deed but that's nonsense i cannot act otherwise according to common sense i beg of you alexander to cease your manoeuvres they will lead to nothing how was it really too late forgive me cried kirsdnof impetuously and he could not decide whether it was joy or grief excited in him by the words they will lead to nothing no you have not understood me it was not too late so far there has been no harm done we shall see whether there will be but now there is nothing to be seen however alexander i do not understand what you are speaking about neither do you understand what i mean we do not understand each other isn't that so there is not any need of our understanding each other is there these are little enigmas which you do not understand they are unpleasant there was nothing of the sort i have not said anything i have nothing to say to you give me a cigar i forgot mine i'm forgetful i'm going to smoke and have a talk with you about scientific questions that was all that i came for i wanted to spend a little time in scientific talk as i had nothing else to do what do you think about these strange experiments on the mechanical production of albumen lopukhov moved from one chair to another so as to have a comfortable place for his feet he got into an easy position and while he smoked his cigar he continued what he had to say according to my view it is a great discovery have you repeated the experiments no but i shall have to 
How fortunate you are to have such a splendid laboratory at your disposal. I beg of you, try them for yourself, try them more carefully. A complete revolution of the whole question of food and of all human life, the artificial production of the principal element of nutrition directly from inorganic matter. It is a most extraordinary thing. It is equal to Newton's discovery. Don't you think so? Certainly. Only I greatly doubt the accuracy of the experiments sooner or later we shall reach this without doubt science is going on in that direction that is evident but now we have hardly come to it do you think so i think so myself then our conversation is ended good-bye alexander but while i say good-bye i will ask you to call on us often just as you used to do good-bye kirsdnof's eyes which all the time had been looking fiercely and steadily at lopukhov flashed with indignation it seems to me dmitri that you want me to get the opinion that you have low thoughts i don't want anything of the sort but you must come to see us there is nothing strange in that is there you and i are friends what is there strange in my request i cannot you are beginning a foolish piece of work and therefore wretched i do not understand what you mean and i must tell you that what you say does not please me at all just as two minutes ago what i said did not please you i demand an explanation dmitri there's none to give there is nothing and there is nothing to explain and there is nothing to understand you are getting excited over mere nothing no i cannot let you go so kirsdnof took lopukhov by the arm as he started to leave sit down you began to speak when it was not necessary you don't realize what you ask of me you must hear me now to the end lopukhov sat down what right have you kirsdnof began in a voice of greater indignation than before what right have you to ask of me what is hard for me is there anything that i owe you what does this mean it's absurd try to clear your brain of romantic nonsense whatever you and i regard as a normal life will come to be so only after the ideas of general society have entirely changed there must be absolute reorganization that is true it will be reorganized according as life is developed whoever gets the new training helps others that is true but until this new education is accomplished as long as things are not completely changed you have no right to risk the happiness of another this is a horrible thing do you understand it or have you lost your senses no i do not understand anything at all alexander i do not know what you are talking about you are pleased to see a wonderful design in the simple request of a friend not to forget him because he likes to see you at his house i don't understand why you need to get excited about it no dmitri in such talk you will not get rid of me with a jest i must show you that you are crazy in thinking about such a miserable piece of work there are a good many things that you and i don't acknowledge aren't there we don't acknowledge that a box on the ear carries with it something dishonourable it is a stupid prejudice a harmful prejudice and nothing more but have you the right now to subject a man to the risk of getting a boxing that would be on your part a mean low abomination for you would have taken away from a man the peace of his life do you understand what i mean stupid you understand that if i love this person and you ask me to give him a box in the ear which according to my ideas and yours is a trifle do you understand that if you asked me to do this i should consider you a fool and a low fellow and if you compelled me to do it i should kill either you or myself according to whose life were the less desirable i would kill either you or myself but i would not do this you understand this you stupid fellow i am speaking about a man and a slap which is a trifle but which takes away the peace of life from a man besides men there are in this world women who are also human beings besides slaps there are other kinds of trifles which according to your idea and mine and which are really trifles but which also deprive people of the peace of life do you understand that to subject any person even though it be a woman to any such thing which according to your opinion and mine and in reality are trifles well to do any such thing it does not matter what do you understand that to subject any one to such a thing is mean contemptible dishonest do you hear me i say that you have dishonourable thoughts my friend you speak the exact truth about what is honourable and dishonourable only i do not know what you are saying these things for and i do not understand what relation it may have to me i have not told you anything at all nor have i said anything about any intention of risking the peace of life of anybody in the world nothing of the kind you are indulging in fancies and that's all there is of it 
I ask of you, my friend, not to forget me, because it is agreeable to me as your friend to spend time with you, and that's all. Will you fulfill your friend's request? It is dishonorable, I told you, and I don't act dishonorably. It is very praiseworthy of you that you don't, but you got angry over some fancy or other, and you dashed off into theory. You apparently wanted to theorize without any reason, without any applicability to what we were talking about. Now I also am going to theorize, also absolutely without any direct intention, I will ask you a question that has no relation whatever to anything except the explanation of an abstract truth without any application to anyone in particular. If anyone without any distaste to himself can afford to give another pleasure, then common sense, according to my view, demands that he give it to him, because he himself will get pleasure from it. Isn't that so? That's nonsense, Dmitri. You are off the point. I am not saying anything, Alexander. I am only indulging myself in theoretical speculations. Here is still another. If any desire whatsoever is awakened for anything, does our attempt to stifle this desire ever lead to anything good? Is not that so? No, such an attempt would lead to no good. It leads only to the necessity increasing threefold. It becomes injurious or takes a false direction. It is both harmful and miserable, or if the desire is stifled also, life is stifled. That is pitiful. That is not the point, Dmitri. I am going to put your theoretical problem in another form. Has anybody a right to subject a person to a risk if that person's life is happy without that risk? There will come a time when all the demands of every man's nature will be fully satisfied. That you and I know. But we both know equally well that this time has not yet come. Now a reasonable man is satisfied if he has enough to live upon, even though parts of his nature are not satisfied with the position in which he is satisfied to live. I shall suppose, by the way of abstract hypothesis, that such a fortunate man is in existence. I shall suppose that this person is a woman. I shall suppose again, in the way of an abstract hypothesis, that the position in which she is satisfied to live is married life. I will suppose that she is satisfied with her position, and I say, given such facts according to this abstract hypothesis, who has a right to run the risk of destroying what is good, what she is satisfied with, in order to try to give this person something better, which she can easily manage to get along without. There will be a golden age. We know that it is coming, but it is far in the future. The age of iron is almost gone, but the golden age has not yet made its appearance. If, according to my abstract hypothesis, some strong demand of this person, let us suppose, since it is only for an example, let us suppose love, the necessity of love were not entirely satisfied or were ill-satisfied, I would not say anything against the danger run by the person, but only against such danger itself, and not against the danger brought upon him by somebody else. And if this person finds perfect satisfaction, after all, for his demand, then he himself must not run the risk. Now, I will say abstractly that he does not want to run the risk, and I will say further he is right and sensible because he does not want to run the risk. And I say mean and contemptible is the man who would subject to the risk the one who does not want to run the risk. What can you say against this hypothetical result? Nothing. Understand, then, that you have no right. If I had been in your place, Alexander, I should have answered in the same way. I, like you, am speaking only in parables. I will imagine that you have a personal interest in this question. I know, of course, that it does not concern any one of us. We are speaking only as scientific men about certain interesting sides of universal scientific principles, which seem to us right. According to these views, everybody judges about every case from his own standpoint, which is formed by his individual relations to the thing. I only say in this sense of the word that if I were in your place, I should have spoken as you have, and you in my place would have said exactly what I have said. From the general scientific standpoint, this is an undisputable truth. A in B's place is B. If A were not B when in B's place, then he would not be in B's place. He would somehow fail to be in B's place. Isn't it so? Consequently, you have nothing to say against this, just as I had nothing to say against what you said. But according to your example, I will establish my hypothesis, which is also abstract and which also has no application to anybody. Let us suppose that there are three people in existence, a supposition which contains nothing impossible. Let us suppose that one of them has a secret 
which he would like to keep from the second and particularly from the third let us suppose that the second finds out the secret of the third and says to him do as i tell you else i shall expose your secret to the third what do you think about this matter kirsdnof grew rather pale and for a long time twisted his moustache dmitri you behave shamefully towards me he said at last have i any special necessity upon me to act well toward you what interest do i take in you and besides i do not understand what you are talking about you and i have been speaking as two scientific men speak among themselves we offered each other various scientific hypotheses at last i succeeded in offering one which brought you to terms and my scientific self-respect is satisfied and therefore i shall cease this theoretical conversation i have a great deal of work to do not less than you have and so good-bye by the way i had almost forgotten alexander will you fulfil my request to come and see us we are good friends you know and we shall be always glad to see you come just as you used to these last few months lopukhov got up kirsdnof was sitting looking at his fingers as though each one were an abstract hypothesis you are acting cruelly towards me dmitri i cannot help fulfilling your request but in my turn i shall impose one condition i will come to see you but if i leave your house not by myself you must also go everywhere that i go and i must have no necessity of asking you do you hear you yourself of your own free will without my asking you without you i shall not take a step not to the opera not to call on friends or go anywhere oughtn't that condition to be offensive to me alexander do you think i look upon you as a thief i didn't speak in that sense of the word i would not bring such an affront upon you as to think that you could take me for a thief i would give my life into your hands without any hesitation i hope i have a right to expect this from you also but what i mean is for me to know you do what i say and that's all now i too know yes you have done a great deal in this respect you want now to guard against this even more solicitously well in this respect you are in the right yes you have a right to compel me but no matter how thankful i am to you my friend this will amount to nothing i myself try to compel myself i too have a will as well as you and my scheme has been as clever as yours but whatever is done through calculation through a feeling of duty by strength of will and not by the drawing of nature results lifelessly only to kill a thing is possible through these means just as you have been doing with yourself but to make a living thing is impossible lopukhov had become sentimental over kirsdnof's words what i mean is for me to know thank you my friend and since we have never kissed each other maybe we have a desire to now if lopukhov had examined his actions during this conversation as a theorist he would have noticed with satisfaction how true the theory is egotism makes sport of men now here is the most important thing he entirely suppressed let us suppose that this person is satisfied with his situation now when that was said he ought to have replied alexander your supposition is not true but i held my peace because it was not to my advantage to say it it is pleasant for a man as a theorist to notice what tricks his egotism plays with him in practical life you are retreating from the battle because the battle is lost for you but egotism turns your gestures so that you are playing the man who is doing noble actions had kirsdnof examined his actions during this conversation as a theorist he would have noticed with pleasure how true this theory is i wanted to preserve my own peace to rest upon my laurels and here i was saying you have no right to risk a woman's peace of mind and this means be sure you yourself understand it that i actually have done a noble action to my own detriment for the sake of another's peace and for your sake my friend and therefore fall on your knees before the grandeur of my soul it is pleasant for a man as a theorist to notice what tricks his egotism plays with him in practical life he had retreated from the battle so as not to be a fool and gained glory because he had accomplished a heroic action of magnanimous nobility you did not yield to the demand at the first word so that you might not be troubled again about yourself so that you might not be deprived of the sweet triumph in your nobility but egotism turns your actions so that you are playing the man who presses forward into noble endeavour but neither lopukhov nor kirsdnof had time to examine their actions as theorists or to make these pleasant observations and the practical solution of the question seemed to both pretty hard end of part three chapter twenty two
Recording by Expatriate in Bangor, Maine. Part three, chapter twenty three of A Vital Question or What is to be done by Nikolai Chernyshevsky. Translated by Nathan Haskell Dole, eighteen fifty two to nineteen thirty five, and others. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Expatriate in Bangor, Maine. Part three Marriage and Second Love, chapter twenty three the renewal of kirsanov's frequent visits could be explained very naturally five months he had been interrupted in his occupations and he had accumulated a great deal of work and so it took him a month and a half to sit down at it not straightening his back now he had finished his neglected work and he was more at liberty in the use of his time this was so clear that there was hardly any need of explaining it in fact it was plain and all right and did not arouse any suspicion in vira pavlovna's mind and on the other hand kirsdnof played his part with the same undoubted artistic skill as before he was afraid that when he called at the lopukhovs after his scientific conversation with his friend he would lose his grip he would either blush from excitement at seeing vira pavlovna for the first time or would very noticeably avoid looking at her or do something of the kind but no he stood firm and he had full right to feel satisfied from the moment that he met her a pleasant friendly smile such as is natural in a person who is glad to get back among old friends from whom he had been obliged to be absent for some time a calm glance a frank and unconcerned flow of speech such as is natural to a person who has no other thoughts in his mind beyond those he fearlessly speaks if you had been the most ill-tempered gossiping old woman on the lookout to find something out of the way you could not have found in him anything except a man who seems very glad that he can pleasantly kill a leisure evening in the society of his good friends and if the first moment was so well accomplished what prevented him from spending the rest of the evening just as well and if he succeeded in spending the first evening so well then was it hard for him to spend the evenings to come in the same way not a single word which was not free and natural not one look which was not hearty and simple straightforward and friendly and that was all there was of it but if he behaved himself no worse than of old yet the eyes which were bent upon him were inclined to notice every action which no other eyes would have perceived yes no other eyes would have seen anything lopukhov himself whom marya alexeyevna acknowledged to be born for a monopolist was surprised at the self-possession which did not for one moment desert kirsdnof and as a theorist he derived great pleasure from such observations contrary to the will of those who interested him by the psychological peculiarity of this phenomenon viewed from a scientific standpoint but the visitor did not prophesy in vain when she compelled vira pavlovna to read her diary eyes become too sharp when such a visitor whispers in your ear but even these eyes could see nothing but still the visitor whispered is it impossible to find something here even though there is nothing to be seen as i myself perceive but still we will try to see and the eyes tried to peer and though they saw nothing yet the very fact that the eyes tried to see was sufficient for them to observe that there was something peculiar here for instance vira pavlovna is going with her husband and kirsdnof to their regular weekly evening which happens to be at the Mertsalovs why doesn't kirsdnof waltz at this unceremonious party when even lopukhov waltzes because a general rule has been made if you are an old man of threescore years and ten and have found your way hither then you must play the fool together with the others for here nobody looks at anybody else everybody has one and the same idea about it the more noise the more stir the better and that is equivalent to saying the more enjoyment for all then why does not kirsdnof waltz well he has begun to waltz but why did it take him several minutes to make up his mind was it worth while to spend several minutes in thinking whether to begin or not to begin such a very important matter if he had not waltzed the thing would have been half revealed here if he had waltzed but had not waltzed with vira pavlovna the thing would have been completely revealed here but he was too clever an artist in his part he did not want to waltz with vira pavlovna but he soon perceived that this would be noticed and so after a short hesitation 
which apparently bore no relation to Vi^ra Pavlovna or anybody else in the world, he asked her to dance. There remained in her memory a slight, a very slight wonderment, which in itself she would not have noticed, notwithstanding the whisper of the visitor songstress, had not the visitor whispered a numberless quantity of just such little insignificant questions. Why, for instance, after they return from the Mertzelovs, when they make an appointment to go to the opera, I Puritani, on the next evening, and when Vi'ra Pavlovna says to her husband, Milenki, you don't like this opera, you will be bored. I will go with Alexander Matvyitch, for he likes all the operas, and I believe that if you or I had written an opera, he would like it. Why didn't Kirsdnof uphold Vi'ra Pavlovna's suggestion and say, really, Dmitri, I am not going to get a ticket for you? Why was this? The fact that Milenki goes along also, this by itself would not have aroused any wonderment, for he escorts his wife everywhere since she had once asked him to. Devote more time to me, she said. Since that time he had never forgotten it. Consequently, there is nothing strange in his going with her. It simply shows always one and the same thing, that he is kind and complacent and that she ought to love him. That is true. But Kirsdnof does not know this reason, and so why doesn't he support Vera Pavlovna in her suggestion? Of course, these trifles are almost unnoticeable, and Vera Pavlovna scarcely gives them a passing thought. But these unnoticeable little grains of sand keep falling on the pan of the scales, though they were almost invisible. For example, a conversation like the following is not a little grain of sand, but a small pebble. On the next day, as they were going to the opera in an Izvoshik's carriage, this was less expensive than two Izvoshik's, among other things they said several words about the Mertsolovs, where they had been the evening before. They praised their harmonious life. They remarked that this was a rare thing. They all said this, including Kirsdnof, who added, yes, this alone is a good thing in Mertsolov, that his wife dares tell him all the secrets of her soul. That was all that Kirsdnof said, and each one of the three thought of saying the same thing. But it happened that Kirsdnof alone said it. But why did he say it? What does it signify? If it contained an insinuation, what could it mean? It would be in praise of Lopukov. It would be in favor of Vera Pavlovna's happiness with Lopukov. Of course, this could have been said with reference to no one else except the Mertsolovs. And if it could be supposed that he thought of the Lopukovs together with the Mertsolovs, then of course it would show that it was directly for Vera Pavlovna. But what was his purpose in saying it? It always happens so that if a person has an inclination to look for something, he everywhere finds what he is looking for. Even let there be not the slightest sign of it, still he sees the sign manifestly. Let there be no shadow, but he not only finds the shadow of what he expects to find, but the whole substance of what he is looking for, with the most unmistakable features, and these features at every fresh thought become more clear. And here, besides everything else, there was really a very substantial fact which hid in itself a very complete solution of the matter. It is clear that Kirsdnof respects the Lopukovs, then why did he keep aloof from them for more than two years? It is clear that he is a thorough gentleman. How did it happen that he appeared before them in the character of a boor? As long as Vera Pavlovna was not called upon to think about this, she did not think about it any more than Lopukov had done, but now she thinks about it in spite of herself. End of part three, chapter twenty three. Recording by Expatriate in Bangor, Maine. Part three, chapter twenty four of A Vital Question, or What is to be Done by Nikolai Chernyshevsky. Translated by Nathan Haskell Dole. 1852 to 1935 and others this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by expatriate in bangor maine part three marriage and second love chapter twenty four slowly unobservably this discovery began to evolve itself in her mind all the time there accumulated small almost undistinguishable impressions made by Kirsdnof's words and actions, to which no one else would have given any heed, which she herself scarcely noticed, for they were only supposed and suspected. Slowly this question, why did he avoid them almost three years, began to interest her mind. Slowly the idea was confirmed that such a man could not have stayed away, 
from any petty grounds of self-conceit, because he is absolutely free from it. And moreover, not knowing why she thought of this, still more obscurely and slowly arose from the silent depths of her life into her consciousness the question, why am I thinking about him? What is he to me? And here, one time after dinner, Vera Pavlovna was sitting in her room, sewing and thinking, and she was thinking very calmly, and she was not thinking at all of him, but of something quite different, connected with her household, and about the shop, and about her teaching, and gradually, gradually, her thoughts were drawn to the matter concerning which, without being conscious of it, her thoughts were more and more often drawn. There came up recollections, little questions began to present themselves. They multiplied, and here they are in thousands, finding place in her thoughts, and still they grow and grow, and they go to form one question, the form of which becomes clearer and clearer. What has got into me? What am I thinking about? What am I feeling? And Vera Pavlovna's fingers forget to sew, and the sewing slips from her drooping hands, and Vera Pavlovna grew a shade paler, then she blushed. She grew still paler, then the fire touched her flushed cheeks. The next moment they were white as snow, and with wandering eyes she ran in to her husband, sat herself on his knees, tremblingly threw her arms around his neck, laid her hand on his shoulder so that it might support her head and hide her face, and with choking voice she said, My dear, I love him, and she began to weep. What of that, my dear? Why should you feel disturbed about it? I do not want to offend you, my dear. I want to love you. Try look here if you can it will be well be calm give time a chance and you will see what you can do and what you cannot do you are so dear to me how then can you offend me he smoothed her hair kissed her head pressed her hand she could not for a long time cease her convulsive weeping but gradually she became calm but he who had for a long time expected such a confession was therefore able to take it coolly however even yet she could not bear to look at his face i do not want to see him i shall tell him to cease coming to see us said vira pavlovna you must act my love in the way which you find will give you the greatest happiness and when you have become calmer we will talk the matter over for you and i no matter what may happen between us will always be friends won't we give me your hand press mine you see how warmly you press it every one of these phrases were spoken at long intervals and the intervals were filled by his smoothing her hair fondling her as a brother fondles a grieved sister do you remember my dear what you told me when we became engaged you are leading me into freedom again silence and caresses do you remember how you and i talked the first time about what it means to love a person it means to feel gladness at whatever is good for that person to feel pleasure in doing whatever may be to his advantage again silence and caresses whatever is for your best good gives me joy also but you must decide what is best for you why should you be grieved if it brings you no misfortune what misfortune can it bring me in these laconic words which were repeated a good many times with the ordinary insignificant variations of repetition passed considerable time which was equally trying for lopukhov and vera pavlovna but while gradually getting calmer vira pavlovna began at last to breathe more freely she embraced her husband tightly and she kept repeating i want to love thee my dear thee alone i want to love no one else besides thee he did not tell her that this was beyond her power it was necessary to let the time pass until her strength could be restored by calmness giving her some sort of decision no matter what Lopukhov succeeded in writing a note for Masha to give Kirsanov in case he should come. Alexander, don't come in just now, and don't come for some time. There is no particular reason, and there will be no particular reason. It is only necessary for her to rest. It is necessary for her to rest. There is no particular reason. A strange juxtaposition of contraries. Kirsanov read over the note and told Masha that he only came to get it and that he had no time now to stop in that he had another place to go to that he would stop on his way back after he had done the errand which the note demanded the evening passed peacefully according to all appearances half the time vira pavlovna sat quietly by herself in her room without letting her husband stay the other half of the time he sat near her trying to calm her with the same laconic words 
and of course not so much by his words as by his voice which was steady and reassuring of course not with god knows what happiness and of course also not melancholy except that there was an undertone of melancholy in it which was shown in his face vira pavlovna after hearing such sounds and looking at such an expression of face began to think not absolutely but to a degree so not to a degree but almost absolutely that her fears had been overestimated that she had mistaken for a great passion a mere imagination which would vanish in a few days without leaving any trace or she thought she did not think it only she felt that it was not so no this is not so no it is so or she firmly thinks that she thinks so and she really thinks that it is so and how can she help thinking so while she listens to this calm steady voice which keeps repeating that there is nothing to be worried about peacefully she fell asleep under the influence of this voice she slept soundly and she did not dream of the visitor and she woke up late and after she woke up she felt renewed strength end of part three chapter twenty four recording by expatriate in bangor maine part three chapter twenty five of a vital question or what is to be done by nikolai chernyshevsky translated by nathan haskell dole eighteen fifty two to nineteen thirty five and others this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by expatriate in bangor maine part three marriage and second love chapter twenty five the best distraction for thoughts is work said vira pavlovna to herself and she was entirely right i shall spend every day in the shop until i am cured and this will help me she began to spend the whole day in the shop the first day she really succeeded in greatly distracting her thoughts the second day she only tired herself out but she could not entirely escape from them on the third she could not get rid of them at all thus passed a week the struggle was hard vira pavlovna's face grew pale but by outward appearances she was entirely calm she even tried to seem happy and in this respect she succeeded almost without interruption but if no one could notice anything and her paleness were ascribed to some slight ailment yet lopukhov was not deceived he knew perfectly well how it was he had no need to look yerochka he began at the end of a week as we are living now we carry out the old proverb that the cobbler has no boots and the tailor's clothes don't fit him we are teaching others to live according to our economical principles but we ourselves don't take it into our heads to arrange our own lives in accordance with them isn't one large household more advantageous than several small ones i should like to apply this law to our own housekeeping arrangements if we had lived with somebody we and those who lived with us would have saved almost half of our expenses i should be able to give up those execrable lessons which i detest so my salary from the factory would be enough and i should get time for relaxation i could occupy my time with scientific work and thus have taken up my career again it is only necessary to find people such as it would be agreeable to live with what do you think about this vira pavlovna had been looking at her husband with eyes full of suspicion and burning with indignation just as kirsdnof had looked at him on the day of their theoretical conversation after he stopped speaking her face was on fire i beg of you to cease this conversation it is not becoming why so vierotchka i am only speaking about pecuniary advantages such people as you and i who are not rich must not neglect them my work is hard and a part of it is even detestable to me you have no right to speak so to me vira pavlovna got up i shall not allow you to speak to me in dark words dare to speak freely what you mean i only want to tell you this vierotchka that taking into consideration our advantage it would be good for us again silence who gave you the right to be master over me i shall despise you she ran quickly to her own room and locked the door this was their first and their last quarrel till late that night vira pavlovna sat with her door locked then she returned to her husband's room my dear i spoke to you very severe words but do not be angry at them you see that i am doing my best instead of helping me you began to help along what i am struggling against hoping yes hoping to win the victory 
Forgive me, my love, for beginning so roughly, but now we are reconciled, aren't we? Let us talk reasonably. Oh, yes, we are reconciled, my dear. Only don't act against me. It is hard enough, even as it is, to struggle against myself. And it is useless, Vierotchka. You have had plenty of time to examine your feeling. You have seen that it is more serious than you believed at first. Why torment yourself? No, my dear, I want to love you, and I do not want to wrong you. My dear, you wish me to be happy. What? Do you think that it is pleasant for me to see you keep tormenting yourself? My dear, but you love me so. Of course I do, very dearly. There is no need of saying that. But we both understand what love means. Does it not consist in the fact that you are happy in the happiness, that you suffer with the suffering of the one whom you love? When you torment yourself, you torment me. So it is, my dear. But you will suffer if I yield to this feeling, which, ah, I cannot understand why it should have come to me. I curse it. It makes no difference how or why it came to you. You cannot help it. Now there is only one choice. Either you should suffer, and I suffer also through it, or that you cease to suffer, and I too. But, my dear, I am not going to suffer. This will pass away. You will see this pass thank you for your efforts i appreciate them because you show a will to fulfil what you deem your duty but you know vierotchka that it seems necessary only to you and not to me i am looking upon it as a stranger and your position is clearer to me than it is to yourself i know that this will be useless struggle as long as your strength holds out but don't think that you are going to wrong me for you know how i look upon this you know that my view of this matter cannot be shaken and is founded in the nature of things you know all this can you deceive me will you ever cease to respect me i can say further even if your disposition towards me changed its nature will it grow weaker isn't the contrary true would it not grow stronger from the very fact that you did not find in me an enemy don't pity me my fate will not be in the least pitiful because you will not be deprived of happiness on my account but that's enough it is hard to say much about it and for you to hear is harder still only remember vierotchka what i am saying now forgive me vierotchka go to your room and think it over or rather go to sleep don't think about me but think about yourself only by thinking about yourself you may not cause me useless sorrow end of part three chapter twenty five Recording by Expatriate in Bangor, Maine. Part 3, Chapter 26 of A Vital Question, or What is to be Done by Nikolai Chernyshevsky. Translated by Nathan Haskell Dole, 1852-1935, and others. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Expatriate in Bangor, Maine part three marriage and second love chapter twenty six at the end of two weeks while lopukhov was sitting in the counting-room of his factory vira pavlovna was spending the whole morning in extraordinary excitement she threw herself down on her bed she covered her face with her hands and at the end of a quarter of an hour she jumped up walked up and down the room threw herself into one chair after another and again walked with quick unsteady steps and then again threw herself on her bed and then walked again and several times she went to the writing desk and stood by it and turned away and finally she sat down wrote a few words sealed her note then in half an hour she seized the note tore it up burned it and again she walked about excitedly she wrote a second letter this also she tore up and burned again she walked up and down and again she wrote and hastily scarcely stopping to seal it not giving herself time to write the address she ran off with it to her husband's room threw it on the table and hurried back to her own room fell into a chair and sat motionless hiding her face in her hands half an hour possibly an hour there is the sound of the bell it is he she ran into the library to seize the letter to tear it up to burn it but where is it it is not there where is it she hastily looked over the papers where is it but masha is already opening the door and lopukhov saw from the threshold how vira pavlovna flashed out from his library into her own room excited and pale 
He did not follow her, but went straight into his library. Coolly, at his leisure, he examined the table and the space behind the table. Yes, he had been expecting for some days some such thing, either in the way of words or note. Nu, no, here it is, a letter without address, but her seal. Nu, no, she must have been looking for it, so as to destroy it, or she may have just thrown it down. No, she must have been looking for it. The papers are in disorder. But how could she find it? while in throwing it down she had been in such a flurry of excitement that in being thrown impetuously down like a coal burning the hand it slid across the whole width of the table and fell on the window behind the table there is hardly need of reading it the contents are what he expects however it is impossible not to read it my dear never was i so strongly attached to thee as i am now if i could only die for thy sake oh how happy i would be to die if it would only make thee happier but i cannot live without him i wrong thee my dear i am killing thee my dear i do not want to do so i am acting contrary to my will forgive me forgive me for a quarter of an hour maybe more lopukhov stood before the table looking attentively down at the arm of the chair though it was a shock foreseen still it was painful though he had thought it all over and decided what should be done and how it was necessary to act in case such a letter or confession came still he could not at once collect his thoughts but at last he collected them he went into the kitchen to give an order to masha masha you will please not set the table until i tell you i am not quite well and i must take some medicine before dinner but don't you wait eat your dinner and don't hurry you will have plenty of time before i shall want mine i will tell when from the kitchen he went to see his wife she was lying down hiding her face in the pillows when he entered she shuddered you found it you read it Bouge moi how crazy i am it is not true what i wrote it was fever of course my dear your words must not be taken seriously because you are too much excited these things are not so easily decided we shall have time to talk this matter over more than once calmly rationally because it is a very important matter for us and meanwhile my dear i want to tell you something about my affairs i have succeeded in making a good many changes in them everything that was needed and i am very well content are you listening of course she did not herself know whether she was listening or not she could only have said however it was whether she heard or not that she heard something but she was very far from understanding what she heard however something she did hear and something could be drawn from what she heard that something was being done about something and that it had no connection with her letter and gradually she began to listen because her mind was led to it her nerves wanted to occupy themselves with something not with the letter and though it was long before she could understand what he was driving at yet she was reassured by the cool and contented tone of her husband's voice and gradually she began to understand do listen because it is about a very important matter for me her husband kept repeating each question do you hear yes very pleasant changes for me and he begins to tell her the whole story in detail she realizes three-quarters of what he is telling her no she knows it all but it is all the same to her let him speak how kind he is and he keeps on with his story that he has been tired of giving private lessons this long time and why or in what family and of what special pupils he is tired and how he is not tired of his occupation in the counting-room of the factory because it is important and he has a great influence over all the factory hands and how he has succeeded in doing something there how he has enabled those who desired to learn to read and write how he has taught them how to learn their letters how he has succeeded in getting from the firm a salary for the teachers by proving that the workmen would in this way ruin less machinery and less work because in this way there would be less idleness and drunken eyes of course it was a trifling salary and how he keeps the working people from drinking and in order to do this he has often been to their saloons and a great deal of the same sort of talk but the principal thing was this that he has made himself solid with the firm as an active energetic man and he has been gradually getting the business into his own control so that the conclusion of his story and the main flavor of it for lopukhov consisted in this he has accepted the place as acting manager of the factory the nominal manager would be an honorary person from the firm itself with an honorary salary 
but the active manager would be Lopukh6f himself, the member of the firm accepted the position of nominal manager only on this condition i says he cannot do it how can i you take the name then so that an honorable man may have it and there will be no need for you to trouble yourself for i will do everything if that is the case all right then i will take the position but the importance does not lie in his having the power but in the fact that he is to have a salary of three thousand five hundred roubles nearly a thousand roubles more than all taken together that he had received from his occasional hard literary work and from his pupils and from his former place in the factory consequently he can give up everything now except the factory and that is splendid and all this takes more than half an hour to relate and at the end of the story vira pavlovna is able to say that it is really good and she is able to arrange her hair and go to dinner and after dinner masha gets eight silver kopecks for an izvoshchik to take her in four different directions to carry notes from lopukhov saying i am at leisure gentlemen and i should be glad to have you come to see me and some time later appears the terrible rachmatov and after him one by one come a whole tribe of young people and a formidable scientific conversation begins with immeasurable reproaches heaped up on each individual by all the rest with all possible inconsequentialities but some traitors to this lofty discussion help vira pavlovna somehow or other to kill the evening and when half the evening is spent she guesses where masha has been gone so long how kind he is yes this time vira pavlovna had been absolutely glad on account of her young friends though she did not get into a gale with them but sat quietly and she was ready to kiss even rachmatov himself the visitors went away towards three o'clock in the morning and they did well in being so late vira pavlovna weary from the excitement of the day had only just lain down when her husband came in while telling you about the factory my dear virochka i forgot to tell you one thing about my new place and by the way it is not very important and i don't know as it is worth while to speak about it but i will tell you some time but i have one favour to ask i want to sleep so do you so if i do not tell you the rest of the story now we will speak about it to-morrow and now i will tell you in two words you see when i took the place of acting manager i agreed upon this condition that i can take the place any time that i want within a month or two and now i want to avail myself of this time i have not seen my old folks in riazan for five years i am going to make them a visit good night virochka don't get up you will have time to-morrow go to sleep End of part three, chapter twenty six. Recording by expatriate in Bangor, Maine. Part three, chapters twenty seven and twenty eight of A Vital Question or What is to be Done by Nikolai Chernyshevsky. Translated by Nathan Haskell Dole, eighteen fifty two to nineteen thirty five and others this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by expatriate in bangor maine part three marriage and second love chapter twenty seven when vira pavlovna came out from her room the next morning her husband and masha were already packing two valises with things and all the time masha was hard at work lopukhov gave her so many things to wrap up and fold and stow away that masha really could not attend to it all Virotchka, you too come and help us and all three of them were drinking tea as they were taking down and stowing away things vira pavlovna had hardly time to collect her wits when her husband said it is half past eleven it is time to go to the station my dear i am going with thee my love Virotchka, i am going to take two valises there will be no room for you you can go with masha i did not mean that i meant to riazan ah if that's so then masha may bring along the valises and we will go together on the street you cannot well get sentimental in your talk and besides there is such a rattling over the pavement lopukhov could not hear all that she said he made a good many replies that could not be heard or he would not reply at all i am going with thee to riazan repeated vira pavlovna but you have not got your things ready how can you go you can get ready if you want to do just as seems best to you but i would ask you one thing wait till you get a letter from me you will get it to-morrow i shall write and mail it somewhere on my journey to-morrow you will get it wait i beg of you 
how she throws her arms around him at the gallery of the railway station with what tears she kisses him while seeing him into the car and he speaks all the time about his business in the factory how fine it is and how glad his old folks will be to see him and how everything in the world is dross compared with health and how important it is for her to look out for her health and just as he bids her good-bye he says speaking through the balustrade you wrote that you had never been so fond of me as you are now this is true my dear vierotchka and i am not less fond of you than you are of me and the disposition towards a person the wishing his happiness this we both firmly believe in but there is no happiness without freedom you would not want to restrain me nor i you and if you began to use restraint on yourself on my account you would grieve me so don't do it do whatever you think is for your best but we will see about it by and by write me when you want me to come back good-bye my dear the second bell has rung it's time for the train to start good-bye chapter twenty eight this was towards the end of april towards the middle of june lopukhov returned lived three weeks in petersburg then he left for moscow on business for the factory as he said on the twenty first of july he left and on the twenty third of july in the morning happened the misunderstanding in the hotel at the station of the moscow railroad on account of the stranger not getting up and two hours later came the scene in the kamenoi ostrov dacha now the sapient reader will not fail to have guessed who shot himself i saw long ago that it was lopukhov says the sapient reader in triumph at his perspicacity where could he have hid himself and how did his cap have a bullet hole through the top there is no need of asking it is only a trick of his but he caught himself in a net the rascal says the sapient reader nu no, god be with thee decide it just as thou pleasest there's no reasoning with thee end of part three chapter twenty eight recording by expatriate in bangor maine part three chapter twenty nine a of a vital question or what is to be done by nikolai chernyshevsky translated by nathan haskell dole eighteen fifty two to nineteen thirty five and others this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by expatriate in bangor maine part three marriage and second love chapter twenty nine a an extraordinary man three hours after kirsdnof left vira pavlovna came to her senses and almost her very first thought was that it was impossible to leave the shop in such a way yes though vira pavlovna loved to assure herself that the shop was getting along by itself yet in reality she knew that she is only flattering herself with this thought and as a matter of fact the shop needed a director else it would go astray however the business was now very well established and it took but very little trouble to direct it mrs mertsalova had two children but she might spare an hour or an hour and a half every day or not even every day she surely would not refuse for already she has a great deal to do with the shop vira pavlovna began to look over her things preparatory to the sale of them and she herself sent masha first to mrs mertsalova to ask her to come and then to the old woman who deals in second-hand clothes and other things of every sort rachel one of the most business-like of jewesses and a very good friend of vira pavlovna's towards whom rachel had proved herself absolutely honest as almost all the small retail dealers among the hebrews are whether men or women when they have to do with respectable people rachel and masha had to stop at their city apartment to collect the remainder of the clothes and things and on their way to stop at the furrier's where vira pavlovna's shubas were stored away for the summer and then to come back to their summer dacha with the whole collection so that rachel might put a valuation on the things and buy them all at once after masha left the gate she was met by rakhmatov who had been prowling for half an hour around the dacha are you going away masha for how long yes probably i shan't get back before late this evening i have a great deal to attend to is vira pavlovna all alone by herself she is alone then i will step in and stay with her in your place in case i can do anything to help her if you only would and i tremble on her account and i forgot entirely mr rakhmatov 
Call some of the neighbors. There is a cook and a nurse girl, friends of mine, to get dinner, for she has not had anything to eat yet. All right. I have not had any dinner myself. We'll help ourselves. Have you had your dinner? Yes. Vera Pavlovna would not let me go without it. Well, that's good. I imagine she would have forgotten this on account of her own trouble. Except Masha and those who were her equals or superiors, in the simplicity of soul and dress, all people were rather afraid of Rakhmatov. Lopukhov and Kirsdnof and all those who feared nobody and nothing felt in his presence at times some trepidation. Towards Vera Pavlovna he was very distant. She found him very tiresome. He never sought her society. But Masha liked him, though he was less sociable and polite to her than were any other of their visitors. I came without being invited, Vera Pavlovna, he began, but I have seen Alexander Matveitch, and I know all, and so I came to the conclusion that I might be useful to you in some way, and I am going to spend the evening here. His services might have been very useful even now to help Vera Pavlovna in undoing the things. Anyone in Rakhmatov's place would have been asked to do it, or would have offered his services. But he did not offer, and he was not asked. Vera Pavlovna only pressed his hand, and with sincere feeling said that she was very grateful to him for his attention. I shall remain in the library, he said. If anything is needed, call me, and if anybody comes, I will open the door. Don't you trouble yourself. With these words he went into the library, took from his pocket a big piece of ham and a hunk of black rye bread, all of which must have weighed four pounds. He sat down and ate it to the last crumb, striving to chew it all very fine. He drank half a pitcher of water, then he went to the bookshelves and began to pick out something to read. I know that, not original, not original, not original, not original. This criticism, not original, referred to such books as Macaulay, Guizot, Thiers, Ranke, Gervinus. Ah, but here's something good. This he said, after reading on the back of several huge tomes, complete works of Newton. He began hastily to turn over the pages finally he found what he was looking for and with a lovely smile cried here it is here it is observations on the prophecies of daniel and the apocalypse of st john yes this side of knowledge has till now remained with me without any real foundation newton wrote this commentary when he was old when he was half sane and half crazy it is the classical fountain when one is on the question of the mixture of sense and insanity here is a question of world-wide historical interest this mixture which is in almost all occurrences in almost all books and in almost all brains but here it must be in a model form in the first place the most ingenious and normal brain that ever was known in the second place the acknowledged undisputed insanity which was superinduced upon this brain and so the book is capital in its way the most obscure features of the general phenomenon must appear here more distinctly than anywhere else and no one can have the least doubt that here you find these very features of this phenomenon to which the features of the mixture of sanity and insanity are related the book is worth studying with great energy he began to read the book which for the last century had been scarcely read except by those who wanted to set it right for any one else to read it except rakhmatov would be equivalent to eating sand or sawdust but it was to his taste such people as rakhmatov are rare so far in my life i have met with only eight examples of this species and that number includes two women they have no interrelation except in one feature among them were people soft and severe people melancholy and gay energetic people and phlegmatic people sentimental people one of them had a severe face sarcastic even to impudence another one with a wooden face quiet and indifferent to everything they both shed tears before me several times like hysterical women and not on their own account but during talks on different topics while by themselves i am sure they wept often and people who never under any circumstances lost their self-possession there was no resemblance between them in any respect with the exception of the one feature but that feature in itself joined them into one species and separated them from the rest of humanity i used to laugh at those with whom i had been intimately acquainted when i was alone with them they would either get angry or not but they would also join in the laugh and really there was so much that was amusing about them the main characteristic was amusing for this very reason that they were people of a different species i loved to laugh at such people 
the one whom i met in the circle of lopukhov and kirsdnof and about whom i am going to speak here serves as a living proof that a reserve clause is necessary in the arguments between lopukhov and mertsalov about the peculiarities of the soil in vira pavlovna's second dream such a reserve clause is necessary to this effect that no matter how bad the soil may be it may have some very tiny portions which will produce healthy grain the genealogies of the principal characters of my narrative vira pavlovna kirsdnof and lopukhov to tell the truth do not go back further than their grandfathers and grandmothers and possibly by some tremendous straining you may get back still further to some kind of great-grandmother the great-grandfather is hidden by the darkness of oblivion all that is known of him is probably that he was the husband of the great-grandmother and that his name was kirill because the grandfather was kirillovitch rakhmetov belonged to a family which has been known since the thirteenth century that is it is one of the most ancient not only in russia but anywhere in europe in the number of the tartar prisoners tribal chiefs who were massacred in tver according to the words of the chroniclers on account of their intention of converting the people to mohammedanism an intention which they probably did not have but simply out of brutality was a certain rakhmet the young son of this rakhmet by a russian wife who was the niece of a nobleman of tver that is the oberhof marshal or field marshal whom rakhmet married by force was saved on his mother's account and he was baptized mikhail instead of latvif from this latvif mikhail rakhmetovitch sprang a good many rakhmetovs in tver they were boyars in moscow they were crown officers in petersburg during the last century they were generals-in-chief of course not all of them the family branched out very widely so that there would not have been enough positions of general-in-chief to give them all our rakhmetov's great-great-grandfather was a friend of ivan ivanovitch shuvalov's and he put him on his feet again after his failure which was caused by his friendship from munich his great-grandfather was a contemporary of rumiantsov he served till he reached the rank of general-in-chief and he was killed at the battle near novo his grandfather escorted alexander to tilsit and would have risen higher than any of them but he early ruined his career by his friendship with speronsky his father served without any success and without any failures at the age of forty he resigned with the rank of general-lieutenant and made his home at one of his estates which were scattered about over the sources of the medvyaditsi river the estates were however not very large all in all probably about two thousand five hundred souls or serfs and during the leisure which came to him in his country retirement he had eight children our rakhmetov was the next to the youngest he had one younger sister and consequently our rakhmetov did not have a large estate he received about four hundred souls and seven thousand desyatins of land how he managed with his serfs and his five thousand five hundred desyatins of land is not known to anybody nor was it known that he kept for himself one thousand five hundred desyatins and moreover generally it was not known as long as he lived among us that he was a proprietor or that the land retained for himself gave him about three thousand roubles income this we learned afterwards but at that time we supposed of course that he was of the same family as those rakhmetovs many of whom were rich proprietors and who together bearing the same name possessed about seventy-five thousand souls around the sources of the medvidica the koper the sura and tsna rivers who forever were the district marshals of those places and one or the other of them is constantly the marshal of one or the other of the governmental cities through which run their feudatory rivers and we know that our friend rakhmetov used to spend four hundred roubles a year for a student of that time that was not very bad but for a proprietor from among the rakhmetovs it was too little and so every one of us though we really cared very little for such investigations decided for himself without making any inquiries that our rakhmetov must be from some impoverished or estateless branch of the rakhmetovs maybe the son of some kind of a governmental officer who left his children a small fortune but we did not bother ourselves about these things now he was twenty-two years old and he had been a student since he was sixteen but for nearly three years he had given up the university he left the second class went to his estate took charge of it after defeating his guardian's resistance and winning the anathemas of his brothers and succeeding in making his sister's husbands forbid them to mention his name then he wandered all over russia in different guises both by land and by water 
and by one or the other in a common and an uncommon way for instance by foot and on rafts and in slow boats he had a good many adventures which he brought upon himself among other things that he did he sent two men to the university of kazan and five to the university of moscow these were his stipendiaries but to petersburg where he himself intended to live he had no students at his expense and therefore no one of us knew that instead of four hundred he had three thousand roubles income this became known only later on but all we knew was that he often disappeared for some time and two years before the time that he is sitting in kirsdnof's library with newton's commentaries on the apocalypse he returned to petersburg entered the philological faculty before he had been in the department of natural science and that's all but if none of rakhmatov's petersburg acquaintances were aware of his family and pecuniary standing yet all who knew him knew him by two nicknames one of them we have already used in this story the rigorist he accepted it with his usual easy smile of gloomy satisfaction but when he was called nikitushka or lomov or by the full name nikitushka lomov he smiled broadly and sweetly and he had just reason for it because he was not endowed by nature but gained by the firmness of his will the right to this name which is so famous among millions of men but it thunders with its fame only in a district of a hundred versts in width running through eight provinces but to the readers living in the rest of russia it is necessary to explain what this name meant nikitushka lomov was a river boatman who went up and down the volga twenty years or fifteen years ago he was a giant of herculean strength he was more than twenty-six feet high he was so broad across his chest and shoulders that he weighed fifteen puds six hundred pounds avoirdupois though he was such a heavy man he was not stout to illustrate his strength it is necessary to give only one illustration he used to receive the wages of four men whenever his vessel came to a city and he went to market or as it is called in the volga dialect the bazaar the boys were heard in the most distant corners of the street shouting here comes nikitushka lomov here comes nikitushka lomov and everybody ran into the street which led from the wharf to the bazaar and crowds of people used to pour out after their favourite hero rakhmatov from the age of sixteen when he first came to petersburg was as regards strength an ordinary lad of rather tall stature rather strong but by no means remarkable for his strength certainly two out of ten of his comrades would have got the better of him but when he was going on to seventeen it occurred to him that it would be a good thing to acquire physical riches and he began to work over himself he energetically practised gymnastics this was good but gymnastics only perfect the material it is necessary to have a material basis and so for a time which was twice as long as he spent on his gymnastics he used to work every day for several hours as a common labourer where physical strength was required he lugged water he carried wood chopped wood sawed trees cut stone dug earth hammered iron he passed through a good many occupations and he frequently changed them because with every new work with every new change some of his muscles would get a new development he underwent the diet of a boxer he began to nurse himself in the full sense of the word with the special things which had the reputation of strengthening the body beefsteaks almost raw more often than anything else and since that time he always lived in such a way in a year after he began such a regime he started off on his wanderings and here he had still better opportunities to develop his physical strength he became a ploughman a carpenter a ferryman and a working man a labourer in every kind of healthy occupation whatever once he went the whole length of the volga from dubovka to ruibinsk in the capacity of a burlach to tell the master of the boat and the other burlachs that he wanted to join them would have been regarded as absurd and he might not have been accepted so he simply engaged passage as a traveller and after making friends with the crew he began to help tow the boat and at the end of a week he put on the regular harness as though he had been a genuine labourer they quickly noticed how powerfully he was towing the boat they began to put his strength to the test he out-towed three even four of the strongest of his mates at that time he was twenty years old and his mates on the boat christened him nikitushka lomov after the memory of the hero who at this time had left the stage in the following summer he was travelling in a steamer one of the second-class passengers who crowded the steamer's deck proved to be one of his last year's co-workers on the towpath 
and in this way his companions who were students learned that he must be nicknamed nikitushka lomov in fact he acquired and without sparing any time he kept up his mighty strength this is necessary he used to say it gives you respect and love among the common people this is useful and it may come handy some time end of part three chapter twenty nine a recording by expatria in bangor maine part three chapter twenty nine b of a vital question or what is to be done by nikolai chernyshevsky translated by nathan haskell dole eighteen fifty two to nineteen thirty five and others this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by expatriate in bangor maine part three marriage and second love chapter twenty nine b this entered his mind when he was halfway through his sixteenth year because from that time his peculiarities began to develop themselves at sixteen he came to petersburg as a commonplace good-natured graduate of the gymnasium a commonplace kind and honest youth and he spent three or four months in an ordinary way as all new students do but he began to learn that there were among the students some very clever heads who had different ideas from the rest and he learned the names of half a dozen such students at that time there were only a few they interested him and he began to try to make their acquaintance he happened to get acquainted with kirsdnof and from this time dated his regeneration into an extraordinary man the future nikitushka lomov and the rigorist he listened eagerly to kirsdnof the first evening he wept he interrupted him with exclamations of curses against all that was to vanish and blessings on all that must live what book shall i begin to read kirsdnof directed him on the next day at eight o'clock in the morning he was walking down the nevsky from the admiralty to the police bridge wondering which german or french bookstore would be the first to open he took what he wanted and read steadily for more than seventy-two hours in succession from eleven o'clock on thursday morning till nine o'clock sunday evening eighty-two hours the first two nights he did not sleep at all on the third he drank eight cups of the strongest coffee but on the fourth night coffee refused to support his strength he fell down on the floor and slept for fifteen hours at the end of a week he came to kirsdnof asked what books further he should read and some explanations they became friends and through him he afterwards met the lopukhovs in six months though he was only seventeen while they were each one and twenty they didn't look upon him as only a young fellow compared to themselves and he had indeed become an extraordinary man what earnest was there in his past life for such a course not a very great one but still there was something his father was a man of despotic character very clever educated and an ultra-conservative in the very same way as marya alexyevna was ultra-conservative but he was honest it was hard for him of course but that would not have made any difference to rakhmatov but his mother a woman of very delicate nature suffered much from her husband's severity and his whole life was bounded by the village and this too would not have made any difference there was another thing it happened that when he was fifteen he fell in love with one of his father's mistresses trouble ensued which was of course trying to her he pitied a woman who had suffered a great deal on his account thoughts began to stir in him and kirsdnof stood in the same relation to him as lopukhov had stood to vira pavlovna there was an earnest in his past life but in becoming such an extraordinary man the principal element is nature for some time before he left the university and went back to his estate and afterwards while wandering over russia he adopted original principles in his material moral and intellectual life and after he returned they had been crystallized into a complete system to which he unflinchingly adhered he said to himself i am not going to drink a drop of wine i shall not touch a woman yet his nature was passionate what is the need there is no good of going to such extremes it is necessary we ask demand for all people the full enjoyment of life we must bear witness with our own lives that we are demanding this not for the gratification of our personal passions not for ourselves personally but for humanity in general that we speak only in accordance with principle and not from preference according to conviction and not individual necessity 
consequently he began to lead a very severe and ascetic style of life to become a nikitushka lomov and keep up the character he had to eat meat a great deal of meat and he ate a great deal but he grudged every kopeck that he spent on anything else but meat he gave orders to his landlady to buy the very best meat that was to be had and have the very best pieces for him but all else that he ate at home was of the cheapest description he gave up white bread and ate only black bread at his table for weeks at a time he never had a piece of sugar in his mouth for months at a time he never tasted fruit or veal or chicken with his own money he never bought anything of the kind i have no right to spend money for luxuries which i can easily get along without yet he was brought up at a table where luxury reigned and his taste was refined as was seen by his remarks on dishes when he used to dine at the table of others he enjoyed a good many of the dishes of which he did not partake at his own table but some dishes he would not eat at the table of a stranger the cause for the distinction was a solid one what the common people eat now and then i also may eat occasionally but whatever is not in the reach of the common people i too must not eat this i must do so as to appreciate how wretched the lives of the people are in comparison with mine therefore if fruits were served he actually ate apples but he absolutely refused apricots oranges he would eat in petersburg but he would not touch them in the provinces don't you see in petersburg the people sometimes eat them but never in the provinces pies he used to eat because a good pirog is not worse than a pie and pie crust is familiar to the common people but he never ate sardines he used to dress very poorly though at one time he liked finery and in all other respects he led the life of a spartan for example he never allowed a mattress and he slept on a bag of straw not even allowing it to be doubled he had one spot on his conscience he did not give up smoking i cannot think without a cigar if that is really so then i am right but maybe it is from weakness of will-power and he would not smoke bad cigars for he was brought up amid aristocratic surroundings out of his four hundred roubles of income he used to spend one hundred and fifty on cigars it is a detestable weakness as he used to express himself and only this weakness afforded some possibility of getting the best of him if he went too far with his reproaches of others the one whom he reproached would say to him yes but perfection is impossible even you smoke then rakhmatov would break out into reproaches of double strength but the greater part he would pour out on his own head the other would get the smaller share of them though he would not be forgotten he succeeded in accomplishing a great deal because in disposing of his time he put exactly as firm restrictions on himself as in material things not a quarter of an hour a month was lost in recreation he did not take rest my occupations are various change from one occupation to another is sufficient rest he did not join the circle of his friends whose headquarters were at kirsdnofs or the lopukhovs more frequently than was necessary to keep him in close relations with this circle this is necessary everyday occurrences prove the advantage of having close connection with some circle of men it is necessary to have in your power open resources for various references with the exception of the meetings with this circle he never called on anybody except on business and he never stayed five minutes longer than was necessary for his business and he had never allowed anybody to stay with him except on the same conditions without beating around the bush he would say to the caller we have talked about this business now you will allow me to take up other things because my time is valuable during the first months of his regeneration he used to spend almost all his time reading but this lasted only a little more than six months when he saw that he had acquired a systematic style of thought in the spirit whose principles he found to be correct he said to himself reading is now a secondary matter from this time forth i am ready for life and he began to give to reading only the time which was free from other occupations and such time was very little notwithstanding this fact he extended the circle of his knowledge with wonderful rapidity now that he is twenty-two years old he is a man of remarkably solid learning this was because he had made a rule also in this regard luxury and pleasure there should be none only what is needful and what is needful he used to say on every subject there are very few first-rate works all that you can find fuller and clearer in these few in all the rest is repeated spoiled ruined it is necessary to read only them and all other reading is only an idle waste of time 
Let us take Russian literature. I say, I shall read Gogol before anything else. In the thousand and one other stories I see, from half a dozen lines on half a dozen different pages, that they contain nothing else but Gogol spoiled. Why should I read them, then? The same thing in science. In science this limit is still more striking. If I have read Adam Smith, Malthus, Ricardo, and Mill, I know the Alpha and the Omega of their theories, and I have no need of reading hundreds of other political economists, no matter how famous they may be. By half a dozen lines on half a dozen pages, I see that I shall not find one single fresh thought which belongs to them. They are all borrowed and mutilated. I read only spontaneous works, and only to such a degree as to appreciate their spontaneity. Therefore it was impossible to make him read Macaulay. After spending a quarter of an hour on different pages, he decided, I know all the originals from which this matter is taken. He read Thackeray's Vanity Fair with delight, and he began to read Pendennis, but he gave it up when he reached the twentieth page all this is said in vanity fair apparently there will be nothing more and so there is no need of reading it every book that i read in such a way spares me the necessity of reading hundreds of books he used to say gymnastics work that served to increase his strength in reading these were rakhmatov's personal occupations but after he returned to petersburg they took only the fourth part of his time the rest of his time he spent in helping others or in things that did not belong to any one in particular constantly observing the same rule as in reading not to waste any time on secondary matters and with secondary people but to occupy himself only with things of essential importance from which the secondary things and secondary people are influenced without his interference for instance outside of his circle he used to get acquainted only with people who had influence over others whoever was not an authority for several other people could not even begin a conversation with them he used to say i beg you to excuse me and go away but in the same way it was impossible for any one with whom he had a desire to become acquainted to avoid him in any wise he simply used to come to you and say whatever he had to say with such an introduction as this i want to be acquainted with you it is necessary if you have no time now appoint another time to your trifling business he never paid the least heed no matter if you were his closest friend and begged him to help you out of your embarrassment i have no time he would say and go away but in important business he used to take a share when it was necessary as he expressed it though no one may have asked his aid i must he used to say what things he used to say and do on such occasions is beyond comprehension here for example is my own experience with him i was then not very young i was living comfortably and therefore oftentimes five or six young people from my province used to visit me consequently i was a valuable man for his purposes these young people were attached to me because they saw that i had an attachment for them in this manner he heard my name and i when i had met him for the first time at kirsanov's had never known anything about him this was soon after his return from his wanderings he came in after i did i was the only one in the company whom he did not know when he entered he took kirsanov aside and indicating me with his eyes said several words kirsanov answered him briefly and they separated in a minute rakhmatov was sitting directly in front of me with only a small table which stood by the sofa dividing us and from this distance which was only an arshin and a half he began to study my face with all his might i was vexed he examined me without any ceremony as though i were not a man but a picture i grew angry it was none of his business after looking at me for two or three minutes he said to me mr n i must get acquainted with you i know you but you don't know me ask about me of the kozidin and anybody else whom you particularly trust in this company having said this he got up and went into the other room who is that crank that is rakhmatov he wants you to ask whether he can be trusted without hesitation and whether he deserves attention he is more important than all the rest of us here taken together said kirsanov and others corroborated it in about five minutes he returned to the room where we were all sitting he did not say anything to me and he spoke very little to the others the conversation was not scientific and not important ah it is already ten o'clock he exclaimed after some little time at ten o'clock i have an engagement at such and such a place mr n he said turning to me i have a few words that i want to say to you when i took the kozidin aside to ask him who you were i pointed you out with my eyes so that you must have seen that i was asking who you were consequently it would be useless not to make signs which would be natural at asking such a question when will you be at home so that i may call on you i did not like new acquaintances at that time and this imposition did not please me at all 
i am only at home when i am asleep i am out all day i said but you sleep at home what time do you go to bed very late for example two or three o'clock that makes no difference to me name your time if it's absolutely necessary i will set to-morrow at half past four in the morning of course i might take your words to be insulting and ridiculous but maybe it is true that you have your own reasons which very likely deserve approval at all events i shall call upon you to-morrow morning at half past four no if you are so bent upon it you may come a little later i will be home all the morning till twelve o'clock all right i'll be there at ten o'clock will you be alone yes very good he came and without any beating around the bush went straight at the matter on account of which he felt it necessary to get acquainted with me we talked for half an hour what the subject was makes no difference suffice it to say that he declared that such and such a thing must be done i said no he said you must do it i said not at all in half an hour he said it is evidently useless to talk about this matter longer are you convinced that i am a man who deserves full trust yes i was told so by all and now i see for myself and after all do you still stick to your decision i do do you know what conclusion one can draw from this that you are either a liar or a villain what do you think of that what would have been necessary to do to anybody else who said such words challenge him to a duel but he speaks in such a tone without any personal feeling like a historian who judges coolly and with no intention of offending but for the sake of truth and he is so strange that it would be ridiculous to take offence and all i could do was to laugh but that is one and the same thing i said in this case it is not one and the same thing no but maybe i am both at once in this case to be both is impossible but one of the two things surely either you are thinking and acting not as you speak and in such a case you are a liar or you are thinking and acting as you speak in which case you must be a villain one or the other must be so and i take it for granted that it is the first hypothesis think as you please i said still laughing good-bye at all events understand that i still preserve my trust in you and i will be ready to renew our conversation whenever you please end of part three chapter twenty nine b recording by expatriate in bangor maine part three chapter twenty nine c of a vital question or what is to be done by nikolai chernyshevsky translated by nathan haskell dole eighteen fifty two to nineteen thirty five and others this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by expatriate in bangor maine part three marriage and second love chapter twenty nine c with all the roughness of his behaviour rakhmatov was entirely right both in the very fact that he began as he did because he first learned thoroughly about me and only then undertook this business with me and that he ended the conversation as he did i really did not tell him what i thought and he really was right in calling me a liar and this could not be offensive at all it was even flattering to me in the present case according to his expression because there was such a case and because he could preserve his former confidence in me and possibly even respect yes with all the savageness of his manners everybody remained satisfied that rakhmatov acted as he did because it was the most simple and common-sense way of acting and the terrible extremes to which he went and his horrible reproaches he spoke in such a way that no person of common sense could be offended with them and with all his phenomenal roughnesses he was at heart very gentle his preliminary talk was always of this stamp every embarrassing explanation he began thus you know very well that i speak without any personal feeling if my words prove to be disagreeable i beg you to excuse them but i find that there is no need of getting offended when anything is kindly meant absolutely without intention of offending but from necessity however as soon as it shall seem to you useless to listen to my words i will stop my rule is to offer my opinion everywhere and always whenever i am impelled but never to impose it upon any one and actually he did not impose it it was impossible to save oneself from him expressing his opinion if he found it necessary but only so far that you might understand his view of it but he did it in two or three words and then he would add now you know what the tenor of my conversation would be 
Do you find it useful to have such a talk? If you said no, he bowed and went off. This was the way that he spoke and managed his affairs, and he had a great many things to attend to, and none of them were matters that concerned him personally. He had no personal business, as everybody knew, but what affairs he attended to, no one in the circle knew. It could only be seen that he had a great deal of bother. He was at home very little. He was always on the go. He was always traveling, but for the most part he walked. But there were always people calling upon him, either the same people or new ones. And on this account he made it a rule to be always at home between two and three. At this time he talked with them and had his dinner. But very often he would not be at home for several days. Then in his place one of his friends who was devoted to him soul and body would be at his rooms and receive callers silent as the grave. Two years after this glimpse of him in Kirsdnof's library with Newton's commentary on the apocalypse, he left Petersburg, telling Kirsdnof and one or two of his most intimate friends that he had nothing more to do there, that he has done all that he could, that he may be able to do more after three years, that these three years are free now, that he is thinking of availing himself of them according as it may seem necessary for his future activity. We learned afterwards that he left for his former estate, sold the land which he had reserved, getting 35,000 rubles for it, went to Kazan in Moscow, gave 5,000 rubles or so to his stipendiaries so that they might graduate, and that was all we knew about him. Where he went after leaving Moscow is not known. After several months passed without any tidings from him, those who knew something more about him than all the rest knew ceased to hide things about which by his request they had kept silence so long as he was among us then our little circle learned that he had stipendiaries and also learned the larger part of his personal doings which i have already told we learned a great deal about his adventures which however did not explain everything in fact explained nothing at all but only made rakhmatov a still more mysterious person for the whole circle adventures which by their strangeness surprised us or entirely contradicted the opinion which the circle entertained of him as a man who was entirely hard-hearted as far as personal feeling went one who had not if i may use the expression a personal heart beating with the sensation of personal life to relate all of these adventures would not be in place here i shall only quote two of them of two different kinds one of a savage order the other of a stamp which contradicted the former ideas entertained by the circle in his regard i will select these histories from those told by kirsdnof about a year before he left petersburg for the second and probably the last time rakhmatov said to kirsdnof give me a good quantity of plaster for curing wounds from sharp weapons kirsdnof gave him a big jar supposing that rakhmatov wanted to take this medicament to some society of carpenters or other laborers who are frequently subjected to cuts on the next morning rakhmatov's landlady came in great alarm to kirsdnof batyushka doctor i don't know what has happened to my tenant for he has not been out of his room for a long time he has locked the door i peeked through the crack he was lying all in blood i began to scream and he says to me says he it's nothing agrafina antonovna what does he mean by nothing save him batyushka doctor i'm afraid it's suicide he is so unmerciful to himself kirsdnof ran in all haste rakhmatov opened the door with a melancholy broad smile the caller saw the thing from which not agrafina antonovna alone might have been frightened the back and shoulders of his underclothes he was dressed only in his underclothes were soaked with blood there was blood on the bed the straw bed on which he slept was also covered with blood in the straw were thousands of little nails with heads down and points up they penetrated out from the bag almost an inch rakhmatov had been lying on them all night long for heaven's sake what is the matter rakhmatov cried kirsdnof in horror it is a trial it is necessary it's incredible of course however it is necessary i see that i can stand it besides what kirsdnof saw it may be judged from this that the kozyaika also could relate a great many interesting things about rakhmatov but in her capacity of a simple-hearted and simply dressed old woman she was out of her wits in regard to him and of course it was impossible to learn anything from her this time she ran off to get kirsdnof only because rakhmatov allowed her to do so to calm her she wept so bitterly thinking that he was going to commit suicide 
Two months after that was the end of May. Rakhmetov was away for a week or more, but at that time nobody noticed it, because it was a common occurrence for him to vanish in that way. Now Kirsdnof told the following story of the way Rakhmetov spent those days. They constituted an erotic episode in Rakhmetov's life. Love arose from an occurrence which was worthy of Nikitushka Lomov. Rakhmetov was going from the first Pargolov into town, lost in thoughts and looking at the ground in his usual way. He was near the Forestry Institute. He was awakened from his thoughts by the desperate shrieks of a woman. He looked up. A horse attached to a charaban in which a lady was riding was running away. The lady herself was driving, but she could not control him. The reins were trailing on the ground, and the horse was within two steps of Rakhmetov. He threw himself in the midst of the way, but the horse was already past him. He had no time to catch the reins. He had only time to catch the hind axle of the charaban. He brought it to a stop, but it threw him down. A crowd gathered, helped the lady out of the charaban, and lifted Rakhmetov to his feet. His chest was somewhat bruised, but the worst was that the wheel had torn out a large piece of flesh from his leg. The lady came to herself and ordered him taken to her dacha, which was within half a verse. He consented because he felt weak from loss of blood, but he asked that Kirsdnof should be sent for without fail, and no other doctor. Kirsdnof found that the bruises on his chest were not serious, but Rakhmetov was weak from loss of blood. He lay there for ten days. The rescued lady, of course, took care of him herself. He could not do anything else in his weak condition, and so he talked with her. All the same, the time would be wasted. He talked with her, and became quite friendly with her. The lady was a widow of nineteen. She was not poor, and generally speaking, she was in an absolutely independent position, an intellectual and respectable woman. Rakhmetov's fiery speeches, of course not on the subject of love, charmed her. I see him in my dreams, surrounded by a halo, she said to Kirsdnof. Rakhmetov also fell in love with her. She, judging by his dress and by everything else, supposed that he was a man who had absolutely nothing, and therefore she was the first to confess her love, and she offered to marry him, when on the eleventh day he got up and said that he was able to go home. I have been more frank with you than with others. You see, such people as I have no right to unite the fate of anyone else with their own yes that is true she said you have no right to marry but till the time when you must renounce me love me no i cannot accept that he said i must suppress love in my heart to love you would tie my hands even as it is they cannot be free so soon for they are already tied but i shall untie them i must not love what became of the lady a crisis must have come into her life in all probability she also became an extraordinary person i wanted to find out about it but i cannot Kirsdnof did not tell me her name, and he himself did not know what became of her. Rakhmetov asked him not to see her and not to inquire about her. If I supposed that you knew anything about her, I could not refrain from asking, and that would not do. After hearing this story, all remembered that for a month or two afterwards, and maybe more, Rakhmetov was more melancholy than usual, did not get angry with himself, no matter how his eyes were pinched by his low weakness that is for cigars, and did not smile sweetly and broadly when he was flattered with the name of Nikitushka Lomov. And I recollected also more that summer, three or four times in conversations with me, some time after our first conversation, he began to be fond of me because I laughed at him. When I was alone with him, and in reply to my rallying him, would utter such words as these, Yes, pity me, you are right. I myself am not an abstract idea, i am a man who would like to love new it is nothing though it will pass he would add and in reality he got over it only once after i had roused his spirits by some of my ridiculous speeches even in the late fall he still uttered these words the sapient reader maybe will guess from this that i know more about rakhmetov than i am telling him it may be i do not dare to contradict him because he is so sapient but if I do not know, there are a good many other things that I know which thou, sapient reader, will not know as long as thou shalt live. But there is one thing that I really do not know. I do not know this, where Rakhmetov is now, and what he is doing, or whether I shall ever see him again. I have no other information or conjectures beyond what all of his acquaintances have. 
when three or four months had passed since his disappearance from moscow and there was no tidings at all about him we all supposed that he went travelling over europe this conjecture apparently was true at least it was confirmed by the following circumstance in a year after rakhmatov disappeared one of kirsdnof's acquaintances met on a car between vienna and munich a young russian who said that he had travelled all over the slavonic lands everywhere he had made friends among all classes and in every country he had stayed long enough to learn the ideas habits styles of life the local customs of self-government the different degrees of welfare among all the classes of the population and for this purpose he had lived in the cities and towns and had gone on foot from one village to another then afterwards in the same way he had studied the roumanians and hungarians he had travelled over northern germany from there he had again made his way on foot to the south in the german provinces of austria now he was going to bavaria and from there to switzerland through wurtemberg and baden to france which he intended to travel and walk through in the same way from there with the same purpose in view he was going to england and he intended to spend a year in this way if any time should be left from this year he would see the spaniards and italians but if no time were left then be it so because this is not so necessary but the other lands are necessary why for study and after a year it would be necessary for him to be at all events in the states of north america to study which was more necessary for him than any other land and there he was going to stay a long time maybe for more than a year and maybe forever if he should find anything to do there but it was more probable that in three years he would return to russia because in russia if not now still by that time it will be necessary for him to be there all this seemed very much like rakhmatov especially the word necessary which was left in the narrator's memory his age his voice his features as far as the narrator could remember of the traveller also pointed to rakhmatov but the narrator did not pay much attention at that time to his travelling companion who moreover was not with him very long not more than two hours he entered the train at some little town and he got out at some village therefore the narrator could describe his appearance only in two general terms and there was no full certainty possible but in all probability it was rakhmatov yet who can tell maybe it was not he there was still another rumour that a young russian once a proprietor appeared before one of the greatest european philosophers of the nineteenth century the father of a new philosophy a german i have thirty thousand thalers all i need is five thousand the balance i beg of you to accept from me the philosopher was living very wretchedly why to publish your works the philosopher naturally did not accept the offer but the russian was said to have left the money with a banker in the philosopher's name and to have written him thus use this money as you please throw it into the river if you want but you can't return it to me you can't find me and it is said that even now this money is at the banker's if this rumour is true then there is no doubt that it was rakhmatov who appeared before the philosopher such was the gentleman who was sitting in kirsdnof's library yes this gentleman is an extraordinary man an example of a very rare species i do not describe this example of a very rare species with all this detail for the sake of teaching thee o sapient reader how to treat people of this kind politely for that is out of thy province it is not likely that thou wilt see any such people thy eyes sapient reader are not constituted so as to see such people they are invisible to thee only honest and courageous eyes see them but the description of this man will serve thee so thou canst know by hearsay what people there are in the world for what purpose this description serves my lady readers and simple-hearted readers they best know by themselves yes ridiculous people like rakhmatov are very amusing i say this for their own benefit that they are ridiculous because i feel pity for them i say to those noble people who are fascinated by them don't follow their example i say this because the path over which they call you to follow is barren of personal happiness but noble people do not listen to me they say no it is not barren it is very rich though it may be barren in some places yet these places are not long we shall have strength enough to pass these places and we shall come to places which are rich with endless happiness so thou seest sapient reader that it is not for thy sake 
but for the other part of the public that i have said that such people as rakhmetov are ridiculous to thee o sapient reader i will declare that they are not bad people otherwise thou very likely will not understand for thyself no they are not bad people there are few of them but through them flourishes the life of all without them life would become dead and putrid there are few of them but they help all people to breathe without them people would suffocate the mass of honest and kind people is great but people like these are few but they are in the midst like caffeine and tea like the bouquet and fine wine from them come their strength and fragrance it is the flower of the best people they are the motive powers of motive powers they are the salt of the salt of the earth end of part three chapter twenty nine recording by expatriate in bangor maine part three chapter thirty a of a vital question or what is to be done by nikolai chernyshevsky translated by nathan haskell dole eighteen fifty two to nineteen thirty five and others this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by expatriate in bangor maine part three marriage and second love chapter thirty a well new thinks the sapient reader now the main character is to be rakhmetov and he will put everybody into his belt and vira pavlovna will fall in love with him and soon the same story will begin with kirsdnof as happened to lopukhov there will be nothing of the sort o sapient reader rakhmetov will spend the evening and will speak with vira pavlovna i shall not hide one word of their conversation from thee and thou shalt quickly see that if i did not want to share this conversation with thee it might have been very easy for me to hide it from thee and the current of my narration would not have been altered in the least if i had kept silent and i tell thee in advance that after rakhmetov speaks with vira pavlovna he will leave the house and then he will disappear forever from this narrative and that he will be neither the main nor a subordinate or any character whatsoever in my novel then why was he brought into the novel at all and described so minutely just try sapient reader if thou canst guess why but this will be told thee in the following pages immediately after rakhmetov's conversation with vira pavlovna as soon as he disappears i will tell thee at the end of the chapter now just try to guess what will be said there it is not very hard to guess if thou hast the least conception of the artistic of which thou art so fond of talking but how canst thou nu no, i will tell thee more than half of the answer rakhmetov was brought in so as to fulfil the principle the most radical demand of what is artistic exclusively to give satisfaction to it well well guess now try to guess this very minute what is that demand what was it needful to do for its satisfaction and how was it satisfied by showing the rachmatoff's figure which has no influence or part in the current of this narrative well guess the lady reader and the simple reader who do not talk about the artistic they understand but do try to guess thou wiseling for this reason plenty of time is given thee and for this purpose a long and thick dash is placed between the lines dost thou see how much pains i take on thy account stop for a moment and just think if thou canst not guess mrs mertsalova came shed a few tears offered some consolation and said it would give her pleasure to take charge of the sewing shop but she did not know as she had the ability and again she shed a few tears and offered some more consolation while helping to look over the things rakhmetov after asking the servant at the next neighbor's to go to the bakery put up the samovar set it on the table and they began to drink their tea rakhmetov sat for half an hour with the ladies drank half a dozen glasses of tea and together with them he emptied half of a huge pitcher of cream and ate a terrible quantity of baked things besides two simple loaves of white bread which served as the foundation for the rest i have a right to take this delectation because i sacrificed twelve hours he took his enjoyment listened as the ladies tormented themselves to death three times expressed his opinion that it was nonsense not the fact that the ladies were tormenting themselves to death but suicide for any cause whatsoever except too painful and incurable physical disease or the presentiment of some painful and unavoidable death for instance being broken upon the wheel 
he expressed this opinion in a few but strong words according to his custom he helped himself to a sixth glass of tea poured the remainder of the cream into it took what was left of the baked things the ladies had already long ago finished with their tea bowed and went with these materials into the library again to enjoy the finale of his material enjoyment almost to make a sybarite of himself to place himself on the sofa on which everybody was free to take a nap but which was for him something in the nature of genuine capuan luxury i have earned my right to this delectation because i have sacrificed twelve or fourteen hours time after he had finished his material enjoyment he took up his intellectual feast again the reading of the commentary of the apocalypse at nine o'clock the police chinovnik came to tell the suicide's wife about the matter which was now entirely cleared up rakhmatov told him that the widow knew all about it and there was no need of her hearing anything more the chinovnik was very glad that he had escaped such a tormenting scene then masha and rachel put in appearance they began to examine the things rachel found that everything all told except the good shuba which she advised her not to sell because in three months she would have to get a new one and to this vera pavlovna consented that all the rest was worth four hundred and fifty roubles and really she could not do better than that even according to mrs mertsalova's inward conviction thus about ten o'clock the commercial operation was brought to an end rachel paid down two hundred roubles she had no more the balance she would send in three days to mertsalova so she took the things and went off mertsalova stayed for an hour longer and then it was time for her to go home and nurse her baby and she went saying that she would come on the next day to accompany her to the railroad station after mertsalova went away rakhmatov closed newton's commentary on the apocalypse put it carefully in its place and sent masha to ask vera pavlovna if he might see her he came in with his usual tranquillity and calmness vera pavlovna i can now to a great degree console you now it is possible before it was impossible i will tell you in advance that the general result of my visit will be consoling to you you know that i do not speak vain words therefore and in advance you must become calm i am going to lay the matter before you in due order i told you that i met alexander matveitch and that i know all about it this is really true i really saw alexander matveitch and i really know everything but i did not say that i knew all from him and i could not have said so because i do not know all from him because to tell the truth i know all that i know not from him but from dmitri sergeitch who spent two hours with me i was told that he was coming to see me and so i stayed at home he was with me for two hours and even longer after he had written the little note which caused you so much pain and he asked you heard what he intended to do and you did not stop him i asked you to be calm because the result of my call will be comforting to you no i did not stop him because his decision was soundly based as you yourself will acknowledge i will begin again he asked me to spend this evening with you because he knew that you would be grieved and he gave me a message to you he naturally chose me to do this because he knew me as a man who fulfils messages with minute exactness if i undertake it and cannot be turned aside by any feeling or by any request from the exact fulfilment of the obligation undertaken he foresaw that you would implore any one to violate his will and he knew that i not being moved by your prayers would fulfil it and i shall fulfil it and so i beg of you in advance do not ask me to yield in any degree from what i say his commission was as follows he while going away in order to leave these scenes Ojmoi, what has he done how could it be that you did not stop him just get the meaning of his expression to leave these scenes and do not condemn me prematurely he used that expression in the note which you received didn't he and we must use this very expression because it is very strikingly chosen vira pavlovna's eyes began to show some lack of comprehension her whole face clearly implied the thought i do not know what he means what am i to think about this oh rakhmatov with all the apparent absurdity of his circumstantial manner of laying the matter before her was a master a great master in the art of management he was a great psychologist he knew and could fulfil the laws of gradual preparation and so while going away in order as he rightly expressed it to leave these scenes 
He left in my hands a note for you. Vi'ra Pavlovna jumped up. Where is it? Let me have it. And how could you sit a whole day without giving it to me? I could, because I saw the necessity. Very soon you will appreciate my reasons. They are well founded. Before all, I want to explain to you the expression which I used when I began, that the result will be comforting to you. I did not mean that this note would conduce to your comfort, for two reasons, the first of which is that the receipt of the note would not have been sufficiently comforting to deserve the name of consolation. Isn't that true? For consolation, something more is required. And so the consolation must be in the very contents of the note. Vera Pavlovna again jumped up. Be calm. I cannot say that you are in the wrong. Having mentioned to you the contents of the note, I shall ask you to listen to the second reason why I could not mean by the words comforting result the mere act of your receiving the note, but that I had to mean its contents. These contents, the character of which we have insinuated, are so important that I can only show it to you, but I cannot give it to you. You may read it, but you cannot keep it. What? You are not going to give it to me? No. For this very reason I was chosen. For any one else in my place would have given it to you. It cannot remain in your hands because, from the extraordinary importance of its contents which we have mentioned, it must not remain in any one's hands. But you would certainly want to keep it if I were to give it to you. Therefore, rather than be compelled to take it away from you by main force, I shall not give it to you, but I shall only show it to you. But I shall only show it to you when you have sat down, put your hands on your knees, and given me your promise not to lift them. If there had been any stranger there, no matter with what a sentimental heart he had been gifted, he could not have helped laughing over the solemnity of all this procedure, and especially over the ceremonious ceremony of its final scene. It was ridiculous without doubt, but how good it would be for all nerves if, while imparting cruel tidings, you were able to preserve the tenth part of the ceremony of preparation which Rakhmetov did. But Vera Pavlovna, not being a stranger, of course could only feel the trying element of this torturing slowness, and she herself presented a figure at which the observer would have found no less cause for amusement, when, sitting down quickly, obediently folding her hands, and with the most ludicrous voice, that is, with a voice of poignant impatience, she cried out, I take my oath. Rachmatov laid on the table a sheet of writing paper, on which were written ten or twelve lines. Vera Pavlovna had hardly cast her eyes upon them when, at the very same instant, flushing, forgetting all her oaths, she jumped up. Like a lightning flash, her hand grasped for the note, but the note was already far in Rachmatov's uplifted hand. I foresaw this, and therefore, if you were able to notice, as you may have noticed, I did not take my hand entirely from the note. The very same way I shall keep hold of this sheet by the corner so long as it lies on the table. Therefore, all your attempts to grab it will be in vain. Vera Pavlovna sat down again and folded her hands. Again, Rachmatov put the note before her eyes. She read it over twenty times in excitement. Rachmatov stood very patiently behind her chair, keeping in his hand the corner of the sheet. Thus passed a quarter of an hour. Finally, Vera Pavlovna lifted her hand very quietly, evidently without any thieving intention, and covered her eyes with it. How kind! how kind she exclaimed i do not entirely share your opinion and why we shall see later on this is not the fulfilment of his commission but only the expression of my opinion which i expressed also to him when we met last his commission consisted in my showing you this note and then burning it up have you seen it as long as you want i want to see it more more again she folded her hands again he put down the note and with patience as before, he again stood a good quarter of an hour. Again she hid her face in her hands and kept uttering, Oh, how kind, how kind! So far as you could learn this note by heart, you have done so. If you were in a calm state of mind, you would not only have known it by heart, but the form of every letter would forever be engraved in your memory, so long and attentively you have been looking at it. But by such excitement as you are in, the laws of remembrance are violated, and your memory may fail you foreseeing this emergency i made a copy of this note whenever you want you can always see this copy which i shall retain sometime i may even see the possibility of giving it to you but now i suppose the original can be burned up and then my errand will be ended show it to me again once more he laid the note down 
This time Vi^ra Pavlovna kept continually lifting her eyes from the paper. It was evident that she was learning herself to see if she knew it perfectly. In a few minutes she sighed and ceased to lift her eyes from the note. Now, I see you have already seen it long enough. It is already twelve o'clock, and I want to give you the benefit of my thoughts about this affair, because I consider it useful to you to learn my opinion about it. Are you willing? Yes. At that very moment the note was burning in the flame of the candle. Ach! cried Vi'ra Pavlovna. I did not mean that. Why did you? Yes, you only said that you were willing to listen to me. But it does not make any difference now. It was necessary to burn it up sometime. When he had said this, Rakhmetov sat down. And besides, there is a copy of the note left. Now, Vi'ra Pavlovna, I am going to express my judgment on this whole matter. I am going to begin with you. You are going away. Why? Because it would be very hard for me to stay here. The sight of places which would remind me of the past would drive me crazy. Yes, it is a very disagreeable feeling. But would it be any easier in another place? For very few it is easy. And meantime, what have you done? For the sake of getting some trifling comfort for yourself, you have left to the mercy of chance the fate of fifty people whose lives depend upon you. Is that good? What had become of the melancholy solemnity of Rakhmetov's tone? He spoke lively, easily, simply, enthusiastically. Yes, but I was going to ask Mertsalova. Tis not the same thing. You don't know whether she would be capable of taking your place in the shop, for her ability in regard to this has never yet been tried. But here a grade of ability is demanded, which it is very hard to find. There are ten chances to one that you will not find anybody to take your place, and that your withdrawal will affect the shop injuriously. Is that good? You are going to subject to certain, almost unavoidable injury the interests of fifty people. And for what? For a slight comfort to yourself is that good what a tender solicitude for a trifling alleviation of your pain and what heartlessness for the fate of others what do you think of this part of your action but why didn't you stop me you would not have listened and then i knew that you would soon come back consequently the matter would not amount to anything important do you plead guilty absolutely said vira pavlovna partly jesting but partly and for the most part in serious earnest now this is only one part of your fault all around you still greater will be found but since you confess you shall be rewarded by help towards correcting the other fault which it is possible still to correct are you calm now vira pavlovna yes almost all right what do you think is masha asleep do you need her now for anything of course not but now you are calm consequently you might remember that you ought to tell her to go to bed for it is one o'clock and she gets up early in the morning who ought to have remembered about this you or i i am going to tell her to go to bed and here by the way for your new confession for you are sorry for your fault now there shall be a new recompense i am going to bring whatever i can find there for your supper you have not had any dinner to-day have you and now i think you must be hungry yes i am i see that i am now that you have reminded me of it said vira pavlovna laughing heartily Rakhmetov brought the cold victuals which were left over from his dinner. Masha showed him the cheese and a jar of mushrooms. The lunch was very excellent. He set the table for her and did everything himself. Do you see, Rakhmetov, how ravenously I am eating? That shows that I was hungry, and I had not felt it before, and I had forgotten about myself and not about Masha alone. So you see, I am not such an ill-conditioned criminal as you thought. Neither am I such a miracle for taking care of others when i remembered your appetite for you i myself wanted something to eat i did not have much for dinner i suppose i ate enough to fill anybody else up to the eyes for a dinner and a half but you know how much i eat enough for two moujiks ach rachmatov you were a good angel and not for my appetite alone but why did you sit there all day and not show me that note why did you torment me so long the reason was a very sensible one it was necessary for others to see in what distress you were so that the news about your terrible trouble should be carried around so as to confirm the fact which caused you the trouble you would not want to make believe yes and it is impossible to make anybody's nature from what it is nature acts more vigorously now there are three ways by which the facts will be confirmed masha merzalova and rachel merzalova is a particularly important source she will be enough to take the news to all your friends 
I was very glad that you thought of sending for her. How shrewd you are, Rakhmetov. Yes, that was not a bad thought, to wait till it was night. But it was not my thought. That was Dmitri Sergeyitch's own idea. How kind he was. Vera Pavlovna sighed, but to tell the truth, she sighed not from grief, but from gratefulness. Eh, Vera Pavlovna, we shall yet pick him to pieces. Lately he has thought of things very cleverly and acted very well. But we shall find little faults in him, and very big ones, too. Don't dare to speak so about him, Rakhmetov. I shall get angry. Do you mutiny? There's a punishment for this. Shall I keep on executing you? For the list of your crimes has only begun. Execute me, execute me, Rakhmetov. For your humility, a reward. Humility is always rewarded. You must certainly have a bottle of wine. It will not be bad for you to drink some. Where shall I find it? On the sideboard or in the cupboard? On the sideboard. On the sideboard he found a bottle of sherry. Rakhmetov compelled Vera Pavlovna to drink two glasses, and he himself lighted a cigar. End of part three, chapter thirty A. Recording by Expatriate in Bangor, Maine. Part three, chapter thirty B of A Vital Question or what is to be done by nikolai chernyshevsky translated by nathan haskell dole eighteen fifty two to nineteen thirty five and others this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by expatriate in bangor maine part three marriage and second love chapter thirty b how sorry i am that i cannot drink three or four glasses i should like it do you really like it rakhmetov i envy you vera pavlovna i envy you said he laughing man is weak are you weak thank god but rakhmetov you surprise me you are not at all like what i supposed you were why are you always such a gloomy monster but now you are a lovely jovial man vera pavlovna i am now fulfilling a pleasant duty so why should i not be happy but this is a rare occasion as a general rule you see things about you that are not happy how can you help being a gloomy monster only vera pavlovna as you happen to see me in a mood such as i would like to be in all the time and since there is such frankness between us let it be a secret that i am not by my own will a gloomy monster it is easier for me to fulfil my duty when i am not noticed because i myself would like to fulfil my duty and still be happy in life now people do not try to entertain me any more and i do not have to waste my time by refusing invitations but that you may the more easily imagine me nothing else than a gloomy monster it will be necessary to continue the inquisition of your crimes but why do you want to find more you have already found two heartlessness towards masha and heartlessness towards the shop i confess it indifference to masha is only an error not a great crime masha has not been lost by rubbing her sleepy eyes an hour longer on the contrary she did it with the pleasant consciousness of fulfilling her duty but for the shop i really want to torture you yes but you have already tortured me not entirely i want to finish it how could you dare to give it out at the risk of its destruction but i have confessed already that i have not given out Mertsalov promised to take my place we have already said that your intention of putting her in your place was not a sufficient excuse but by this remark you have only pleaded guilty to a new crime rakhmetov again gradually assumed a serious though not a gloomy tone you say that she takes your place is that decided yes said vira pavlovna without her former jocular tone anticipating that something really bad might result from this just look here by whom was the matter decided by you and by her without any inquiry whether those fifty people would consent to the change or not or whether they wanted somebody else or might not find somebody else better this is despotism vira pavlovna so here are two great crimes on your part heartlessness and despotism but the third one is still more cruel the establishment which to a greater or less degree corresponded with sound ideas of managing life which should serve as a more or less important corroboration of their practicability but practical proofs are so few and every one of them is so valuable this establishment you have subjected to the risk of going to destruction of bringing it from a practical proof into an affidavit 
of impracticability a refutation of your convictions a means of showing the uselessness of ideas which ought to be proved of real benefit to humanity you have afforded the upholders of darkness and wickedness an argument against your holy principles now i am not speaking at all about the fact that you are going to injure the welfare of fifty people what does fifty people mean you have injured the chances of humanity you have proved to be a traitor against progress this vira pavlovna in the language of the church is called a sin against the holy ghost a sin about which is said that any other sin may be forgiven to a person but this never never isn't it true that you are a criminal but it is well that everything has ended as it has and that your sins were committed only in your imagination but however you are really blushing vira pavlovna good i will give you some consolation if you were not suffering so keenly you would not have committed such horrible crimes even in your imagination consequently the real criminal in things is the one who has caused you so much trouble but you keep repeating how kind he was how kind he was how do you make out that he is to blame for my suffering who else in regard to all this he has done well i do not deny it but why did it happen why all this disturbance nothing of the sort should have happened no i oughtn't to have had this feeling but i didn't ask for it i did my best to overcome it that sounds well ought not to have had it the real cause of your sin you have not perceived and for what you are not to blame at all you reproach yourself this feeling was bound infallibly to arise as soon as your nature and dmitri sergeitch's came into contact if not one way then another it would have been developed anyhow for the root of the feeling does not lie in the fact that you love another that is a consequence the root of the feeling is the dissatisfaction with your former relations in what form was this dissatisfaction bound to develop if both you and he or either one of you had been people of no intelligence not refined or even bad it would have been developed in its usual form a quarrel between husband and wife you would have fought like cats and dogs if both of you had been bad or if one of you had been bad one would have eaten the other up and the other would have been eaten at all events there would have been a domestic galleys such as we are pleased to see almost universally in married life and this of course would not have prevented the development of love for another but the main thing would be the galleys and the eating each other up your dissatisfaction could not have taken such a form because both of you were enlightened people and therefore it was developed in only its easiest gentlest and least offensive form love towards another consequently there is no use in talking about love to another that is not the main trouble at all the essence of the matter lies in your dissatisfaction with your former position and the cause of this dissatisfaction was the discordance of your characters both of you were good people but after your character became mature vira pavlovna and lost its childish indefiniteness and acquired definite features it proved that you and dmitri sergeitch were not very well adapted to each other is there anything reprehensible in either of you now for example i also am a decent man but could you get along with me you would hang yourself with weariness of me how long do you suppose it would take you to come to that point a very few days said vira pavlovna laughing he was not such a gloomy monster as i am yet you and he are quite too little adapted to each other who ought to have noticed it first who was the older whose character settled sooner who had the more experience in life he ought to have foreseen it and have prepared your mind so that you would not get alarmed or worry but he understood it only when the feeling which he ought to have expected and did not expect was developed but when the feeling resulting from the other feeling developed then he perceived it why had he not foreseen and noticed it was he stupid he had enough sense for that no it was from inattention from carelessness he neglected his duties towards you vira pavlovna that is the case and you are declaring that he was kind that he loved you rakhmatov gradually becoming excited spoke with feeling but vira pavlovna stopped him i must not listen to you rakhmatov she said in a tone of extreme dissatisfaction you are pouring reproaches upon a man to whom i am endlessly indebted no vira pavlovna if there had been no necessity of my saying that i should not have said it did i notice it to-day only for the first time could i have said it if i had seen it only to-day for the first time 
you know that it is impossible to avoid a conversation with me if I think a conversation is necessary. Indeed, I could have told you this long ago, but I held my peace. So if I speak now, it is because it is necessary to speak. I do not say anything before it is necessary. You saw how I kept the note ten hours in my pocket, though it was pitiful to look at you. But it was necessary not to speak, and I did not speak. Consequently, if I speak now, it shows that I thought long ago about Dmitri Sergeyevich's relations towards you. Thus, of course, it was necessary to speak about them. No, I do not want to listen, said Vera Pavlovna, greatly stirred. I ask you to be silent, Rakhmetov. I beg of you to go. I am very much obliged to you for wasting an evening on my account, but I beg you to leave me. Are you in earnest? In earnest. Very well, he said, laughing. It's all right, Vera Pavlovna, but you cannot get rid of me so easily. I foresaw that this would happen, and I provided for it. The little note which I burned up he wrote of his own accord, but this he wrote according to my request. This I can leave in your hands, because it is not a proof. Here it is. Rakhmetov gave Vera Pavlovna this note. 23rd of July, 2 o'clock in the morning. Dear friend Vierotchka, listen to everything that Rakhmetov will have to say to you. I do not know what he wants to tell you. I have not authorized him to say anything. He has not given me the least hint that he wants to speak to you. But I know that he never says anything but what he thinks is necessary. Yours, D.L. Vera Pavlovna kissed this note, God knows how many times. Why didn't you let me have it before? You probably have something else of his? No, I have nothing more, because nothing more was necessary. Why didn't I let you have it? Until there was necessity, there was no need of giving it to you. Bourgeois, why so? For the sake of my own pleasure and having some lines from him, now that he has gone from me. Well, if it was only for that reason, knew no, that was not very important. He smiled. Ah, Rakhmetov, you want to tease me. So this note is going to serve as another quarrel between us, is it, he said, laughing again. If that is the case, I shall take it away from you and burn it up. You know that it is said about such people as you and me, that we consider nothing holy, for we are capable of all murderous deeds of violence. But how is it? May I continue? They both grew a little more subdued. She, on account of having seen the note, he, because he had been sitting a few minutes in silence while she was kissing it. Yes, I am obliged to listen. He did not notice that which he ought to have noticed, continued Rakhmetov in a calm tone of voice, and this brought about bad consequences. But if he could not be blamed for not having noticed it, still he could not be excused for it either. Let us suppose that he did not know that this was bound unavoidably to arise from the very nature of the given relations between your character and his. Still he ought, at all events, to have given you some preparation for something of the kind simply as a thing that might happen which is not desirable and which it is not necessary to expect but which still may arise no one can guarantee what occurrences the future may bring this axiom that there are a good many contingencies he certainly knew how did he leave you in this state of mind that when this happened you were not prepared for it the very fact that he did not foresee it resulted only from neglectfulness which was insulting to you but in itself is a matter of no importance not a bad one not a good one that he did not prepare you at all for any such event came about from a very very bad motive of course he acted unconsciously but a man's nature is betrayed in those things which are done unconsciously to prepare you for it would have been contradictory to his interests but if you had been prepared, your resistance to the feeling which was contradictory to his interests would have been less violent. There was always such a strong feeling in you that the most energetic resistance on your part was useless, but it is a matter of mere chance that the feeling appealed in such a strength. If it had been caused by a man less deserving, but still a decent man, it would have been weaker. Such strong feelings, against which all struggles are useless, are rare exceptions many more are the chances for the appearance of feelings which it is possible to conquer if the strength of the resistance is not weakened entirely now for these most likely chances he did not want to weaken your powers of resistance and this is the motive that he had in leaving you unprepared and subjecting you to so much suffering how does this strike you it is not true rakhmetov he has never hidden from me any of his thoughts 
His convictions were as well known to me as they were to you. Of course, Vi^ra Pavlovna, to hide them would have been too much. To interfere with the development of your convictions, so as to gratify his own convictions, and for this reason, to make believe think differently from what he really thinks, this would have been an absolutely dishonorable thing. Such a man you could never love. Did I call him a bad man? He was a very good man. In what respect was he not good? Yes, I shall praise him to your heart's content. I only say that before this matter arose, after it arose, he behaved towards you very nobly. But before it arose, he acted unkindly towards you. Why did you torment yourself so? He said, and then there was no need of saying it because it was self-evident, that you did it so that you might not grieve him. How could this thought have occurred to you that this would greatly grieve him? You ought not to have had such an idea. What kind of grief was that? It was stupid. What kind of jealousy is that? Don't you recognize such a thing as jealousy, Rachmatov? In an intelligent person it has no right to exist. It is a mutilated feeling. It is a false feeling, a contemptible feeling. It is the result of that order of things according to which I don't allow anybody to wear my underclothes, smoke my meerschaum. This is the result of viewing a person as personal property, as a chattel. But Rachmatov, if jealousy should not be acknowledged, then there would be a horrible state of things. For him who feels it there are horrible things, but for the one who does not feel it there is nothing horrible or even important. But you are advocating an absolute immorality, Rachmatov does it seem to you so after living with him four years in this respect he is to blame how often do you dine every day once would anybody be offended if you dined twice of course not then why don't you do so is it because you are afraid of offending someone in all probability it is simply because you do not need it because you do not care to but a dinner is an agreeable thing but reason and principally the stomach says that one dinner is agreeable and the second may be disagreeable but if you have a fancy or a morbid desire to dine twice a day would you have been kept from it by your fear of offending somebody no if any one were offended or forbade you to do it you would only do it secretly you would begin to eat the dishes in a bad style you would soil your hands by your hurried seizing of the food you would soil your dress by hiding victuals in your pockets and that's all the question here has nothing whatsoever to do with morality or immorality but only whether the contraband is a good thing who has the idea that jealousy is a feeling worthy of respect and mercy that the feeling says ach when i do this i shall offend him and whom does it compel to suffer vainly in the strife only a few of the most noble for whom it is impossible to fear that their nature would draw them into immorality for the rest are not restrained by this nonsense but are simply driven to be cunning deceitful that is it makes them really bad that is all is this not well known to you of course it is now how henceforth can you find any moral advantage in jealousy yes but we ourselves always used to speak together in this spirit probably not absolutely in this sense of the word or you spoke words but did not believe each other when you heard these words on each other's tongue and of course you really did not believe because you constantly heard about other subjects and maybe this very subject words in a different sense else why should you have suffered so long god knows how long and for what reason and from what nonsense what a great rumpus how much trouble for all three and particularly for you vira pavlovna meantime you all three might have lived together very calmly just as you did afterwards for a year or somehow you might have arranged to move into one apartment or to have arranged it otherwise however it might happen only without the least trouble in accordance with your former style to drink tea all three together and as before to go to the opera all three together why then this suffering why this catastrophe all this because there was left in your mind thanks to his bad method of preparing you for it the thought i am killing him which was entirely a fancy yes he caused you entirely too much worriment no rachmatov you are speaking terrible things again terrible things terrible to me are the awful sufferings from trifles and unnecessary catastrophes and so then according to your view all our history is a stupid melodrama yes an entirely unnecessary melodrama 
with an entirely unnecessary tragedy and for the fact that instead of a simple conversation of the calmest tenor arose an exciting melodrama dmitri sergeitch is to blame his honest style of action in regard to it is hardly sufficient for covering his fault in not averting this melodrama by preparing you and himself for very calm views in regard to all this as a mere piece of nonsense for which it is not worth while to drink one glass of tea more or not to finish your glass of tea he was very much to blame no but he has paid dearly enough for it drink one more glass of sherry and go to bed i have now reached the final purpose of my call it is already three o'clock if no one wakes you you will sleep very long and i told masha not to wake you before half-past ten so that to-morrow you will hardly have time enough to drink your tea you will have to hurry to the railroad station if you do not have time to put away all the things it will not make any difference for you will either return soon or they will send them to you what do you think is best to be done shall alexander matveitch go after you or will you return by yourself it would be hard for you and masha now for it would not do for her to notice that you are entirely calm and how could she notice it during the half an hour of hasty preparation mirtsalova would be a great deal worse but i will go to see her early in the morning and tell her that she had better not come here because you have not slept much and you ought not to be wakened but that she had better go straight to the station how much care you take for me said vira pavlovna don't at least describe this to him it is of my own accord but except that which i reproach him for as regards the thing of the past to his own face i told him more things and more emphatically except the fact that he was entirely to blame for the arising of this vain suffering he behaved like a hero end of part three chapter thirty Recording by Expatriate in Bangor, Maine. Part 3, Chapter 31 of A Vital Question, or What is to be Done, by Nikolai Chernyshevsky. Translated by Nathan Haskell Dole, 1852-1935, to 1935, and others. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain recording by expatriate in bangor maine part three marriage and second love chapter thirty one a colloquy with a sapient reader and his banishment now tell me o oh sapient reader why rakhmatov was introduced who has now vanished and will not appear again in my story i have already told thee that this figure has no part in my story that is not true says the sapient reader interrupting me akhmatov is an important character for he brought a note from which thou art very poor my dear sir in aesthetical judgments of which thou art so fond say i interrupting him in my turn at this rate according to your opinion then masha also is an important character is she not at the very beginning of the story she also brought a letter which startled vira pavlovna and is rachel also an important character for she advanced the money without which vira pavlovna would not have been able to leave and is professor n an important character because he recommended vira pavlovna to mrs b without which there would not have been any scene on returning from the konogvardoisky boulevard possibly the konogvardoisky boulevard is an active character also how is it because without it there wouldn't have been any stage for the interview while returning from it and the gorokovaya street would certainly be the most important main character because without it there would be no houses standing on it and so storeshnikov's house would not be there consequently there would be no manager of it and the manager would not have any daughter and then there would be no story at all well let us grant that according to your opinion all of these are active characters the konogvardaisky boulevard and masha and rachel and the gorokovaya street but only half a dozen words are said about them or even less because their action is of such a nature that they are not worth more than half a dozen words but see how many pages have been given to rakhmatov ah now i know says the sapient reader rakhmatov was introduced for the sake of pronouncing the sentence on vira pavlovna and lopukhov he was necessary for the talk with vira pavlovna oh how dull you are my dear sir you are quite wrong in your judgment was it necessary to introduce an extraordinary man 
just for the purpose of telling his opinion about other people for such necessities maybe your great artist may introduce people into their works and take them away again but i though i am a wretched writer still somewhat better understand the conditions of the artistic no my dear sir rachmatoff is not at all necessary for this purpose how many times have not vera pavlovna lopukhov and kirsdnof by themselves expressed the opinion about their actions and relations they are not stupid people they are able to judge for themselves what is good and what is bad and therefore for this do not need a prompter you really think that vera pavlovna herself when at leisure after a few days would remember the past confusion and not condemn her forgetfulness about the interests of the shop just as rachmatoff had done and don't you think that lopukhov himself thought about his relations in exactly the same way as rachmatoff told vera pavlovna he had thought it all over honourable people themselves think about themselves all that can be said to their discredit and so my dear sir these are honourable people didn't you know it you are very ignorant my dear sir in regard to what honourable people think about themselves i shall tell you further do you really suppose that rachmatoff in this conversation with vera pavlovna acted independently of lopukhov no my dear sir he was only a tool for lopukhov and he himself understood that he was only lopukhov's tool and vera pavlovna understood it also in a day or two and she would have guessed at the very moment that rachmatoff opened his mouth had she not been too much excited that was really the state of things did not you really understand it of course lopukhov in his second note said very truly that he had not spoken a word to rachmatoff nor rachmatoff to him in regard to the character of the conversation to take place between vera pavlovna and rachmatoff but lopukhov knew rachmatoff very well and what rachmatoff thinks about a certain matter and what rachmatoff would say in regard to this certain matter for honourable people understand each other without having any explanation beforehand lopukhov might have written down beforehand almost every word that rachmatoff was going to say to vera pavlovna and therefore that was the very reason that he asked rachmatoff to be the mediator shall i not introduce you a little deeper into psychological mysteries lopukhov very well knew everything which rachmatoff and he himself thought about himself and what mertsalov thought and what mrs mertsalova thought and what the officer who wrestled with him at the picnic on the islands thought and what vera pavlovna would come to think about him even if no one had told her about it she would have quickly seen it as soon as the first access of gratefulness had passed consequently lopukhov calculated i shall lose nothing by sending rachmatoff to her though he will blame me for she herself would surely come to have just the same opinion of me on the contrary i shall rise in her estimation for she will soon come to see that i foresaw rachmatoff's conversation with her and that i arranged for this conversation and why i arranged it and so she will think what a splendid fellow he is he knew that in the first days of my excitement my gratefulness towards him would overwhelm me with its exaltations and he took care that in my mind should enter as soon as possible thoughts which would make my trial easier for me and i understood that in reality rachmatoff spoke the truth i myself should have come to that idea in a week but by that time it would not be important to me for i should have found peace without it and for the reason that these thoughts were expressed to me the very first day i got rid of my mental burden which i should otherwise have borne a whole week that day these thoughts were very important for me and useful for me yes he was a very noble man this was a game that lopukhov arranged and rachmatoff was only his tool do you see my dear sir o oh, sapient reader how cunning these noble people are and how egotism plays with them not as with you my dear sir because they find satisfaction not as you do my dear sir they as you see find their highest satisfaction in having the people whom they respect think about them as noble people and for this reason my dear sir they took trouble to play all kinds of games not less energetically than you do for your own private ends but your aims are different and therefore the games that you and they bring about are not of the same character you think of mean things which are injurious for others but they think of those which are advantageous for others now how do you dare to treat me in such a way exclaims the sapient reader addressing me i shall bring a lawsuit against you for this i shall proclaim you an unreliable man have mercy my dear sir i reply 
I dare to tell you such things because I have such lofty respect for your character, as well as for your brains, and I only have the audacity to enlighten you in regard to the artistic of which you are so fond. You are mistaken in regard to this, my dear sir, in supposing that Rakhmatov was introduced purposely for announcing the sentence upon Vera Pavlovna and Lopukhov. There was no such necessity in the thoughts which you expressed about them. There is nothing of the kind which I could not have imparted to you, my dear sir, as the thoughts of Lopukhov in regard to himself, and as thoughts which without Rakhmatov, Vera Pavlovna herself would have had about Lopukhov. Now, my dear sir, here is a question for you. Why do I relate to you this conversation between Rakhmatov and Vera Pavlovna? Do you understand now that if I am imparting to you not the thoughts of Lopukhov and his Vera Pavlovna, but the conversation between Rakhmatov and Vera Pavlovna, then why it was necessary to impart not only these thoughts, which constituted the essence of their conversation, but the conversation itself? Why was it necessary to impart to you this conversation? because it was a conversation between Rakhmatov and Vera Pavlovna. Do you understand now? Not yet? Ah, oh, you're a fine fellow. You are bad as far as understanding goes, very bad. Nu, no, I am going to chew it for you. When two people speak, then from the conversation can be gathered, to a greater or less degree, the character of these two people. Now, do you see where this is leading you? Was Vera Pavlovna's character sufficiently known to you before this conversation took place? It was. You have learned nothing new about her. You knew already that she was hot-tempered, that she was fond of jesting, that she never failed to eat with appetite, and could even drink a glass of sherry. Consequently, the conversation was not needed to characterize Vera Pavlovna. But whom, then? There are two who speak, she and Rakhmatov. It is not to characterize her guess then who it is rakhmatov exclaims the sapient reader well you are a fine fellow and i like you for it so you see that it is entirely contrary to what you thought before rakhmatov was not introduced for the sake of carrying on the conversation but the conversation was imparted to you for the sake of making you better acquainted with rakhmatov from this conversation you saw that rakhmatov would like to drink sherry though he does not take it that Rakhmatov is not an absolutely gloomy monster, that on the contrary, on pleasant occasions, he forgets his sorrowful humors, his burning grief, that then he jokes and talks gaily, although he says it is very rarely that I do it, and he says that it is bitter to me that I do it so rarely. He says I myself am not glad that I am such a gloomy monster, but my circumstances are such that a man with such a burning love for the good cannot help being a gloomy monster and if it were not for this he says i should probably joke and laugh and sing and leap all day have you understood now sapient reader that although a good many pages have been devoted to the fair description of the sort of man that rakhmatov was yet in reality still more pages have been devoted exclusively for the same purpose of making you acquainted with the very same person who is not at all an active character in my novel tell me now why this figure was brought out and introduced and so minutely described do you remember i said then it is exclusively for satisfying the main demand of the artistic think how does it seem and how is it satisfied by placing before you rakhmatov's figure was it hard for you have you succeeded in finding out and yet how could you well listen or rather don't listen you will not understand it leave me alone i have amused myself enough at your expense i am going to speak now not to you but the public and i am going to speak seriously the first demand of the artistic is this it is necessary so to picture things that the reader may see them in their true light for example if i want to draw a picture of a house then i must reach that excellence of drawing that it may look to the reader as a house only not as a little hut or as a palace if i want to picture an ordinary man that i must be able to draw him in such a way that he will not appear to the reader either as a dwarf or as a giant i wanted to picture ordinary decent people of the rising generation people whom i meet by the hundreds i took three such people vera pavlovna lopukhov and kirsanov i look upon them as ordinary people they look upon themselves in the same way and all their acquaintances and friends who are also such people as they are look upon them in the same way 
where have i spoken about them in any other spirit what have i said about them that contradicted this i introduced them with love and respect because every honourable man is worthy of love and respect but where have i bowed on my knees before them where does the least shadow of a thought show itself in my novel that they are god knows how high and beautiful characters that i can imagine nothing higher and better than they are that they are ideals of people as i think of them so they act for me not more than ordinary honourable people of the rising generation what do they do that is wonderful they don't do any mean things they are not cowards they have ordinary honest convictions they try to act in accordance with them and that's all what a heroism in reality yes i wanted to represent people who act like ordinary people of their type and i hope that i have succeeded in so doing those readers who accurately know live people of this type i hope have constantly seen from the very first that the main heroes of my story are not at all ideals but are people not at all higher than the general level of people of their own type that every one of my readers who belongs to their type has undergone two or three occurrences in which he has acted not worse than my characters have acted let us suppose that other honourable people have had exactly such experiences as i have related in this there is absolutely no going to extremes and the idea that all wives and husbands should part is not presented as a charming ideal for not every honourable woman feels a passionate love for her husband's best friend and not every honourable man wrestles with passion for a married woman and for three years at that and moreover not everybody is driven to commit suicide on the bridge or to use the words of the sapient reader to go away somewhere from that hotel but no honourable man would consider it a heroic deed to act in the situation of those here described exactly as they acted but all would be ready to do if there were any necessity for doing it and many a time they have acted in situations not less but probably more difficult but still have not looked upon themselves as extraordinary people but each has said to himself i am a commonplace man a pretty honourable man that's all there is of it and the good friends of such a man all such good people as he himself is for with others he has nothing to do in the way of friendship also think in regard to him that he is a fine man but they do not think of falling on their knees before him but they say to themselves we are just such people as he is i hope i have succeeded in reaching this point that every honourable man of the rising generation will recognise an ordinary type of his good acquaintance in my three principal characters but these people who from the very first beginning of my story will think about my vera pavlovna kirsdnof and lopukhov well now these are my good acquaintances simple ordinary people like ourselves people who think so i say about my three leading characters constitute the minority of the public the majority is a great deal lower than this type a man who never saw anything but little huts would take an ordinary house drawn upon a piece of paper to be a palace how can you go to work with such a person to show him that it is a house and not a palace it is necessary on the same paper to draw at least a small corner of a palace by this corner he will see that the palace must be something of quite different proportions from the structure which was represented on the paper and that this structure must be only a simple ordinary house in which or even in better ones every one ought to live had i not shown rakhmatov's figure the majority of my readers would have lost their senses of proportion in regard to the main characters of my story i will wager that till the last part of this chapter vera pavlovna kirsdnof and lopukhov have seemed to the majority of the public as heroes as persons of the highest nature as even persons idealized maybe people such as it is not possible to find in real life on account of their too grand nobility no my friends my mean bad pitiful friends it did not appear to you in the right way it is not they that stand so high but you that stand so low now you see that they are standing on the earth if they appear to you flying in the clouds it is because you are sitting in the bottom of a den on the height upon which they stand all people can stand and must the highest natures which you and i cannot attain my pitiable friends are different i have shown you a slight sketch of the profile of one of them you see very different features but those people who are completely described you can reach unto if you want to work over your self-development 
whoever is lower than they are is low lift yourselves up my friends lift yourselves up it is not very hard go out into the free white world it is good to live in it and the path is easy and inviting try it culture culture observe think read the works of those who tell you about the pure enjoyments of life about the fact that a man can be kind and happy read them they are books which fill the heart with joy observe life for it is interesting to observe think for it is delightful to think that is all no sacrifices are required no deprivations are asked they are not necessary desire to be happy that is all only this desire is wanted and for this sake with delight watch over your development there is happiness in it oh what an enjoyment there is for a fully developed man even that which another may look upon as a sacrifice as a sorrow he feels to be a satisfaction to himself an enjoyment and how open his heart is to happiness and how many enjoyments he has try it it is good end of part three recording by expatriate in bangor maine part four chapter one a of a vital question or what is to be done by nikolai chernyshevsky translated by nathan haskell dole eighteen fifty two to nineteen thirty five and others this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by expatriate in bangor maine part four second marriage chapter one a berlin july twentieth eighteen fifty six much esteemed lady vira pavlovna my close relationship with the late dmitri sergeyitch lopukov gives me the hope that you will kindly include in the number of your acquaintances a person who is an absolute stranger to you but who deeply respects you at all events i venture to think that you will not accuse me of imposing upon you by entering into correspondence with you i only fulfil the desire of the late dmitri sergeyitch and those tidings which i am going to impart about him you can look upon as absolutely true because i shall speak of his thoughts in his own language as though he were speaking himself and here are his words about a matter the explanation of which is the aim of my letter the thoughts which brought the conclusion so disturbingly to the people nearest to me i am quoting dmitri sergeyitch's original words as i said before gradually grew in my mind and my mind was changed several times before it reached its ultimate development the circumstance which caused these thoughts came under my observation in an entirely unexpected way only at the moment when she dmitri sergeyitch means you with fear told me about a dream which horrified her the dream appeared to me very significant and as a man who was accustomed to look upon the state of her feelings from without i understood at that very moment that an episode was beginning in her life which within a longer or shorter time would change our relations but a man tries till the very last to preserve the situation to which he has become accustomed in the depths of our nature lies a conservative element from which we yield only out of necessity this according to my opinion contains the explanation of my first supposition i wanted to think and i succeeded in thinking that this episode might pass away after some time and then our former relations would be restored she wanted to avoid the very episode by kindling the warmest friendship this deceived me and for several days i did not think it impossible for her hope to be realized soon i became convinced however that to hope for this would be in vain the reason for this lies in my own character i do not intend to stain my character by saying this this is my idea of it to a man who spends his life as he ought his time is divided into three parts labor enjoyment and rest or recreation enjoyment needs rest as much as labor does in labor and in enjoyment the general nature of a man takes precedence over his other personal peculiarities in work we act under the predominating external stimulus of rational necessities in enjoyment under the predominating stimulus of other necessities also common to the whole human race rest or recreation is an element in which a person seeks restorement of strength after this stimulus 
which exhausts the reserves of life materials an element which is brought into life by the person himself here a person wants to give himself up to his own peculiarities to his own individual comfort in labor and in enjoyment people are drawn to people by a general mighty power which is more influential than their personal peculiarities by the calculation of profit in labor and enjoyment by equal demands of the organism rest is different this is not a thing that belongs to that general power which softens down personal peculiarities rest is more of a personal thing here nature demands for itself more room here a person becomes more individualized and the character of a person shows itself from the kind of rest which appears more agreeable and more easy for him in this regard people are divided into two categories for those of the one rest or recreation is more agreeable than the society of others everybody must have seclusion for them it must be an exception as a rule life must be spent with others this class is far more numerous than the other which must have the contrary while alone they feel much more comfortable than in the society of others this difference is noticed by the common opinion which is expressed by the words a social man and a reserved man i belong to those who are not social she to those who are social that is the whole secret of our history it is apparently clear that in this cause there is nothing reprehensible in either one of us nor is the fact reprehensible that neither one of us had the strength to remove the cause against his own nature man is weak it is very hard for any one to understand the nature of others every one measures the characters of everybody else by his own peculiarities whatever i do not want according to my opinions others will not want so we are led to think by our individuality exceedingly noticeable signs are required to make me realize the contrary and on the other hand whatever affords me comfort and ease i must think that others like the naturalness of this arrangement of ideas is my excuse in the fact that i recognize too late the difference between my nature and hers the mistake was greatly aided by the fact that after we came to live together she placed me too high there was never any equality between us but she showed me a great respect my style of life seemed to her exemplary she took for a universal human feature any peculiarity of mine and for a time she was drawn away by it there was another cause a stronger one still among uncultured people the sanctity of the inner life is but very little respected every one of the family particularly among the elders will thrust his paw without any ceremony into the very depths of your soul the trouble is not in the fact that your secrets are interfered with secrets of greater or less importance you are careful to hide or to watch and then not all have them a great many have absolutely nothing to hide from nearest friends but every one wants that in his inner life there should be a little corner where nobody has a right to enter just as every one wants to have his own separate room for himself alone uncultured people regard neither of these things if you have a separate room everybody goes to it not from a desire to act the spy or to impose upon you but simply because there is no thought that this may disturb you that may occur to them only in case there has been some disturbance between you when you might have no desire to see them appearing before you quite unexpectedly they do not understand that they may disturb you even though you may be kindly inclined to them the sanctity of the threshold over which no one has a right to step without the permission of the person living on the other side is recognized only in one room that is the room belonging to the head of the family because the head of the family can turn everybody out of his room who enters without asking permission into all the others everybody who is older or contemporary with them enters without asking the same which is true in regard to the room can be applied to your inner life into it everybody intrudes without any necessity even without any thought in search of any amusement and more often than not simply to scratch his tongue on your soul a girl has two everyday dresses one white and one pink she puts on the pink one and here comes a chance for someone to rub tongue over her soul you put on the pink dress anyuta what for anyuta herself does not know why she put it on it was necessary to put on some kind of a dress 
and then again if she had put on the white one it would have amounted to the same thing so mamenka or sister says but you would have done better to put on the white one but why it would be better the one who gives the advice does not herself know she simply rubs her tongue you don't look very happy today anyuta what's the matter anyuta is neither happy nor unhappy however why shouldn't they ask after what they neither see nor don't see i don't know there's nothing the matter that i know of no you seem to be rather unhappy two minutes passed anyuta you had better sit down at the piano and play us a tune there is no reason why and so it goes the whole day your soul is like a street on which everybody who sits at the window is looking not for the sake of seeing anything in particular no they even know that they will see nothing useful and nothing curious but simply because they have nothing else to do but it's all the same so then why not look for a street of course it makes no difference but people have no pleasure at all from people walking over them naturally this imposition without any aim or idea whatever must bring a reaction and as soon as a person places himself in such a situation that he can have seclusion he for some time finds pleasure in such seclusion though by nature he may be inclined to sociability and not to seclusion she in this regard till she was married was placed in a singularly hard position they walked on her they intruded into her very soul not simply because they had nothing else to do accidentally occasionally and only out of indelicacy but systematically without cessation every minute too coarsely too impudently they pushed their way in like savages and with mean intentions they forced themselves not simply with unceremonious hands but with very hard and very dirty hands and therefore the reaction was very strong therefore my mistake should not be severely judged several months and maybe a year i was not mistaken seclusion was really necessary and pleasant for her and during this time i formed an opinion about her character this strong temporary demand of hers corresponded with my constant demand and is it to be wondered at that i took a temporary phenomenon for a constant feature of her character and is everybody so much tempted to judge of others by his own standard the mistake was very great i do not blame myself for it but i want to put myself in the right light that means i feel that others will not be as indulgent to me as i am towards myself to modify their condemnation i must say a few words more about that side of my character which is entirely strange to her and to a good many other people and which without explanations may not be rightly understood my only idea of rest is seclusion to be with others means to occupy my mind with something to work or to enjoy myself i feel myself entirely at liberty only when i am alone by myself how shall i name it why is it with some it comes from reserve with others from bashfulness with still others from a melancholy and thoughtful disposition and with a fourth class from a lack of sympathy with others but it seems to me that there is nothing of the kind in me i am frank and straightforward i am always ready to be gay and i am never melancholy to observe people is pleasant for me but this is connected in my mind with the idea of work or enjoyment and that is something which demands rest after it that is in my way of looking at it seclusion so far as i can understand it is a peculiar development in me a drawing towards independence and freedom and thus the strength of the reaction against her former too troublesome situation in her family compelled her for a time to adopt a style of life which did not correspond to her constant disposition respect towards me kept alive in her this temporary disposition longer than it would have been by itself but i long before had formed my opinion of her character i took this temporary feature to be a constant one and thus i was at ease and that is the whole story on my side it was a mistake but there was very little that was blameworthy in this mistake on her part there was absolutely nothing but how much suffering did it not cause her and what a catastrophe it brought upon me after her fear caused by the terrible dream disclosed to me the state of her feelings it was too late to correct my fault but if i had we had noticed it before then maybe by constant efforts over ourselves she and i might have succeeded in bringing our relations into a situation forever satisfactory for us both could we 
I do not know. But I think that even if we had succeeded, it would not have been particularly advantageous. Let us suppose that we had remodeled our characters sufficiently for our relations to each other to be free from all burdensomeness. But then the remodeling of characters is only good when it is directed against some bad side. But those sides which she and I would have had to remodel had nothing bad in them. Why should sociability be better or worse than a disposition to seclusion, or vice versa? But the remodeling of a character is, at all events, the forcing of it, the breaking of it. And in the breaking of a thing there is a great deal that is lost. In the force of a thing much energy is wasted. The result which she and I maybe, only maybe, not surely, had reached was not worth the loss. We both would have partly spoiled our individuality, would both have destroyed the freshness of our lives. For what end? Only for the sake of preserving certain places in certain rooms. It would have been quite a different thing if we had had children. Then it would have been necessary to think deeply as to the change in their fate if we separated. If the change would be for the worse, then the removal of the cause would have been worth the most desperate efforts, and the result would have been happiness for we should have accomplished what was necessary for the preservation of the greatest happiness of those whom we loved and such a result would have compensated for all our efforts but as it was what rational end was to be gained therefore as it happened my mistake apparently led to something better owing to it both of us had less breaking of our natures to endure it brought a great deal of worriment but if it had not happened surely there would have been a great deal more and moreover the result would have been far more unsatisfactory end of part four chapter one a recording by expatriate in bangor maine part four chapter one b of a vital question or what is to be done by nikolai chernyshevsky translated by nathan haskell dole eighteen fifty two to nineteen thirty five and others this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by expatriate in bangor maine part four second marriage chapter one b such were dmitri sergeitch's words from the energy with which he expressed himself so far you can easily see that he as he himself said felt something embarrassing in it and unprofitable to himself he straightway added i feel that i shall not be entirely justified in the opinion of those who review this matter without any sympathy for me but i am sure of her sympathy she will judge about me even more kindly than i myself and i consider myself entirely in the right such is my opinion of the time until she had the dream and now i am going to tell you how he felt and what he intended to do after you had the dream which revealed to him the unsatisfactory nature of your relations i said these again are dmitri sergeitch's own words that from the first words about her terrible dream i understood the unavoidableness of some episode different from our former relations i expected it would have a mighty power for it was impossible otherwise from the energy of her nature and by the former state of her dissatisfaction which had already acquired great strength from a too prolonged restraint still the expectation at first appeared in a form very easy and profitable for me i reasoned thus she will be drawn away for a time by a passionate love for somebody else a year or two will pass and she will return to her old allegiance i am a very decent man her chances of finding another man like me are rare i speak about myself just exactly as i think i have no hypocritical fashion of depreciating myself a feeling of love satisfied will lose a portion of its force she will see that though one part of her nature is less satisfied by living with me yet in the general sum of existence life with me will be easier and freer than with any other and everything will be restored to its former state i taught by experience shall be more attentive to her she will acquire new respect for me she will be more warmly attached to me than before and we shall live more happily than ever but and this thing though the explanation of it is very embarrassing for me must nevertheless be said but how did the prospect of our relationship being renewed appear to me did it make me happy of course it did but did it bring only happiness 
no it appeared to me as a burden a pleasant burden but still a burden i love her very very dearly and i shall easily break myself in so as better to attend to her this will afford me pleasure but still my life will be trying thus it came over me after i regained my calmness after the first impression and i saw that i was not mistaken she allowed me to experience this when she wanted me to act so as to preserve her love a month in which i satisfied this desire of hers was the most burdensome month of my life there was no pain in it such a word would hardly apply to the idea it would be absurd here as far as positive sensations are concerned i experienced nothing but pleasure while pleasing her but it was tiresome to me here is where the mystery lies that her attempt to retain her love for me remained a failure i was tired while pleasing her at first sight it may seem strange why i did not feel tired of giving up numberless evenings to the students for whom of course i would not put myself out seriously and why i felt such a degree of weariness when i gave up only a few evenings to a woman whom i loved more than myself for whom i would be ready not only to die but to endure every imaginable torture this may seem strange but only for one who cannot appreciate my motives in having intimate relations with the young men to whom i devoted so much time in the first place i had no personal relations with these young people when i was sitting with them i did not feel that i was in the presence of people but i saw only several abstract types who were only exchanging thoughts my talk with them varied but little from my own contemplations when alone here only one part of my nature was occupied and the very one which less than all others demanded rest thought everything else was sleeping and besides our talk had a practical useful aim the aiding the development of intellectual life nobility and energy in my young friends this was work but it was such an easy work that it was good for the restoration of strength expended by other kinds of labour it did not weary but refreshed and yet it was labour therefore my own person had no demands for taking rest there i expected to get benefit but not peace here i allowed all the other parts of my being to sleep except thought but my thought acted without any mixture of personal relations towards people with whom i was speaking therefore i felt as much liberty as though i had been alone these conversations i may say did not take me out of my seclusion here there was nothing analogous to those relations in which the whole man takes part i know how embarrassing it is to use the word weariness but my conscience does not allow me to keep it back yes with all my love to her i felt a great deal easier after i became convinced that between her and me relations could not comfortably be arranged as they had been before i gradually became convinced of this about the time that she began to notice that the fulfilling of this desire was going to be tiresome to me then the future appeared to me under a new form which was more agreeable to me after we saw that it would be impossible for us to remain in our former relations i began to think how soon it would be possible i must again use an embarrassing expression to get rid of it to free myself from a situation which had become burdensome to me here lies the secret of what must seem magnanimity to the man who might be willing to be blinded by acknowledgment of the outward appearances or even to one who would be so short-sighted as not to see the whole depth of the motives yes i simply wanted to get rid of an embarrassing situation as i am not hypocritical enough to deny what is good in me i shall also not deny that one of my motives was the desire for her good but this was only a secondary motive a very strong one to be sure yet it fell far behind the first the main one in strength that is the desire of getting free from weariness was the real prompter under its influence i began carefully to examine into her mode of life and easily perceived that in the change of her feelings which was the result of the change in her way of living the main part was played by alexander matvievitch in his appearance and disappearance this brought me to think about him i understood the reasons of his strange behaviour to which before i had paid no attention and after that my thoughts received a new form which as i have said already was agreeable to me after i saw that she had not only the desire for passionate love itself although she was as yet unconscious of it herself 
that this feeling was directed towards one who was absolutely worthy and generally speaking was absolutely able to fill my place that this man also loved her passionately then i became extremely glad it is true however that the first impression was very cruel every important change carries with it some pain i saw now that i could not conscientiously speaking look upon myself as a man necessary for her and i had become accustomed to this and to tell the truth it had been pleasant to me consequently the severance of this relation unavoidably had to have its painful side but only for the first part of the time and not for long this feeling predominated over the other feelings which were joyful in their nature now i was assured of her happiness and calm in the contemplation of her fate this was a source of great happiness but it would be vain to think that this constituted the main source of pleasure no personal feeling was once more much more important i saw that i became entirely free from compulsion my words do not imply that the life of a bachelor would be easier or happier for me than family life no if man and wife are not compelled to any kind of restraint for the sake of pleasing each other if they are content with each other without making effort if they satisfy each other without thinking of the satisfaction then the closer the relations between them are the freer and easier it is for both of them but the relation between her and me was not of this kind therefore to separate meant freedom for me from this can be seen that i have acted for my own interests after i decided not to interfere with her happiness there was a lofty side to my action but the motive power towards it was the inclination of my own nature to better myself alone therefore i had strength to act and i may say i acted well not to drift this way and that not to make unnecessary confusion and disturbance for others not to be false to my duty this was easy when the duty is the inclination of your own nature i left for riazan after some time she called me back saying that my presence would not interfere with her but i saw that it would still interfere so far as i can understand there were two reasons for it it was hard for her to see a man to whom she was exceedingly indebted according to her idea she was mistaken in this respect she was not in the least indebted to me because i acted much more for my own interests than hers but it appeared to her different and she felt a very deep gratefulness to me this feeling was hard there is a pleasant side to it but it predominates only when the feeling is not too strong when it is strong it is valid the second cause this again is a rather embarrassing thing to explain but i must say what i think i find the second cause in the fact that her relations to society were abnormal and unpleasant it was hard for her to endure the fact that society would not acknowledge formally her right to occupy such a position and so i saw that my existence near her would be trying for her i shall not hide that in this new discovery there was a side that was incomparably harder for me to endure that all feeling which i had experienced in the former stages of the case i had preserved towards her a very strong inclination i wanted to remain a very close and intimate friend of hers i hoped that this would be so and after i saw that this could not be i was greatly grieved and here there was no compensation for this grief in personal calculations of any sort whatever i may say that here my final decision was adopted exclusively because of my attachment to her only for the desire of making her better exclusively from unselfish motives consequently never before even in our happiest time did my relations toward her afford me such deep inward satisfaction as this decision here i acted under the action of what i frankly call nobility or to use a more suitable term noble calculation a calculation in which the general law of humanity acts exclusively by itself without borrowing support from individual peculiarities and here i learned what a great pleasure it is to find yourself acting like a noble man that is as every man ought to act not ivan or peter but every man every one without distinction of names what a lofty delight it is to feel yourself simply a man not ivan not peter but a man simply and purely a man this feeling is too strong ordinary natures like mine cannot endure too often an elevation to the height of this feeling 
but happy is the one who has had the chance to experience it there is no need of explaining that side of my mode of action which would have been most unreasonable in transactions with other people but which here is very obviously justified by the character of the person to whom i yield at the time when i left for riazan there had not a word passed between her and alexander matvitch at the time which i made my final decision there had not a word passed between him and me or between her and me on this subject but i knew him very well i had no need of studying his thoughts for the sake of learning them i am giving you dmitri sergeitch's words with liberal exactness as i have already said i am an entire stranger to you but the correspondence into which i enter with you fulfilling the desire of the late dmitri sergeitch bears such an intimate character that in all probability it will be interesting for you to learn who this strange correspondent is who is so initiated into the inner life of the late dmitri sergeitch i used to be a medical student and i have nothing more to tell you about myself during the last few years i have lived in petersburg several days ago i decided to travel and to create for myself a new career abroad i left petersburg on the second day after you learned about dmitri sergeitch's catastrophe on a certain occasion i had no documents in my possession and i had to take the papers belonging to a stranger with which i was furnished by one of our common friends he gave them to me on the condition that i should fulfil certain of his commissions on the way if you happen to see mr rachmatoff be kind enough to tell him that all his commissions have been fulfilled as he desired now i suppose i shall have to set out on my travels through germany observing the customs i have several hundred roubles and i want to have a good time when i shall get tired of idleness i shall look out for something no matter what when wherever chance may lead i am as free as a bird and i can be as unconcerned as a bird such a situation delights me it is very probable that you may like to honour me with an answer but i do not know where i shall be in a week from now maybe in england and maybe in prague i can go wherever fancy may lead me and where it will lead me i know not and therefore send your letters to the following address berlin friedrichstrasse twenty agentur von h schmeidler your envelope should contain another envelope on which in place of any address you will write the cipher twelve thousand three hundred forty five that will show schmeidler's agency that it should be forwarded to me accept honoured lady the assurance of deep respect from a man who is an entire stranger to you who is endlessly devoted to you and who signs himself a former medical student honoured sir alexander matvitch according to the desire of the late dmitri sergeitch i must send you the assurance that for him the best circumstance seemed the fact that he was compelled to leave his place to you but those relations which brought about this change relations which gradually formed in the course of three years from the time when you almost ceased coming to his house and therefore were formed without your aid exclusively from the lack of correspondence between the characters of the two people whom you afterwards tried in vain to reconcile with such relations the final scene which came was unavoidable evidently dmitri sergeitch could not feel right in blaming you of course this explanation is unnecessary however merely for form's sake he authorized me to make it thus it had to be either one way or the other either you or he had to take the place which he could not fill and which another could take only because dmitri sergeitch could not fill it and the fact that you took this place according to the opinion of the late dmitri sergeitch makes the best result that could be devised i press your hand a former medical student ah i know what is that a familiar voice i turn around there he is he himself the sapient reader who was not long ago banished in disgrace for not knowing a from b in regard to the artistic but here he is again and again with his former shrewdness again he knows something ah i know who wrote it but i hastily seize the first thing that comes most convenient for my purpose i seize a napkin because after i copied the former student's letter i sat down to breakfast and so i seize the napkin and stuff it in his mouth well keep what you know to yourself why do you shout it all over town
End of part four, chapter one. Recording by expatriate in Bangor, Maine. Part four, chapter two of a vital question or what is to be done by nikolai chernyshevsky translated by nathan haskell dole eighteen fifty two to nineteen thirty five and others this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by expatriate in bangor maine part four second marriage chapter two petersburg august twenty fifth eighteen fifty six dear sir you will understand what a degree of happiness your letter gave me with all my soul i thank you for it your intimacy with the late dmitri sergeyitch gives me the right to regard you as my friend allow me to use this appellation in every word which you quoted can be seen dmitri sergeyitch's character he was constantly seeking for the most secret causes of his actions and he took pleasure in describing them to his theory of egotism by the way this is the common custom of all of our society my alexander is also fond of analyzing his motives in exactly the same spirit if you had only heard how he explained his behavior towards me and dmitri sergeyitch in the course of three years you would learn if his words were to be taken literally that he did everything through egotistical calculation for his own pleasure and i long ago learned this custom it interests alexander and me a trifle less than it interested dmitri sergeyitch we agree with him entirely but he has a stronger drawing towards it yes if one were to hear us all three of us would be taken to be such egotists as the world has never seen and maybe this is true maybe there never were such egotists what think you yes it seems likely but besides this characteristic common to us three in dmitri sergeyitch's words there is another which belongs exclusively to his situation apparently the aim of his explanations was to give me peace not that his words lack sincerity no he would never say what he does not think but he brings out too strongly only that element of the truth which can calm me my friend i am very grateful for it but i too am an egoistka i shall tell you that he vainly worried over my peace of mind we justify ourselves much easier than we are justified by others and i to tell the truth do not consider myself in any way blameworthy before him i will say further i do not even feel that i owe him any gratefulness i prize his nobility oh how deeply but i know that he was noble not for my sake but his own for i when i was not false to him was not false not for his sake but for myself not because falsity would be injurious to him but to myself i said that i did not blame myself just as he did but just as he did i feel an inclination to justify myself according to his words which were very just this means i have a presentiment that others will not be as lenient as i am towards myself in exempting me from the blame of certain parts of my behaviour i do not feel any desire whatsoever to justify myself for that part of the affair in which he justified himself and on the contrary i want to justify myself for that part in which he had no need for giving justification in all that happened until i had my dream there was nothing for which anybody will blame me i am convinced but afterwards was not i the cause of the affair taking such a melodramatic course and brought about such a terrible catastrophe ought i not to have looked much more rationally on that change of relations which was unavoidable after my dream had for the first time revealed to me and dmitri sergeyitch his situation and mine the very evening of the day on which dmitri sergeyitch committed suicide i had a long talk with a formidable rakhmatov and what a kind tender-hearted man he is he told me god knows what horrible things about dmitri sergeyitch but if i repeated them in a friendly tone to dmitri sergeyitch instead of in the harsh as it were unfriendly tone which rakhmatov used well they may be true i suspect that dmitri sergeyitch understood well what rakhmatov was going to say to me and that this formed a part of his calculation yes at that time it was necessary for me to listen to it it calmed me greatly and whoever might have arranged for that talk i acknowledge my gratitude for it to you my friend but even the formidable rakhmatov had to acknowledge that in the last part of the affair 
Dmitri Sergeitch acted finely. Rakhmatov blamed him only for the first half, and for this he was justifying himself. I am going to justify myself, though nobody has told me that I was to blame for it. But for every one of us, I am speaking about you and our friends, about all our circle, there is a severer than even Rakhmatov, and this is our own conscience. Yes, I comprehend, my friend, that it would have been far easier for all concerned if I had looked at the matter more simply, and had not given to it a too tragical importance according to dmitri sergeitch's view it should have been put this way more strongly although there would have been no need of having recourse to a conclusion so theatrical and trying for all of us yet he was led to it only by the superfluous vehemence of my anxiety i understand how it must have seemed so to him although he did not charge you to put that view of it before me so much the more i appreciate his kind disposition towards me that it was not diminished even though he held such an opinion but just listen a moment my friend it is not entirely just it is not by any means unjust it was not from my fault it was not from my superfluous anxiety that the absolute necessity came upon dmitri sergeitch of examining into what he himself frequently called a trying situation true if i had not attributed an excessive importance to the change in our relations it might have been possible to escape the difficulty without the journey to riazan but he said that it was not trying for him and so there would not have been still greater misfortunes arising from my exalted views only the necessity of making way with himself was trying for dmitri sergeitch he explained the unavoidableness of this decision of his by two reasons i was suffering from an excessive feeling of gratitude towards him i was suffering because i could not enter into those relations with alexander which are demanded by the conditions of society in reality i was not thoroughly at ease i was oppressed by the situation until he made way with himself but he did not suspect the essential reason the thought that his appearance oppressed me with an excessive burden of gratitude was not absolutely true a person is very much inclined to seek for reasons which may lighten a trying situation and at the time when dmitri sergeitch saw the necessity of making way with himself this reason for it was no longer in existence my gratitude to him had long before been modified to such a degree that it became a pleasant feeling and only this reason was connected with my previous exalted view of the matter the other reason which dmitri sergeitch adduced the desire to give to my relations with alexander a character such as is recognized that reason had nothing to do with my view of the matter it resulted from the ideas of society i was powerless over it but dmitri sergeitch was entirely mistaken in thinking that his presence would have been hard for me on account of that reason no it might have been arranged otherwise even without the necessity of his committing suicide if it had been necessary and had been satisfactory to me our position had that rare peculiarity that all the three persons who were concerned in it were of equal strength if dmitri sergeitch had felt that alexander were his superior in intellect culture or character if while yielding his place to alexander he would through a superiority of mental strength if his refusal had not been from good will instead of the yielding of a stronger to a weaker then of course i should have had no cause to be burdened likewise if i had been in intellect or character much stronger than dmitri sergeitch if until my relations with alexander had received their full development he had been what has been well characterized by a story over which you will remember we were at one time all greatly amused the story of how two gentlemen met in the foyer of the opera engaged in conversation with each other took a fancy to each other and wanted to get better acquainted i am lieutenant so-and-so says the one introducing himself and i am the husband of madame tedesco said the other introducing himself if dmitri sergeitch had been the husband of madame tedesco then of course there would have been no necessity of his committing suicide he would have been under such subjection and humiliation and if he had been a noble man he would see in the fact of his humiliation nothing offensive to himself and all would be well but dmitri's relation towards me and alexander was in no respect analogous he was not a hair's breadth lower or weaker than either of us and we knew it and he knew it 
his concession was not the result of weakness oh not at all it was merely the result of his good will wasn't that so my friend you cannot deny it therefore in what situation did i find myself placed and this my friend contains the whole essence of the matter i saw myself in a situation of dependence on his good will and so my situation was trying to me and therefore he saw himself compelled to the heroic decision of putting himself out of the way yes my friend the cause of my feeling which compelled him to it lay much deeper than his explanation given in your letter the overwhelming weight of gratefulness was no longer in existence to satisfy the claims of society would have been easy in the way that dmitri sergeitch suggested yes the claims of society would never affect me living in my own little circle which is entirely free from such claims but i was still dependent upon dmitri sergeitch my situation had as its foundation only his good will and that was not self-existent and that was the reason why it was hard for me now judge you could this cause be removed by this view of a change in our relations or by the other the importance lay not in my views of it but in the fact that dmitri sergeitch was a man of independence who acted according to his own will though it was a good will yes my friend you know and you approve of my feeling i do not want to be dependent upon the good will of any one no matter who it may be though it were a man most devoted to me though i respected him though i might trust him as i do myself though i absolutely knew that he would always rejoice to do whatever i needed that my happiness was as dear to him as to myself yes my friend i do not need your assurance i know that you approve of it but after all why all this talk this self-analysis which reveals the most hidden motives of feelings which could not be penetrated by any one yet with me as with dmitri sergeitch this self-confession is made for my own benefit so that i might say i am not to blame here the matter depended on something that was beyond my control i make this remark because dmitri sergeitch was fond of such remarks i want to praise myself before you my friend but enough of this footnote perhaps the sapient reader will heartily agree you felt so much sympathy for me that you did not grudge spending several hours time in writing your long letter and oh how precious it was to me i see from this letter how diplomatically i have learned to write in a style like dmitri sergeitch's or yours yes from this and only from this i see how interesting it will be for you to know what happened to me after dmitri sergeitch took leave from me on his way to moscow with the intention of returning and disappearing after his return from riazan he saw that i was disturbed this disturbance was manifested only on his return while he was staying in riazan i to tell you the truth did not think about him much no not as much as you might suppose judging by what he saw after his return but when he left for moscow i saw that he had something particular in view it was noticeable that he wound up his business in petersburg it was evident that for a week he was waiting for their final issue in order to go and then how could it happen otherwise during the last days i noticed the melancholy in his face that face which was so clever at hiding mysteries i anticipated that something decisive was in prospect and when he took his place in the car i felt so sad so sad on the next day i was melancholy on the third day i got up still more oppressed and suddenly masha brought me a letter what a tormenting moment it was what a tormenting hour what a tormenting day you can imagine and so my friend now more than ever i know my attachment to dmitri sergeitch i myself did not realize that it was so powerful yes my friend i now know its strength you too know because you must certainly know that on that very day i decided to give up alexander all day i felt that my life was ruined poisoned forever can you imagine my childish exultation when i saw my kind friend's note which entirely changed the current of my thoughts you see how careful my expressions are i want you to be satisfied with me my friend you know all this because rakhmatov went to escort me to the train dmitri sergeitch and he were right in saying that it was necessary for me to leave petersburg for the accomplishment of the effect for the sake of which dmitri sergeitch did not scruple to leave me all day a prey to the most terrible tortures how thankful i am to him for this unmercifulness 
he and rakhmetof were also right in advising alexandr not to come to me nor to escort me but i had no necessity of going to moscow it was only necessary for me to go as far as moscow so i stopped at novgorod a few days later alexander came there and brought the documents in regard to dmitri sergeitch's suicide we were married a week after the suicide and we lived a month on the railroad in chudov so that alexander might be enabled to go three or four times a week to the hospital yesterday we returned to petersburg and here is the reason that i have been so long answering your letter it lay in masha's drawer and she had entirely forgotten about it and you must have thought god knows what at not having received an answer during all this time i salute you dear friend yours vera kirsonova i press your hand my dear but please don't write any compliments to me else i shall pour out before you my whole soul and a perfect flood of encomiums on your nobleness which would be the worst thing imaginable and do you know what i think does it not prove the presence of a pretty good amount of stupidity both in you and in me by writing each other only a few lines it seems as though it proved that both of us felt ourselves embarrassed however on my part it is excusable but what excuse have you but the next time we shall be able to argue freely and i shall write you a heap of news yours alexander kirsanov end of part four chapter two recording by expatriate in bangor maine part four chapter three of a vital question or what is to be done by nikolai chernyshevsky translated by nathan haskell dole eighteen fifty two to nineteen thirty five and others this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by expatriate in bangor maine part four second marriage chapter three these letters absolutely sincere were really somewhat warped as vira pavlovna herself noticed both correspondents of course were trying to diminish for each other the strength of the heavy shocks which they experienced oh these people are shrewd i have often heard from them that is from them and people of their stamp such things as made me laugh in spite of their pathetical assurances that such and such a thing was easy to endure of course i laughed when the assurances were made before me who was a stranger to them and talking with them in tete a tete and when the very same thing was said to a man who had to listen to it then i used to admit that such and such things were really trifles an honourable man is a most amusing creature i always used to laugh at all the honourable men with whom i was acquainted a most amusing creature even to the point of absurdity here let us take these letters i am partially used to tricks of this sort even while entertaining friendship with such gentlemen and ladies well but what effect can they have on a man who is inexperienced and as yet unspoiled as for instance the sapient reader the sapient reader already is clearing his mouth of the napkin and while shaking his head says immorality oh you are a fine fellow you have hit it i reply in praise of him well make me happy with another little word yes the author himself is an immoral man declares the sapient reader just see what things he approves of no my precious you are mistaken there are many things that i do not approve of here possibly i do not approve of any of it if you desire to hear the truth all this is too much idealized too ecstatic life is much simpler then you must be still more immoral must you not demands the sapient reader opening wide eyes of astonishment at the incomprehensible degree of immorality to which humanity has fallen in my personage much more immoral i say uncertain whether the sapient reader will accept it as truth or will ridicule it this correspondence lasted for three or four months actively on the part of kirsanov but carelessly and briefly on the part of their correspondent afterwards he entirely ceased to answer their letters and it could be seen by all that his sole idea was to impart to vira pavlovna and her husband thoughts of lopukhov which made up the long letter which he wrote first and after fulfilling this obligation he considered the further correspondence unnecessary after two or three of kirsanov's letters remained unanswered he understood it so and ceased to write end of part four chapter three recording by expatriate in bangor maine
part four chapter four of a vital question or what is to be done by nikolai chernyshevsky translated by nathan haskell dole eighteen fifty two to nineteen thirty five and others this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by expatriate in bangor maine part four chapter four vira pavlovna is resting on her soft lounge expecting her husband home to dinner from the hospital to-day she has been busying herself very little in the kitchen over the sweet additions to dinner she wanted to lie down even sooner so as to rest because she worked very hard this morning and it had been so for a long time and it will be so for a long time to come she has had much to do in the mornings here she is trying to establish another union shop in another part of the town vira pavlovna lopukova lived on the vasilievsky island vira pavlovna kirsanova lives on sergivskaya street because her husband had to have an apartment near the vinborsky side mrs mertsalova proved to be very capable in her management of the shop on the vasilievsky island and that was not to be wondered at for she and the members of the union had been very good friends after vira pavlovna returned to petersburg she saw that though she had to be at the shop it was only for short visits that if she continued to go there every day it was simply because she was drawn there by her attachment and that her friends liked to have her come perhaps for some time her calls did not prove to be useless since mertsalova at times found it necessary to consult with her but it took so little time and becomes continually more and more rare and soon mertsalova will gain so much experience that she will cease to need vira pavlovna yes even the first time after her return to petersburg that she was at the shop on the vasilievsky island she was more like a loving friend than an important factor what had she to do it is evident what it was necessary for her to start another shop in the new neighborhood where she lived at the other end of the city and so the new shop is established in one of the short streets which runs between Vasilnaya and sergievskaya streets there was much less bother with it than with the former the five girls who formed the fundamental staff came over from the old shop while new girls took their places the balance of the force was selected from among the good acquaintances of those seamstresses who worked in the other shop and that shows that everything was more than half prepared the aim and order of the shop were well known to all the members of the union and new girls entered the shop with the desire that the arrangement so slowly developed in the other shop should be immediately begun oh yes now the arrangement progresses tenfold quicker than before and there is three times less worriment but still there is a great deal of work and vira pavlovna is just as tired to-day as she was yesterday and the day before as she was two months ago only two months though half a year has passed since her marriage well it was necessary for her to enjoy a wedding festival and she enjoyed it long but afterwards she gave herself up to work yes she has been working hard to-day and now she is resting and she is thinking about many things and above all about the present it is full of all good it is so full of life that she has scarcely time to have recollections recollections will come later oh much later and not even in ten years nor perhaps in a score of years but later now it is not time for them and it will not be for many years to come but still she has a few even now seldom to be sure here for example she recollects something which seldom comes to her mind here is what she recollects end of part four chapter four recording by expatriate in bangor maine part four chapter five of a vital question or what is to be done by nikolai chernyshevsky translated by nathan haskell dole eighteen fifty two to nineteen thirty five and others this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by expatriate in bangor maine part four second marriage chapter five milenki i am going with thee but you have not your things ready milenki mine then i will go with you to-morrow if you do not want to take me to-day think it over consider it wait for my letter it will reach you to-morrow here she returns home how did she feel when she went home with masha 
how did she feel and think all the long way from the moscow railway station to the middle prospect she herself does not know so shocked was she by the abrupt turn in the affair twenty-four hours have not passed no in two hours it will be a full day since he found her letter in his room and now he is already gone how quick how sudden at two o'clock she had not anticipated anything of the sort he waited until she wearied by the excitement of the morning could no longer resist the power of sleep came in said a few words and in these few words there was an almost incomprehensible preface to what he meant and in what brief words he said what he meant he said i have not seen my old folks for a long time i am going to see them and they will be glad to have me come that was all and he left immediately and she hastened after him though when he came in he asked her to promise not to do it she hastened after him but where was he masha where is he where is he masha who was still putting away the things after the departure of the guests says dmitri sergeitch has gone out he said after he came out from your room i am going to take a walk and she had to go to bed and how could she go to sleep but she did not know that this was going to take place on the very morning which was now beginning to dawn he said that they would have abundant time to talk everything over and she had barely time to open her eyes before it was time to go to the railway station yes all this had flashed by her eyes as though nothing of the sort had happened to her as though someone had told her of something that happened to someone else only now while returning home from the railway station she came to herself and began to think what is the matter with me and what is going to happen to me yes she is going to riazan she is going it is impossible not to go but this letter what will be in that letter no why wait for the letter before deciding she knows what it will contain still she must postpone her decision till the letter comes why postpone it she will go yes she will go she thinks about it one hour she thinks two she thinks three four hours but masha was getting hungry and for the third time has summoned her to dinner and this time she commands her rather than summons her well this is another recollection poor masha how i compelled her to get hungry why did you wait for me masha why did not you have your dinner long ago without waiting for me how could i vera pavlovna and she thinks again for one hour two hours i am going yes i am going to-morrow i shall only wait for the letter because he asked me to but whatever may be written in it and i know what will be in it it does not make any difference what it says i shall go on this she thinks an hour two hours yes she deliberates it over an hour but does she deliberate over it two hours no though she thinks about it but she thinks five little words more he does not wish it and more and more she deliberates over these five little words and here the sun is already setting but she still thinks the same thoughts and above all the five little words and suddenly just at the very instant that the indefatigable masha was demanding that vira pavlovna should come out to tea at that very moment out from those five little words arise six little words i do not wish it either how well the indefatigable masha acted in coming in she drove away these six new little words but even the beneficent masha did not long succeed in driving away these six little words at first they did not dare to appear by themselves they sent in their place a refutation of themselves but i must go and they sent them for the sake of returning themselves under the cover of this refutation at one instant appeared with them their carrier he does not wish it and at that very instant these five little words changed into the six little words i do not wish it either and she goes over these thoughts for half an hour and in half an hour these five little words the six little words begin to work over according to their own will even the former words the most important words of all and from the three words most important of all i shall go grow four words not the same as before though they are the same but shall i go thus it is that words grow and transform themselves but here comes masha again i gave him a silver rouble vira pavlovna here it is written if he brings it at nine o'clock give him a silver rouble but if later give him half a rouble 
the conductor brought it vira pavlovna he came down on the evening train he said i did as i promised to make it quicker i took an izvoshchik the letter is from him yes she knows what is in the letter don't go but still she means to go she does not want to listen to this letter to him she intends to go she is going no there is something different in the letter here is something to which it is impossible not to listen i am going to riazan but not directly to riazan i have a great deal to do for the factory on the way besides moscow where i shall have to stay a week i shall have to stop at two towns this side of moscow and three on the other side before i reach riazan how long i shall stay at my various halting points i cannot tell you for the very reason that among other things i shall have to receive money from our mercantile correspondence and you know my dear friend yes it was in the letter my dear friend was used several times in the letter that i might see that he felt towards me as before that he had no ill towards me thinks vira pavlovna at that time i kissed those words my dear friend yes it was so my dear friend you know that when it is necessary to receive money you are often compelled to stay several days when you intended to stay only a few hours and so i really do not know when i shall be able to reach riazan by all probability not very soon she remembers this letter almost word for word what does it mean yes he has entirely deprived her of the possibility of clinging to him so as to preserve her relations to him what is left for her to do and her former words i must go to him change into the words no i must not see him and this him does not refer to the one of whom she was just thinking these words change all her former words and she thinks one hour she thinks two i must not see him and how and when did they succeed in changing but they have already changed into the words shall i really ever want to see him again no and when she falls asleep these words have changed into other words shall i really ever see him and where is the answer where is he gone and these again change yes they grow into the words shall i never see him again and when she falls asleep at daybreak she falls asleep with these same words shall i really never see him again and when she wakes late in the morning already instead of all other words only five words are wrestling with two i shall not see him i shall see him and thus passes the whole morning everything is forgotten in this struggle and the more powerful word no tries to conquer the little word yes it tackles it it clutches it i shall not see him and the little word glances aside and vanishes glances aside and vanishes yes i shall see him everything is forgotten everything is forgotten in the effort of the stronger word no to conquer the smaller one yes yes and it does conquer and it calls to its aid other little words so that the former little word may have no refuge no i shall not see him no i shall not see him yes now the stronger words hold firmly in their grasp the little word yes which has no refuge from them and they press it between them no i shall not see no i shall see him no i shall not see him but what is she doing now her bonnet was already on her head instinctively she looked at the mirror to see if her hair is in order yes in the mirror she saw that her bonnet is on straight and from these words which have grown together so firmly one remained and to this a new one was added no return no return masha don't expect me back to dinner i shall not dine at home to-day alexander matvitch has not returned yet from the hospital calmly replied stepan and how could he help speaking calmly with a phlegmatic lady in her appearance there is nothing out of the ordinary not very long ago she used to be here i did not think he was it's all right i will wait you need not tell him that i am here she unfolds some newspaper or other yes she can read she sees that she can read yes as long as there is no return as long as the decision is made she feels herself quite calm of course she can read little she scarcely read at all she looked at the room she began to put it in order as though she were its kozyaika of course she did not arrange it much scarcely at all but how calm she feels and she can read and she can occupy herself with something she noticed that the ashes had not been emptied from the ash-tray and that the tablecloth needed adjustment and that the chair was out of its place 
she is sitting and thinking there is no return no choice a new life is beginning she thinks an hour two hours a new life is beginning how surprised he will be how happy he will be a new life is beginning how happy we are a tinkling bell she flushed a little and smiled steps the door opens vira pavlovna my love i could not live without thee how long thou didst love me and said not a word how noble thou art how noble he is sasha tell me vierotchka how it happened i told him that i could not live without thee on the very next evening he had already gone i wanted to follow him i talked all day yesterday about following him but now thou seest that i have been here a long time but how thin thou hast grown these past two weeks vierotchka how pale thy hands are he kisses her hands yes my dear this has been a hard struggle now i can appreciate how much you suffered so as not to disturb my peace how could you be so self-possessed as to hide it from me how thou must have suffered no vierotchka it was not an easy task he still kisses her hands looking at them and suddenly she burst into laughter ach how inattentive i am to you you are tired sasha you must be hungry she frees herself from him and runs away where are you going vierotchka but she answers never a word but goes to the kitchen and hurriedly gaily says to stepan hurry up let us have dinner for two hurry up where are the plates and things let me have them i will set the table myself and you bring the victuals alexander is so tired from his hospital that we must give him something to eat she comes back with the plates and the knives forks and spoons rattle on the plates stepan puts the soup on the table at dinner she relates how it all happened stepan comes in with the last dish stepan seems to me that we shall not leave you any dinner yes vera pavlovna i shall have to buy something for myself in the little grocery store that's all right stepan henceforth you must know that you must prepare for two besides yourself and after she remembers all this vera pavlovna smiles and now how prosaic our story is tea was not over when we heard a terrible ringing of the bell and in came a couple of students and in their excitement they did not even notice her alexander matvyitch there is an interesting subject say they all out of breath it was brought just now a very rare complication it's very interesting alexander matvyitch and immediate help is wanted every moment is precious we even took an izvozchik to come here make haste my dear she says and here for the first time the students notice her they bow to her and at that very moment they hurry away their professor with them his preparations did not take very long he was still in his army coat and she hurried him away will you come right to me afterwards she asked as she said good-bye yes long she waits for him through the evening here it is ten o'clock and he hasn't come yet now it is eleven now there is no use waiting still what can be the reason she of course did not worry at all nothing could have happened to him but it shows how long he was detained by the interesting subject and is the poor interesting subject alive now and does sasha succeed in saving him yes sasha was detained very long he came in the next morning at ten o'clock he stayed till four at the hospital it was a very hard and interesting case Vierotchka. did you save him yes how did you get up so early i didn't go to bed at all you didn't go to bed so as not to be late coming to see me you didn't sleep all night you impious fellow please go right home and sleep clear till dinner-time without fail so that i shall find you sleeping when i come in two minutes he was already sent off those were our two first interviews but this second dinner goes with proper dignity they tell each other their stories sensibly they laugh they think and they pity each other to each of them it seems that the other has suffered the more in a week and a half a little dacha on the kamenov ostrov is rented and they move there end of part four chapter five recording by expatriate in bangor maine part four chapter six of a vital question or what is to be done by nikolai chernyshevsky translated by nathan haskell dole eighteen fifty two to nineteen thirty five and others this librivox recording is in the public domain 
Recording by Expatriate in Bangor, Maine. Part four, chapter six. Vera Pavlovna does not very often recollect the past days of their present love. Yes, in the present there is so much life that there is little recollection, but whenever she recalls the past, as sometimes, at first, of course, only sometimes, but afterwards more frequently, at every recollection she feels a dissatisfaction at first, weak and like a flash indefinite. At whom? At what? And then it appears to her. At whom? She is dissatisfied with herself. For what? and now she sees from what part of her character arises her dissatisfaction yes she is very proud but is it only in her past that she is dissatisfied with herself at first yes but then she begins to observe that the dissatisfaction with herself is connected with the present also and what a strange peculiarity could be noticed in this feeling after it became clear to her as though she vera pavlovna kirsanovna did not feel a personal dissatisfaction but as though the dissatisfaction of thousands and millions were not reflected in her and as though she were not dissatisfied with herself personally but as though those thousands and millions were dissatisfied with her but who are these thousands and millions why are they dissatisfied with themselves if i had lived alone by myself as before she thought to herself that then by all probability this feeling would not have been made manifest so quickly to her but now she is constantly with her husband they both think together all the time and the thought about him interferes with every other thought this assisted greatly in the evolution of this feeling he could not directly explain this puzzle to her as long as this feeling was obscure in her own mind it was still darker for him for him it was hard to think how it was possible to feel dissatisfaction which should not interfere with your personal satisfaction which does not in the least bear upon personality this was strange to him a hundredfold darker than for her but still it helped her a great deal that she was constantly thinking about her husband and constantly thinking with him she began to notice that whenever this dissatisfaction came to her it was always accompanied by comparisons it consisted in the fact that she compares herself with her husband and here flashed before her a real word expressing her thought a difference an insulting difference now she understands end of part four chapter six recording by expatria in bangor maine part four chapter seven of a vital question or what is to be done by nikolai chernyshevsky translated by nathan haskell dole eighteen fifty two to nineteen thirty five and others this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by expatriate in bangor maine part four chapter seven sasha how lovely this n n is vera pavlovna named the officer with whom she wanted to become acquainted with tambulik and bosio in her dream he brought me a new poem which is not soon going to be published said vera pavlovna at dinner shall we set ourselves to reading it right after dinner yes i have been waiting for you and i am going to read it all with you sasha and i have been longing to read it what poem is it now you shall hear let us see if he succeeded in this thing n n says that he i mean the author is pretty well satisfied with it and so they settled themselves comfortably in her room and she begins to read oi full full the little basket is with brocades and calicoes sweetheart pity what a task it is for the young lad as he goes ah now i see said kirsdnof after listening to a score or so of stanzas this is a new style with him but it is evidently his nekrasov's yes i am very grateful to you for waiting for me you ought to be replied vera pavlovna twice they read the little poem over which owing to their acquaintance with one of the author's acquaintances came into their hands three years before it was published do you know what verses affected me the most asked vera pavlovna after she had read several times with her husband certain parts of the poem these verses are not from the main part of the poem but oh my thoughts are greatly drawn to them when katya was waiting for the return of her bridegroom she was very melancholy had i only time for worrying i should die thou heartless one 
harvest time and time is hurrying scores of things must now be done though it often to the maiden comes that she suffers and must die still the hay-cart heavy laden comes still the sickle burns the rye she must thresh with all her might alas thresh the grain the morning through spread the flax at gloomy night alas on the meadows wet with dew these verses are not the principal ones in that episode they are only a preface to the fact how this lovely katya is dreaming about her life with vanya but my thoughts are greatly drawn to them yes that is a perfect picture one of the very best in the poem but they do not hold the best place in it so they must have corresponded very closely to the thoughts which occupied you what are these thoughts they are these sasha you and i have often said that the organization of woman is almost higher than that of man and that therefore woman may force man to take second rank in intellectual life when the rough force which predominates at the present time shall pass we both have come to this conclusion by observation of life you meet more women in life than men who are intellectual by nature so it seems to us both you confirm this by various facts drawn from anatomy and physiology what offensive things you are speaking about man and you say a great deal more than i do about it Birochka. it is insulting to me it is good that the time which you predict is very far off else i should entirely change my opinion so as not to go into the second rank however Virochka, this is only a probability science has not collected enough data to settle this question positively of course my dear we said that until this time the facts of history point to a different conclusion though it is very probable as we observe private life and the arrangement of the organism woman has until lately played such a trifling part in intellectual life because the predominating force deprived her of the means of culture and the motives for reaching development this explanation is sufficient but here is another similar case if woman is measured by her physical strength her organism is much weaker but her organism is stronger isn't that so this is much less dubious than the question as to the natural endowment of intellectual strength yes a woman's organism offers a much stronger resistance to material forces of destruction climate weather and unhealthy food medicine and physiology have occupied themselves very little with the detailed investigation of this but statistics have given an indisputable general answer that the average length of woman's life is more than man's from this it can be seen that woman's organism is stronger so much the more strikingly can it be seen that the style of woman's life is generally far less healthful than man's there is another important consideration by which the clearness of the result is made more manifest and that is offered by physiology full maturity is reached rather sooner by woman than by man let us suppose that a woman's growth ends at twenty and a man's at twenty-five approximately in our climate and in our race let us suppose also approximately that the same proportion of women reach the age of seventy as of men who reach the age of sixty-five if we consider the difference in the periods of growth the preponderance of strength in woman's organism will appear much more strikingly even than statistics grant which do not take into consideration the difference in the periods of maturity seventy years means three and a half times twenty years sixty-five should be divided by twenty-five how much will it be yes it will go two and a half times with the remainder that is two and three-fifths therefore a woman lives three and a half periods of her full development as easily as a man lives only two and a half periods of his and by this proportion is measured the strength of her organism indeed there is a greater difference than i had believed yes but i mention this only for example i took round numbers and depended on my memory however the conclusion is exactly as i said statistics show that woman's organism is stronger you got your conclusions only from the tables of life average but if the physiological facts are added to the statistical the difference will be still greater that is so sasha just consider what i was thinking and now it comes over me more strongly still i was thinking if a woman's organism resists more powerfully the destructive impressions of matter then it is altogether likely that woman should have greater strength in bearing mental shocks but in reality we see that she is different yes this is likely 
of course so far this is only a supposition this has not been studied no special facts have been gathered but really your conclusion results so closely from the fact which is already undisputed that it is hard to distrust it the strength of the organism is too closely connected with the strength of the nerves in all likelihood woman's nerves are more elastic have a stronger structure and if that is so then they must more easily and firmly endure shocks and painful feelings but in reality we see many examples of the contrary a woman very often suffers torments over what a man bears easily the analysis of the cause by which we see in real life such phenomena contradicting what we ought to expect from the structure itself of her organism has not yet been made with sufficient accuracy but one of these causes is evident it pervades all historical phenomena and all the sides of our actual existence this is a strength of prejudice a bad habit a false expectation a false fear if a man thinks i can't then he really can't it is constantly drummed into women's ears you are weak and so they feel that they are weak and they really become weak we have seen examples where people absolutely healthy have drooped till they really died from the one idea that they were bound to grow weak and die but there are examples which affect whole masses nations humanity in general one of the most remarkable of these is the history of war in the middle ages the infantry imagined that it could not stand against cavalry and really it could not whole armies of infantry were driven about like flocks of sheep by a few hundred men on horseback till that time when the continent first beheld the english infantry consisting of proud independent gentry without fear who were not accustomed to yield to any one without a fight such an idea was not known as soon as these people who had no tradition that it was necessary to yield to cavalry entered france the cavalry which even excelled them in numbers was beaten by them at every engagement you remember the remarkable victories gained by the small army of english infantry over the french cavalry at crecy at poitiers and at agincourt the very same history was repeated when the swedish infantry took it into their heads that they had no reason to look upon themselves as weaker than the feudal cavalry the austrian and afterwards the burgundian cavalry superior in numbers began to suffer defeats at every engagement then all the other cavalry tried to battle with them and all of them were defeated then all said yes the infantry seems to be stronger than cavalry of course it was stronger but whole centuries have passed considering that the infantry was weak compared with cavalry simply because they looked upon themselves as weak yes sasha this is true we are weak because we regard ourselves as weak but it seems to me that there is still another cause i want to speak about myself and you tell me my dear did i change much in those two weeks that you did not see me you were too much worried then it may have seemed to you more than it really was or in fact the change was great how does it seem to you now yes you really were very thin and pale then now you see my dear i have learned that this is the very thing that touches my pride you see you love me very dearly why didn't the struggle show itself in you in such evident signs as it did in me for nobody saw you become pale or thin in those months when you were separated from me how did you bear it so easily this is why the verses interested you so much where katya overcomes her melancholy by work you want to know whether i have experienced the truth of this remark in regard to myself yes it is absolutely true i kept up the struggle easily because i had no time to spend over it always when i paid attention to it i suffered keenly but everyday necessities compelled me for the large part of the time to forget about it i had to attend to my patients to get ready for my lectures at that time not by my own will either i freed myself from my thoughts those days when i had a good many leisure hours i felt that my strength was failing me it seems to me that if i had remained a week a prey to my thoughts i should have lost my mind it is so my dear and i at last came to understand that in this lay the whole secret of the difference between me and you you must have such activity that you can postpone it that you cannot refuse it then a person is incomparably firmer but you had a great deal of activity then and the same thing is true now ah sasha 
are they things of such imperative importance i devote myself to them as much as i please and when i please whenever it seems good to me i can devote less time to them or put them off entirely at a time when my mind is disturbed it takes a special effort of the will and only in that way can i compel myself to attend to them there is no support in the necessity of them for example i busy myself with my household duties and i spend a great deal of time in them but nine-tenths of this time i spend in this way only because i want to with a good servant shouldn't i spend just as much time even though there was less necessity to work and who feels the necessity of wasting double time for the sake of the slight improvement over what he with a less expenditure of time which might be my own the only necessity upon me is my own will when the mind is at ease you give yourself up to these things but when your mind is disturbed you neglect them because you can manage without them you are apt to give up the less important for more important things as soon as your feelings get greatly stirred up they drive away the thoughts about other things i give lessons which are things of somewhat more importance i cannot give them up at the dictate of my will but this is not the point i give them closer attention at one time than at another if during the lesson my mind wanders somewhat the lesson may go only a little worse than before because teaching is very easy and does not absorb the mind and after all do i really make my living by my lessons does my position depend on them do they afford me the principal means for living as i do no these means were afforded me by dmitri's work now by yours giving lessons flatters my feeling of independence and really they are not unprofitable still there is no vital necessity upon me for keeping them up at that time i tried to drive away my tormenting thoughts by giving myself up to the shop more than usual but again i did it more from the impulse of my will you see i understood that my presence at the shop was needed only for an hour or an hour and a half that if i stayed there longer i adopt an artificial occupation that may be useful but is not indispensable for the business and then again this very thing can it serve as a support for such ordinary mortals as we rakhmatov belongs to a different species they take hold of common affairs in such a way that the necessity of it fills their existence for them it even forms a substitute for personal existence but for us sasha this is unattainable we are not eagles like him we can live only in our personal lives is the shop my personal life this affair is not my affair but others i occupy myself with it not for my own sake but for theirs let us admit that it is for my own satisfaction but can those such as we not eagles bother themselves about others when they are themselves in trouble can they give themselves up to their convictions when they are tormented by their feelings no a personal interest an unavoidable necessity on which your life depends is required a necessity which for my own self for my style of life my means of life for my whole situation in life for my entire fate would be more powerful than all my drawings towards passion only such a stimulus can serve as a support in battle with passion only such a thing cannot be conquered by passion but by itself overwhelms passions only such a thing gives strength and rest i want such a stimulus you are right my dear you are right said kirsdnof kissing his wife whose eyes were flashing with enthusiasm you are right and i never thought of it before though it is so evident i had not noticed it yes vierotchka no one else can think for another whoever wants to enjoy life must think for himself look out for himself no one else is going to do it for him but what necessity do you feel upon you now are you going to fall in love with someone else vierotchka vira pavlovna laughed heartily and for some time neither of them could say a word from laughing yes now we both can appreciate that she said finally now i can be perfectly sure and so can you that nothing of the sort can possibly happen but seriously do you know how it seems to me my dear if my love for dmitri was not the love of a fully developed woman neither did he love me in the sense of the word as we understand it his feeling for me was a combination of a very warm attachment to me as a friend with occasional outbursts of passion towards me as a woman he felt a personal friendship for me for me particularly 
but these outbursts were only the attraction towards women they had no personal relation to me no that was not love was he much concerned with thoughts about me no they did not interest him no on his side as well as on mine there was no real love you are unjust to him vierotchka no sasha this is so in talk between you and me there is no use in flattering him both of us know how highly we prize him we also know that no matter how he protested that it was easy for him in reality it was not easy you may also declare that it was an easy matter to struggle with your passion all this is well and it is not put on but such keen assurances must not be taken in the literal sense of the word end of part one chapter seven recording by expatriate in bangor maine